Hey folks, we are back again with another C++ audio tutorial. Today we are going to build this plugin from scratch using modern C++ and the Juice framework. Check the description for links to the repository and to download the final build. Okay, what is this thing? This is the little brother of my new audio plugin and course for programming for musicians where you can learn to build these other plugins, also where you can learn modern C++ and the Juice framework taught from the context of writing audio software in a mentored environment. In programming for musicians, you are not following videos, you are not watching someone else code, and you are not copying them either. You are coding it yourself from a design spec, and I'm reviewing your work every step of the way. All right, enough about those. Let's learn about what we are going to build today. This is a three band compressor. Audio signal is split into three discrete bands and compression is applied to each band separately. The bottom of the GUI contains the controls for the selected band. You'll find standard compressor controls here, attack, release, threshold, and ratio. On the right side, you'll find buttons to mute, solo, or bypass an individual audio band. These buttons are helpful for dialing in an individual compressor or hearing how it is affecting the overall audio signal. The band select buttons are on the left. These control which compressor is being controlled. Remember, we have three of them. In the middle of the GUI are the global controls. You'll find input trim on the left, crossover controls in the middle, and output trim on the right. The crossover sliders control where the audio is split into the three band. The top portion of the GUI features a spectrum analyzer, which shows us what we are hearing, where the crossovers are in the frequency spectrum, and what our thresholds are set to, as well as the current gain reduction per band. At the very top of the GUI, you'll find the Analyzer Bypass button on the left. This button turns off the FFT analysis in the Spectrum Analyzer. Finally, we have the Global Bypass button on the right, which disables or enables all three compressors simultaneously. We are going to learn to build all of the DSP that's going on in the background. We are going to learn how to build this GUI. Okay, that's the feature set for this plugin and for this course. My name is Chuck. I go by the name Matcat Music on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Once again, check the description for links to the repository and where to download the final builds. Let's get started and write a multiband compressor using modern C++ and the Juice framework from scratch. Welcome to this tutorial teaching the simple multiband compressor. If you happen to get stuck during uh, any part of the setup or in the actual tutorial itself, grab any free product from Programming for Musicians you will be sent an invite link to a Slack workspace where you can send me a message directly. I will help you get unstuck. We can work on error messages if you have setup issues, that sort of thing. All right, on with the show. Hey folks, welcome to this tutorial documenting how to build this three band compressor. Before we start building anything, we need to have a working development environment. That is what we're going to do first. I'm going to show how to do this for Mac and then how to do this for Windows. Here is what we are going to accomplish in this first part of the course. We're going to install the IDE, which could be Xcode or Visual Studio. We're going to clone the Juice framework. We're gonna build Producer, create a project, and then create a repository for the project. Then we are going to build and run the standalone app version of the project. Then we're gonna set up audio plugin host. We are going to configure the IDE to launch audio plugin host whenever we build and run the project. Then we're going to configure audio plugin host so it can load our plugin and set up a filter graph so audio will run through our plugin. Then we are going to set up an audio file player so that we can actually play audio files through our plugin. Then we're going to configure audio plugin host to use the audio file player plugin to send audio into our plugin and out to our sound card. If you are a Windows user, you can skip ahead to the timestamp shown below uh, for your steps. All right, let's begin. The first thing we need is Xcode. Now, I have already downloaded and installed Xcode, but if you haven't, there are two ways you can get it. Number one is to get it from the App Store. Just go here and search Xcode. Oops. Search here, Xcode. This is going to get the version that is um, the most recent version that is uh, available for most people to get. If you have an older computer, the other way you can do it is to grab a Apple developer account. These are free. You only need to pay for the account if you are code signing. Okay, so if you don't, um, if you're not planning on signing any of your binaries, you can just go to developer.apple.com, developer.apple.com, uh, sign up for a free account, and then uh, sign on in. 
All right, once you are signed on in, go to Downloads, click on More, and then search for Xcode. All right, you will see all of the versions of Xcode that have ever been released. Xcode 11, 12, 13, keep scrolling on down. There's 11.7, there's 11.4, Xcode 4.6.2, Xcode 10, 11, all that stuff. So if you're running an older version of Mac OS and you cannot get, um, you cannot run Xcode uh, 12 or Xcode 13, this is what you can do. We have successfully grabbed Xcode and our next thing to do is to clone the juice repository. Navigate to github.com slash J-U-C-E dash framework slash J-U-C-E. We are going to clone using fork, which is a git GUI. You can grab that from https colon slash slash fork.dev. Once you've got fork, go ahead and launch it. Now we need to configure where fork looks for all of its repositories. So go to the uh, fork menu, go to preferences, and you're going to specify the default source folder. In my case, I am putting all of my code here in uh, my users folder in a folder called programming. Okay, once you've got that configured, you can go back to, we can close this. We can go back to GitHub, we can copy this URL right here, click the green button for code, um, copy this URL, and then go to fork file clone. It's going to automatically populate this URL. Um, if it doesn't, that's fine. Um, you can just paste it, click clone. Now if fork, if you're running an older version of Mac OS and it throws some kind of errors at you, um, you need to install the Swift runtime. So again, you can grab that. Um, you can grab that either, you can grab that from the developer, your developer account. Go to your account, go to downloads, search for more, and Swift. Somewhere in here. Is it here? There it is, Swift uh, runtime support for command line tools. This is what you need to install. That will make fork run. Um, again, this is only if you have an older version of Mac. Juice has been around for like a decade or so. I'm not quite sure how long. Um, by default, it checks out the master branch, but the master branch, there's quite a few commits that have happened between when the master branch was released and when the develop branch, which contains the most recent fixes, had its most recent commit pushed to it. So we wanna check out the develop branch. So go ahead and double click on origin develop. That'll check out a branch. And now we've got the latest set of changes in Producer. All right, our next step is to build Producer, which will create juice projects for us. Okay, so just click open in finder. Your little button right there. Navigate to the juice extras folder the producer folder and the builds folder, and then Mac OS X. Double click on the juicer file. This is gonna open up Xcode. If this is the first time launching Xcode, it may ask you to install, um, it may ask you to install additional command line tools. Just click yes, um, and then get it to this point. All right. I've already built this a few times because I was doing test runs in this video. Um, what we want to do is go to the product menu and choose build. Now we can watch what it's doing uh, during the compilation process by um, clicking on this button right here of these buttons right here, it's the rightmost one. And just click on this and it will take us to this report showing us what is being compiled while it is being compiled. We just need to wait for it to finish. All right, it's currently compiling GUI basics, linking, signing. There we go, build succeeded. All right, we are done with Xcode for right now. Go ahead and close the project. All right, navigate to the builds folder. In the debug folder is where you will find the produced binary. Double click on this to launch Producer. Producer is here. Now the first thing we need to do is turn on GPL mode. If we go to file, um, by default it might be on, it may not be on. Choose sign in and select GPL mode. Now the next thing to do is to um, customize where the juice paths are. Because this was cloned to the 
to a location other than the users folder, Producer is not going to be able to find the modules. Um, so go to the global paths menu choice under Producer, and we need to set our path to juice. Okay, so that's over here. And all we need to do is find our juice folder, which in my case is in this programming directory. Matcat music programming. There's the juice folder. Whoops. Matcat music programming juice open. All right, now we need to do the same thing for the juice modules. Modules are found inside of the juice folder. So we just need to navigate to that and then choose open. Again, this is like programming juice modules. Okay, once we've done that, we're good to go here. Now we can create an audio plugin. In the simple EQ video, there were a lot of comments of people who created an audio application. We do not want an audio application. We want to create a basic plugin. Okay. The first thing to do is set the name. We're going to do simple MB comp, short for simple multiband compressor, and click create project. We just need to choose a valid place to save the project. So I'm going to save it into my programming folder. Okay, next we need to make sure that the plugin copy step is enabled. So click on exporters, click on debug, and scroll down for the plugin copy step. Make sure it is enabled. All right, the next thing to do is to set the C version to C 17. Click this little gear icon for project settings and scroll down to the bottom and then up a little bit. We can change the C language standard here. Change it to C17. Finally, let's set the company name that's up at the top. I'm going to put Matt Cat Music LLC. When we scan for plugins in Audio Plugin Host, this is our plug this is how our plugin will show up. It will show up under the name of whatever we put here. All right. Now we can click uh, save and open in IDE. Let's create a repository next. Let's go over to Fork. In Fork, we are going to choose File, Create New Local Repository. And then we just need to pick this directory. Notice that there are a ton of files that are unstaged. Okay, we need to customize the git ignore file for this project. And we're doing this because we don't want any of these files that Producer automatically generates every time we save the project to be stored in the repository. Again, they're auto-generated, so there's no reason for us to keep track of how they changed. Okay, so right-click on one of these files. I'm going to right-click on this builds directory and choose Ignore Custom Pattern. Now I'm going to type some stuff here. The first thing I'm going to type is star star slash builds. That's going to ignore everything in the builds directory. Next, I'm going to just type star star slash, whoops, star star slash juice library code. That's going to ignore everything in the juice library code folder. And then because this is Mac, I'm going to type star star slash dot ds store. That's going to ignore the ds store files, which are generated by Mac OS every time you customize the view of a folder. All right, add to git ignore. Now we only have six files. Awesome. We've got our four source folders and our ignore file and then the juicer file for the project. Now we can stage these by clicking this button right here to stage all. And now we can make our initial commit. Initial commit. All right. Every time we click save and open in IDE, it's not going to produce new changes. It's only when we change source code that it will do that. All right. We can go back to Producer and we can choose save and open in IDE. Let's build and run the standalone app version. First of all, change the scheme right here to the standalone plugin and then Click the play button to build and run. All right, we can watch the build happen. Again, go to the report navigator, click on the entry with the spinning wheel. All right, build succeeded. We're waiting for it to run. This is the default audio plugin that comes from Producer running within a standalone plugin app. It is our job to customize the DSP and the graphics, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. We need to set up a test bed that we can use to run audio through our plugin. So let's set that up next. Go ahead and close this. All right, we can close this project as well. Close project. 
If you uh, were not aware, I am doing this in a virtual machine that has nothing set up in it. Um, that's just to show you if you've never done this before, here's how you can get set up real quickly. Show me later, never. Okay. All right, the first thing to do is to set up audio plugin host. We need to navigate to that folder. Okay, so users folder, programming, it's inside the juice folder. It's under extras, it's audio plugin host. Open up the juicer file. Save and open in IDE and build it. Product build. Linking build succeeded. Okay, close the project once building is complete. We are going to configure our plugin project to launch audio plugin host every time we use the VST3 scheme. All right, we can close this juicer file. Let's go back to our simple multiband compressor and open this up. All right, we can make this full screen now. Go to the Xcode project. We're going to edit the VST3 scheme. Okay, click on this guy to select it and now edit the scheme. All right, we're gonna change the executable from none to audio plugin host. So choose other, and we're going to search for audio plugin host. There it is. Click choose. Now, let's see, close this. Now we just need to run this, and that's going to launch audio plugin host. Well, first it has to build the VST3 version. Linking, build succeeded. Okay, launching audio plugin host. There's audio plugin host. Yes, you can use my microphone. Okay, the first thing we need to do is configure audio plugin host to load our plugin. Go to the options menu and click edit the list of available plugins. We're going to scan. All right, so choose options and scan for new or updated VST3 plugins. That's fine. There's our compressor right there, simple MB comp. Okay, we can close this window. Now that our plugin has been found, we can load it into the filter graph. So right click, select it from the pop-up. Again, this is where you set your company name and there's your compressor. Now if we double click this, it looks the same as the standalone version. Cool. Let's wire it up to the output. Go like this, click right there, click right there and drag that, okay. Right now, any audio that our plugin produces will go to the sound card. All right, now we're not gonna hear anything because there's nothing feeding audio into our plugin. So let's do that next. And then the other thing is, if we go to options, we can change our audio device settings. Again, I'm running this in parallels, so it's using a virtual machine and the virtual machine devices, okay. Let's set up audio file player next. We can save this. And we wanna save this into our, um, we want to save this with our project. So let's see, where's my documents? Well, not documents. We want to save this with our programming. Programming, simple multiband comp. This is like um, simple MB comp test, test bed. Cool. That'll work. We can quit audio plugin host for now. In the previous tutorial video that I created, the simple EQ tutorial, I used Apple's AU audio file player. Let me show you what that looks like. Let me see if that's even on here. Hey, I just wanted to interject. I'm editing this video the next day. The AU audio file player does show up on a default installation of Mac. Um, you just need to scan for audio units and it will be there. So if I do that, then I can scan and it'll show up under Apple. AU audio file player. There it is. Okay, this is what I used in Simple EQ. All right, I just wanted to let you know that this stuff does come on here if you do have um, a fresh install of the operating system. You do not need GarageBand and you do not need Logic to access this. This comes with the operating system. This time we're going to use the audio file player plugin that I created. This plugin is a port of the Juice Audio Playback demo app to work as an audio plugin. The demo app, if you're curious, you can go to File, um, Open Example, audio, audio playback demo, and this is an actual audio application. So what I have done is I have ported this into an actual plugin that you can use in your DAW in audio plugin host on Mac and Windows to handle all of these playback duties. So we need to go grab this. Let's close our project for now. Let's close, uh, we're not gonna close that. We need to go grab it. So let's open up our browser. We're gonna navigate to github.com slash mathcatmusic slash audio file player. 
this is what we need to clone. So click on the code button, copy it, and then clone it in fork. File, clone, paste that URL, and let's clone it. All right, successfully cloned. Now we need to compile it. Open in Finder. Let's go to our audio file player. Audio file player .juicer. Save and open in IDE. It's going to launch Xcode. We just need to build it, and it's going to build um, all of these. It's going to build the, the standalone version, the VSD3, and the audio unit. Build. All right, cool. Once it's built, um, we should be able to launch audio plugin host and uh, be good to go. So close this project. We can close audio. Let's not close it yet because we may need to um, do it again. Let's open up our simple MB comp. All right, let's run it. And now we are going to scan for uh, audio file player. All right, options menu, edit the list of available plugins, options, scan for new or updated VST3, scan. There it is, audio file player, perfect. Close this window, right click, Matcat Music, my company name, audio file player. Here's the audio file player. Double click it to view the GUI. Now we just need to wire up the outputs of this uh, to the inputs of our simple multiband compressor. Now let's just add an audio file. We can either drag one in or uh, select something from here. And if it prompts you to grant permission uh, to the desktop and the documents folder and the music folder, just click accept. That's all. It's, you know, max security stuff. Let's press play to hear the audio file. Awesome. There we go. Hit push stop. All right. Save the filter graph. Now, audio plugin host is configured. Every time we run the VST3 version of the project, Audio Plugin Host will launch and it will load our plugin and it will load this audio player. Let's go ahead and quit this and show what I mean. If we run this, it's gonna launch. There's our audio file player plugin and we can just stream audio right into the plugin. All right, perfect. We are ready to start coding up this plugin. Mac users, you can jump to the timestamp shown below uh, to start the tutorial that actually codes up the plugin. Windows users, we are going to cover setting up your system next. All right, Windows users, as a reminder, I am using Windows 10 inside of a virtual machine on my Mac. I am doing this to show uh, how to get started using a relatively fresh and clean operating system installation, and also because I love the pain of using Windows 10 in a virtual machine. Sad face. Okay, uh, let's dive in. The first thing we need to do is grab Visual Studio Community from the website. Not Visual Studio Code, but Visual Studio. We can get the Community Edition. Just go up here um, and just Google for it. Visual Studio Community. All right, we want the 2019 Community Edition. Go ahead and download it. Um, once you have that, then resume this video. Okay, once you have the installer downloaded, Go here um, and run the installer, and we need to configure it to build C++ apps. If you already have Visual Studio installed, um, but you're using it for JavaScript or C Sharp or something else, but you don't have C++ installed, run the installer and set it up the way I'm about to show you once this thing launches in uh, 10 minutes. So we have this here, uh, Visual Studio Community 2019. Click the Modify button. And what we want to do is set it up for C++ development. So go to here, desktop development with C++. Make sure that's enabled. And what you want to configure, um, you're going to want Clang tools. You're going to want the address sanitizer. You're going to want IntelliCode. You, uh, we don't need Live Share. We don't need Test Adapter for Google Tests. We do not need Boost.test. Uh, we need a latest. Um, we need the latest V142 build tools. We, need, we don't need CMake, we need the profiling tools, we need the just-in-time debugger, um, we need this guy, and we need this guy. All right, so set your thing up so that way it's got these. And then um, just click Install while downloading. All right, once everything is installed, you can quit Visual Studio. The next step is to download uh, the Juice Framework, or sorry, not download, but clone the Juice Framework. Okay, We always want to clone it so we have access to the repository history. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use fork, which is the Git GUI, 
to interact with this repository. So you can get that, if you open your browser, you can grab that from fork.dev. It's available for Mac and for Windows, okay? So you can go ahead and grab it here. Download fork for Windows. Okay, once you've got fork installed, we need to configure it to store everything um, in our preferred location, any repositories that it clones, all that sort of thing. Launch fork, go to the file menu, go to preferences, and we need to specify the default clone folder. I like to keep things in a folder called programming. I have it right here on my desktop. You know, I could move it somewhere else, but for the sake of this tutorial, it's right here on the desktop. So I just navigate to that, you know, click this folder button, find where I'm gonna put it. Basically anything that I'm gonna clone is gonna go there. So I'm gonna put it on the desktop programming like that. Select folder. Okay, now anything that I clone is gonna go into that folder in its own repository. Now we need to navigate to the Juice framework and get the URL for that. So open up your browser, open up a new tab, then visit github.com slash juice dash framework, W-O-R-I-K slash J-U-C-E in all caps. Here's the Juice framework. Now we need to click this code button right here, click the copy button, and go back to fork. And now we can do file clone. It's going to auto-populate this repository URL and it's gonna save it into the programming folder that we requested. Click the clone button and you will be downloading a copy of the Juice repository to your computer. Okay, cloned. All right, perfect. Now we have a copy of Juice on our computer. The next thing to do is to build the ProJuicer which creates Juice projects for us. But before we do that, Juice is a pretty old framework. By default, the master branch or main branch is checked out. However, there have been several commits um, since the uh, most recent branch. Oh, spinning wheel. A lot of things have been fixed in the Juice framework since the master branch was last updated. So we wanna check out the develop branch, okay? So just double click right on origin slash develop and then it will prompt to uh, create a branch and track the remote branch. Click the track button. Now we can open up ProJuicer and build it. Okay, so click on this open in button right here and choose open in file explorer. Now we need to navigate to the extras, ProJuicer, navigate to builds, Visual Studio 2019, and then we're gonna open up this solution file. We can just go to the build menu and choose build solution. This is going to build ProJuicer for us. Now we just need to wait for it to finish compiling. All right, build succeeded. Fantastic. We can close the Visual Studio project now. Now we can create a plugin project next. Navigate to the x64 folder, click on debug, click on app, and now we're looking for producer.exe. There it is. All right, double click it to launch. Now, if this is the first time you are using ProJuicer, it's gonna ask you to sign in. We wanna turn on GPL mode. If this is not the first time, you've probably already set it up. But normally what you will see, you'll go to the file menu, you will choose sign in. It'll show this thing. You can, if you have a Juice account, you can set that up or you can enable GPL mode. Now, GPL mode has the requirement that we make our projects open source. So uh, yeah, make your project open source, okay. In the Simple EQ project, a lot of people left comments that they created an audio application, or they were missing, um, they were missing the plugin processor file, and that's because they created an audio application instead of a plugin, instead of a basic plugin. So for this, you definitely want to make sure, you are definitely going to want to make sure that you choose the plugin category and that you choose basic. All right, first thing that we need to do, we need to give it the name simple mb comp and then create project oh i'm sorry before you do that if producer says you need to set your paths because you had downloaded juice to a directory that's not the standard directory it's expecting go here under the file menu go to global paths and then customize these paths here this is what i'm talking about when you um, install it to the default location it's expecting juice to go to um, in a folder on the root level of your hard drive. So obviously I put mine in this programming folder on the desktop, so that is not where my juice folder is, and that is not where the modules folder is. 
So I'm going to click these three dots. I'm going to choose the juice folder and then select folder. And I'm going to do the same thing for the modules. Go to the modules folder, select folder. And I can close this window now. All right, now I can create this. All right, I want to put this in my programming folder with juice and the other stuff I've made. This is going to create the project. The next thing that we need to do is enable the plugin copy step. This is going to copy the plugin when we compile it to the uh, folder that most hosts, you know, Reaper, Cubase, Ableton, they're all looking for plugins in this one folder. So this is going to enable copying it there automatically. In this view, click on exporters, click on debug, scroll down to the scroll down a little bit and you'll see where it says enable plugin copy step. Make sure this is set to enabled. All right, we'll figure out where this actually gets copied to in a little bit. Next, we need to um, change the C++ version. So go up here, go to, uh, let's see, this is down at the bottom of this list, okay? Scroll all the way to the end, then scroll up a little bit and change the C++ language standard to C++ 17. All right, next we want to supply our company name. So let's do that first. I'm gonna type mine, Matt Cat Music LLC. When we scan for the plugin in audio plugin host, uh, whatever we put here is the name that it's going to appear as. It's gonna show up as a submenu under this name right here. Okay, um, we may or may not need to set this using namespace juice. So we'll come back to that. First thing we're gonna do is we're going to save and launch this. Uh, save and open in IDE. This is going to launch Visual Studio. We're going to find out whether or not we need to turn on that um, using namespace juice. So go to the build menu and we're just going to try to build this real quick. Rebuild solution. And if we get any errors um, about namespace stuff, then we will turn that on. Let's see what happens. Okay, cool. All right. So the copy step failed, but we don't have any error messages relating to the namespace juice. Let's do the next thing, which is to create a repository for our project first, and then we will deal with this copy step. All right, we can close this for now. Okay, to create a repository, open fork, and then do file, init new repository, and choose the simple MB comp folder for the project. Now you'll notice that there are a ton of files here um, listed under, lo under local changes. So we need to customize the git ignore file for this project and ignore all of this stuff. The reason we are doing that is because all of this stuff gets created automatically by Producer whenever we save and um, whenever we save and open in IDE or when we compile, like you'll see there's all these object files and stuff. So we want to right click, choose ignore, custom pattern, star star. And for this, we're going to type star star slash builds. Then, and what this is going to do is it's going to ignore all of the files that are in the builds directory. We want to do the same thing for juice library code. So star star slash juice library code, like that. Now, if for some reason we want to migrate this project over to Mac, um, it's very handy to add star star slash dot ds store. That's going to ignore any ds store files on Mac these files control how the finder's view looks. Basically, if it's showing icons, or if it's showing a list, or if it's showing, um, uh, if it's arranged by name, or if it's arranged by day created, that sort of stuff, that information is stored in these DS store files. Okay, add to gitignore. You can see we only have the four source files, our gitignore file, and the juicer file. Now we can make our initial commit. Let's stage these by clicking the stage all button. And now, committing them initial commit now we can save and open in IDE go ahead and go back to Visual Studio save and open in IDE this will launch Visual Studio one more time okay on the right side is the solution Explorer we want to right click on the standalone plugin and choose set as startup project okay now we can build and run it by clicking on this local Windows debugger. Let's see if this throws an error with regard to the um, copy step or not. 
It shouldn't because we're not spawning the copy step version. We're not spawning the VST3. This is the default audio plugin from Projuicer. Okay, it is running inside of a standalone app that is part of the Juice framework that hosts this. Okay, it is our job to customize the DSP that runs in our plugin as well as the graphics. Let's not get ahead of ourselves though. We need to come up with a test bed so that we can actually run audio through our plugin. That's what we're going to set up next. All right, close that. Close this. Let's go set up audio plugin host. Navigate to your juice directory. Navigate to extras. Navigate to audio plugin host. Navigate to the juicer file and open it up in Projuicer. Save and open in IDE. Build it. Build the solution. Okay. Build. One succeeded, zero failed. Awesome. All right. We're done with audio plugin host. Okay. We can close the juicer file as well. All right. Let's configure audio plugin host to launch whenever we have the VST3 as the startup project. Right click on the VST3 target. Go down to properties. Navigate to where it says debugging. We're going to change this command. So click on this arrow. Go to browse. And we're going to look for audio plugin host. All right, go to that. Build simple ME comp. Navigate to the juice folder. Navigate to the extras folder. Audio plugin host. Builds Visual Studio 2019 X64 debug app. And now audio plugin host.exe. Click apply and OK. Now we need to change the target from standalone to VST3. Change that to the startup project. And now if we build and run, it's going to fail on that copy step like we saw earlier. Let's do it anyway. All right, copy step failed. It's trying to copy to common programs um, wherever this thing is. Okay, so we what we need to do is change the permissions of this folder um, to allow the current user which is, you know, whoever we are logged in as, we need to give them write permission to this folder. So open up Explorer. This is located in the C drive, program files, common files. This is where um, X, this is where Visual Studio is trying to copy this file to. So right click, create new, create a folder, call it VST3. And then the second part of this is to change the permissions so that the logged in user can write to this folder because Visual Studio is being run under that user's settings. Okay, so right click on this, go to properties, go to security, click on edit to change the permissions. And then we need to change the permissions for the user to be able to modify. All right, apply, okay, okay. All right, let's try this one more time. Let's see if it uh, throws an error or not. Okay, cool, copy step completed. If we go back over here, um, let's see, where was that? Let's just press stop real quick. If we go to the build and scroll up to the top, we can see that one file was copied correctly. All right, let's go ahead and launch this. Now we need to scan for our plugin. So choose options edit the list of available plugins. And now this is where we need to scan. All right, so I've already done this scan before, but I'm gonna clear this list. And now I'm going to scan for new or updated VST3 plugins. All right, like I said, it's looking for program files, common files, VST3, scan. All right, here's our plugin. Okay, now we can load it into the filter graph. Right click, go to your company name, and here's your plugin. If we double click on it, it looks identical to the standalone version we saw earlier. Okay, let's wire it up to the outputs. Just click and drag. And we're not gonna hear anything because there's nothing feeding audio into our plugin and thus going to the speakers. Let's fix that next. Go ahead and we can save this and add it to our repository. Choose file save. And let's see, let's add this to our repository, desktop, programming, simple MBQ, 
and then we can say this is the um uh, we'll just call it simple MB comp filter graph. Oh, we'll get the extension. Save. All right, we can close that. Let's make a commit that we added this. Added filter graph. Go ahead and stage that. Commit that. All right, we are going to set up audio file player so that we can run audio files through our plugin. Go ahead and close this project. Okay, in the previous tutorial video that I created, I used Apple's AU audio file player to run audio files through the simple EQ. Windows users did not have a plugin like that at their disposal. And I saw a lot of comments in, um, in the comment section of that video about that. Like people were just like, hey, what's the Windows equivalent to this? So this time we are going to use the audio file player plugin that I created. This plugin is a port of the Juice Audio Playback Demo app. Um, it has been ported to work as a audio plugin. So you can see that project if you want, if you go to open example, audio, audio playback demo. This is what this guy, well, we're not gonna look at that right now. But if you want to check it out, just load that up, um, save it, build it, you know what to do because you know, you've already done it a few times with ProJuicer and uh, this project and with Audio Plugin Host. Okay, let's go get this thing. All right, open up your browser. Navigate to github.com slash music slash audio. Let me spell that right. Audio file player. Okay, now we want to grab the code from this. Copy. We're done here. In fork, we want to clone. All right, it's already populated for us. Clone it. All right, let's open it in Finder or in File Explorer. Okay, open up the juicer file. Save and open in IDE. Now we just need to build it. Build solution. This should also copy the VST3 to that folder. Let's see what it does. We may need to change the build target. Creating library. One file copied. Okay, that should be okay. All right, let's close this. Now we can go back to our project. Let's close audio file player, the juicer file, close that guy. And we can also close this repository. We don't need that anymore. All right, go back to our simple multiband comp. Let's load up Xcode, let's launch it, and then we will configure audio plugin host to use it. Go ahead and run it. Now we need to scan for our plugins one more time because we just compiled a new one. So go to the options menu, edit the list of available plugins, options, scan for new or updated VST3s, scan. There is our audio file player, so we can right click here. Matcat Music LLC, that's the name it's going to be under, and then choose Audio File Player. And here's our plugin. All right, this is what's going to play the files. We just need to wi wire it up. We've got our instance in the filter graph. Okay, let's add an audio file. Um, I've got one on the desktop. It's this guy right here. Let's start that over. All right, perfect. Let's save the filter graph. Save. All right, we can close this. What's great about this is that every time we launch this project, it's going to load that audio file automatically for us. We're not going to have to, you know, go find the audio file every time uh, we relaunch Audio Plugin Host. That's the problem that existed in the earlier version of this plugin that I had, which I that plugin was just a band-aid fix when I first created the simple EQ tutorial for the Windows users because I didn't realize that they would have this problem. I have since fixed that so that it now um, it now shows you, it now remembers what file you had loaded. So if we go ahead and launch this again, there's our file, and if we press play, it's gonna work as expected. So that's fantastic. All right, we'll put this guy over here. Audio plugin host is configured, 
and um, we have set up our project so that way every time we have the VST3 version set as the startup project. It's going to launch on a plugin host, and we'll have a real easy time of you know debugging our plugin and adding features to it, and being able to run audio through it using audio plugin host. Now we are ready to start coding our plugin. Now we will be reusing and modifying some elements from the simple EQ tutorial that I made for Freecode Camp. If you haven't completed that tutorial. I recommend that you pause this video and start watching that one. I'm not going to explain how the things we are reusing were created. If you want that information, you can watch that video where all that stuff is explained. Okay. I will be explaining the modifications that we will be making to those classes though. So with that said, let's begin building this simple multiband compressor. Let's survey the lay of the land before we start writing any code. Also, thanks to everybody who watched Simple EQ and said I looked like Gilfoil. I had never heard of that show Silicon Valley before I started checking the comments for that uh, video, and uh, that's good times. Okay, number one, there are several important parts to any audio plugin. The first one is the DSP code itself. This code is responsible for the actual audio that we hear. We are responsible for making it fast and efficient. Number two is the audio parameters. These control the various parts of the DSP code. Examples include the filter frequency or the pitch of a note being played by a synthesizer, for example. If we were writing a reverb plugin, we might have a parameter that controls the reverb time. Um, in DSP programming, it's all state-based programming. We are constantly updating the state of our DSP based on math that modifies the audio signal in some way. For example, when we filter audio, we keep track of the previously filtered samples. These samples, which are known as the previous filter output, get added to the incoming samples after being scaled with some coefficient. The newly filtered samples become the previous filter output for the next time that we process incoming samples. Number three, preparing our DSP before we start processing anything with it. Before we can run audio through our DSP, we need to configure some basic information about it. The number of samples we're gonna be processing, the sample rate we will be processing those samples at, and the number of channels we will be processing. For example, we might have a stereo feed, which is two channels, we might have a mono feed, which is one channel, or we might even have a uh, Dolby 5.1, which is six channels. Now, if you are unfamiliar with the concept of sample rate, there are numerous videos on YouTube that explain how digital audio works. Let me grab my whiteboard. So I'm reading my script over on this side, so bear with me. As a brief overview, the audio we hear with our ears is an analog signal like this graph that I've got drawn here. Our eardrums detect changes in air pressure and they convert that change into an electrical signal which gets turned into sound by our brain. This signal, this graph that I've got right here, this is a graph of the changes of the air pressure. It is continuous. If we uh, take this signal right here, if we were to continually zoom in on it, like I've got down here on the bottom part, if we continually zoom in on it, it's always going to appear smooth, okay? Now on computers, uh, that's not the case. Computers, on the other hand, operate using ones and zeros. Like I was saying, computers operate on ones and zeros. What this means is that the computer has to sample this smooth audio signal at a specific rate and produce an approximation of this smooth audio signal. The more frequently that the signal is sampled, the smoother the approximation becomes. As an example, uh, let me use this blue color here. If we sample at every tick, like this, blip, 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 and blip, we are left with, and also right there, we are left with a waveform that looks like this. If we sample at these tick marks, we, and we remove the continuous line, we are left with this lollipop graph like this, which has these little dots. The more frequently that we sample the signal, the smoother this approximation becomes. As you can see right now, it's not, it's not a very good approximation of the original. So let's sample it twice as often. All right, we'll sample here and here 
here, and here. That's going to give us a circle there, circle there, circle there, circle there. Okay? Let's see. The more frequently that the signal is sampled, the smoother the approximation becomes. This is the sample rate. You know, we can keep going. We can keep bumping this up. Blip, 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 like that, like that, like that, like that. This is starting to look like the original waveform, which is great. Which means like our approximation, this digital approximation, is much more accurate. It's much more true to the original waveform, okay? This is the concept of sample rate. The higher the sample rate, the more frequently the signal is sampled. Okay. Now our ears, uh, they can hear up to around 20,000 hertz. There's a theory called the Nyquist theory that basically says that digital audio needs to be sampled at a rate of twice the highest frequency that you want to reproduce. So this comes back to um, the way the waveform is shaped across the grid. If I want to reproduce this pink line, I can't sample it here and only there. I need to have an intermediate point so that way um, the full shape of the waveform is captured. That's what the Nyquist is talking about. If I only capture here and here, I'm going to miss the fact that this actually goes up and goes back down. That's the whole point behind the whole Nyquist theory and whatnot. So since we want to hear things up to about 20 kilohertz, we need to sample that audio, that 20 kilohertz um, signal, we need to sample that at 20 kilohertz times roughly two. So then this is where that sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz comes in. The sound card in the computer is converting 44,100 or 48,000 audio samples into an analog waveform, literally an electric signal. And it's sending that to the analog outputs every second. You might have speakers or you might have headphones plugged into that analog output. And this is where that analog signal goes. And then the speakers themselves or the headphones might have an amplifier built into them that actually boosts this electrical signal that comes out of the analog output. And then this boosted signal from the amplifier, um, it is sent through some wires that wrap around a magnet that is attached to the speaker cone. Then the speaker cone vibrates when it gets that electrical signal, it goes like this, which moves the air, which our eardrums detect that change in pressure, and then our brain translates that into sound that we hear. Okay, now there is a ton of math and science behind these numbers of 44.1 kilohertz and 48 and like the way the ears work and the electrical signals and all that stuff. Um, we don't need to know any of that. We just need to know that what sample rate means is it's like we have this, we have this curved line which is continuous, that's air pressure moving back and forth, and we need to convert it into a digital signal that represents it. And the more often we sample it, the closer our representation will be. Now in the JUICE project, there are two important functions that are always called. The first one is called prepare to play. Let's go find the declaration of that. That's right here. I hope this font is big enough for those of you watching this on a tablet. Um, let's go look for the actual implementation of it. Also, if you're using Xcode or Visual Studio, there are navigator things in the bars at the top, which lets you jump directly to a function. So, you know, learn to use those tools. They're very handy. The first one is called prepare to play, and this is where we configure that basic information of our DSP code, the sample rate, the number of channels, um, the size of the blocks and stuff. The next one is called process block. That's right here, that's declared right here. Let's go to where that is over here. Okay, this function process block brings us to our fourth important piece of the audio plugin processing audio samples at a regularly recurring interval using our DSP code. This is what happens in the process block function. Now, if you recall, let's see, let me hide that ring light that's in the back. If you recall, our sound card has to send 44 or 48,000 samples of audio to our speakers every second. Now, internally, let's pretend that this chunk right here on the bottom, let's pretend this is 48,000 samples. Okay, internally, the sound card splits this into small chunks of samples called blocks or buffers. So let me just draw what I mean by that. Okay, so instead of sending, let's just say this is zero, and then this is 48,000. 
Okay, imagine there are 48,000 samples right here. Now internal, as I said, internally, the sound card is gonna split this into smaller chunks. They're gonna be called blocks and buffers. Now by doing this, the sound card can lessen its burden of having to send this huge chunk of data to the speakers and to the amplifier and the uh, digital audio converter all at once, every second. So instead of sending one big chunk of audio, it can send lots of little ones such that the total number of samples per second ends up equaling the uh, sample rate. So for example, it might say, here's a chunk right here, all right? Then here's the next chunk, and then here's the next chunk. And it's gonna keep chunkifying this up into just these little blocks. Whoa, that was terrible. These little blocks like this until it gets the total number it needs to send uh, per second. If the buffer size was 512 samples, let's pretend each of these is, you know, 512 samples, and the sample rate is 48,000, then the sound card is going to send 48,000 divided by 512 buffers to the sound card every second, or 93.75 buffers. Okay, so obviously my picture is not totally accurate. There should be 93 orange uh, chunks right there. Okay, now it's much easier to send 512 samples 93 times a second than it is to send 48,000 samples one time per second. And it's also easier to design hardware that can deal with 512 samples versus hardware that can handle 48,000 samples at a time. Okay, so that's one of the things that goes into why we have these smaller chunks called blocks or buffers that are like 64 samples or whatever. Now this is how that idea affects our plugin and how we design our DSP code. The process block function receives a buffer of samples whenever the sound card is ready for more audio to send to the speakers. Using a sample rate of 48,000 and a buffer size of 512, we know that the sound card is going to send audio to the speakers 93-ish times per second, or once every 10 milliseconds, 10-ish milliseconds. So that means that all the stuff that happens in our process block, it needs to do whatever it's gonna do in within those 10-ish milliseconds. And the faster it does it, the better. However, if the buffer size is even smaller, maybe it's only 64 samples, then our DSP code must be that much more efficient. The sound card needs to send 48,000 samples to the speaker in blocks of 64 samples. That means it needs to send 750 of these little blocks per second to the speaker. And that means it needs to send one block of 64 samples every 1.3333 milliseconds. That's pretty fast. We need to make sure that our DSP code runs as fast as possible as a result. The sound card is not going to wait for us if we don't have that block that we were working on ready to go. And this is what causes audio dropouts to happen. The sound card will just send a block of silence to the speakers if the buffer it sent to our plugin wasn't processed in time. So now you know what the process block function does and the constraints that exist for it. Audio DSP is a serial process. There is a loop that is always sending a buffer of samples to our code, and then our code in our process block runs from top to bottom, and then the loop sends another buffer. And there is no asynchronous coding happening here on the DSP side of things. It's all happening in series, which simplifies thinking about the code a bit. This is also why I said earlier that DSP programming is all state-based programming. We update the state every time the loop sends us a new buffer of samples to process. And finally, we have the GUI, which is the last piece of any audio plugin. The GUI is where we have all of the sliders, all of the knobs, all of the buttons that control the audio parameters, which in turn control the DSP state. It's important to design a GUI that is very intuitive to use. In terms of how this shows up in the code, the plugin processor is where we handle the audio sides of things. The plugin editor.h and cpp source files is where our GUI is programmed. While we are designing the audio parameters and the DSP for our plugin, we will be using the generic audio processor editor instead of our own custom editor. This class is really cool because it will automatically create all of the sliders, knobs, and buttons, and combo boxes for every audio parameter that we declare. This will allow us to dial in the DSP first and then add a pretty paint job later in the form of the GUI. 
Now this is important because there are often times where we can't see the GUI, but the DSP code still runs. For example, the user might be using automation in their DAW to control the audio parameters instead of the GUI. Our GUI always reflects the state of these parameters. It's never the other way around. The GUI always shows the state of the audio parameters. With this understanding, let's switch to the generic audio processor editor. Let's navigate to the create editor function in plugin processor.cpp, create editor. Comment out this line that currently returns the custom editor we will develop later and change this to return the generic audio processor editor instead. Return new juice generic audio processor editor. Oh, that's deprecated. All right. Add the star. All right. Let's run this and take a look at our GUI. Don't forget our plugin will automatically show up because we already configured audio plugin host, which is awesome. It's this guy right here, simple MB comp. Okay, we don't have any audio parameters yet, so the GUI is not going to show anything. We will add some audio parameters next. Let's talk about compressors and what they do. Now, audio signals have different levels. They can be loud, they can be soft, it can be a medium level. There can be signals that can be too loud for a given system. Now, when I say system, I'm referring to the circuitry and the code that is either converting an analog signal into a digital one or converting a digital signal into an analog. What this means is that the signal's amplitude can be greater than what the system can support. Let's use an example. Let's say that we have a sine wave that is represented digitally. If we plot this wave on a graph that shows time on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis, uh, let's, let's give it an amplitude with a range of negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. So we'll start here, and we'll just go that high, that high, like that, okay? So let's just pretend this lines up with 0.5 and this lines up with negative 0.5. Let's add some gain to this signal. All right, we're going to boost it, and by doing that, we're going to double the signal. Okay, so I'm going to turn up my volume knob, crank it up. It's going to double it. I'm going to add some more gain. All right, cool. So now the wave has an amplitude of positive 1 to negative 1. That's the range of the signal. So that's the range of the signal's amplitude. Okay, let's add some more, gain some more. We're going to double it again. So now it goes from uh, zero, it goes up to plus two. Let's see, I'll use this red color. Hopefully this shows up. Okay, we're going to add this guy right here. We're going to double it. We go up to two. Our waveform has an amplitude of minus two to plus two. What happens if we try to send this signal to our speakers through our sound card? Now, the sound card can only handle signals between negative 1 and plus 1. Let me use this green color. I really hope this shows up. Now the sound card can only handle signals between negative 1 and plus 1. So the sound card is going to clamp any value that is outside of this range to this range. So it's going to take this red signal and instead of it doing this, instead of it doing that, going to clamp it right across like that. Same for the top one. It's just going to go blip. And right here it's going to go blip. Just like that. All right. This is going to turn it into a quasi square wave. This doesn't sound good when that happens. This form of signal clamping is a form of brick wall limiting. This signal is hard limited to a specific range of values with no regard for what sort of distortion this will cause to the original signal. By distortion, I mean the fact that we had a nice smooth curve and now it's got like a square top and a square bottom. It is no longer accurate to the original. A compressor allows us to control the signal's amplitude in a musical way and in an automated way. There are four parts to every compressor. The two main parts are the threshold and the ratio. So we're going to talk about our hypothetical signal for a little bit. Our signal is currently being clamped by the sound card whenever the absolute value of the signal is greater than 1. That's happening right here and then right here. This plus 1 
this absolute value plus one, that is the threshold. And the threshold control tells the compressor whenever the absolute value of the incoming signal is greater than this threshold, whenever it's greater than this, apply gain to the signal, it can be negative gain, apply it to the signal so that the signal stays near or below this threshold. Now the next part is the ratio control. The ratio control affects how much gain is actually applied to the signal. It is, it is written as x colon y, like this. You've got x, y. So you could have 3 to 1, you could have 10 to 1, you could have 2.5 to 1, like that, okay? These are the different ratios. Now what they mean is that for every x decibels of input signal above the threshold, the output signal will actually show y decibels of signal above the threshold. So let's do an example to understand how this works, because it's easier to think of this stuff in terms of decibels versus negative 1 and plus 1 uh, normalized samples. Let's say that we have a signal that has a value um, of plus 6 decibels. We can see that it goes over this threshold right here. I've changed the scale on the side. Um, we still have 0, plus 1, and minus 1, but you can think of 0 as negative infinity because it means silence, like the signal level in terms of decibels is infinitely small. Um, and then the plus 1 is the same as 0 decibels below full scale. And then any signal above that is reflected as a positive value. Okay, let's say that our ratio is 2 to 1. And we're going to have a threshold of 0 dB. Okay, now let's say that our signal is plus 6 dB. That means that our signal is 6 decibels above the threshold. So let's plug the ratio into this line. For every x dB of input signal above the threshold, the output will show y dB of signal above the threshold. So that means for every 2 decibels of input signal above the threshold, the output will show 1 decibel of signal above the threshold. So our signal is 6 decibels of the threshold, so the output will actually only show 3 decibels of signal above the threshold. That's going to look like this. Okay. I should have probably used another, a different color, but you get the idea. This is plus 6 here. This is plus 3. Now let's try a different ratio, like 10 to 1. What that means is that for every 10 decibels of input signal that is above the threshold, the output will show only 1 dB of signal above the threshold. Our output is 6 over the threshold, so the output will only be 0 0.6 above the threshold, which means our signal, let me use a different color, it means our signal is actually going to look like this. I think that math is right. If it's 6 above the, the yeah, 10 decibel, 10 to 1 ratio, so we're going to get a 0 0.6 out of it. Now we can continue to increase this ratio and get more and more reduction of the input signal. However, we can never make the output not produce a signal over the threshold unless we use an infinite ratio, and that's what that brick wall limiting was that we saw before where the signal was just, just chopped off. That's where it just went like that and like that. That's that brick wall limiter thing that I mentioned earlier. That's using that same ratio of infinity to 1. Okay, so that covers threshold and ratio. These are two of the four parameters. You can see them here. We got threshold and ratio. Now clamping the audio like this doesn't sound musically pleasing. Furthermore, going from clamping the signal to suddenly not clamping it doesn't sound good either. And this brings us to the other two parameters the attack and the release. The attack parameter controls how long to wait after the signal exceeds the threshold before gain reduction is applied. The release parameter controls how long to wait once the signal stops exceeding the threshold before the gain reduction is no longer applied. Let me show you what that looks like on this graph. All right, we're back with our signal. It goes from, it's got a plus six dB range on it. Uh, the threshold is zero. Is still zero. Let's give it an attack time of one of these ticks right here. So what that means, if we draw a vertical line, 
where this intersection happens. Let's just let's just pretend it happens right on this line right here. That means that we're going to wait until this tick to actually start compressing this signal. Okay. So now I've got this orange line right here. What this means is that it's not going to start applying compression until this point in time. So this chunk of signal right here is not compressed. It's going to go over the threshold. And what is actually going to happen is we're going to apply the same rule right here of, you know, let's do two to one. So this is, you know, let's say this is, this looks like four. So we're at four dB. So this is going to produce an output of two, which means we're going to get something like this here. We're going to see that. Okay, so like I was saying, we have this one intersection point. What's going to happen is the signal is going to come to here. It's going to rise the way it was normally going. And then when it's going to hit that attack time, let's say this is attack right there. Yeah, this is going to go down like this and go like that. So it's going to wait before gain uh, reduction is applied based on however long this time is set to. Okay, that's the attack time. Again, the release parameter is going to control how long to wait once the signal stops exceeding the uh, threshold before gain reduction is no longer applied. So what that means on this side is that Let's say the release time, let me draw this line down here. Let's say this is our release right here. Just, it's just one chunk of this right here. So what that means is it's gonna continue to apply gain reduction to this until we get to about there and then it'll drop across. And how much gain reduction is applied depends on the ratio. These two parameters, the attack and release time, allow us to smooth the transition between compressing the input signal and not compressing the input signal. And then finally, the threshold is always expressed in decibels and the attack and release times are expressed in milliseconds. So the ratio is not expressed in any units, even though conceptually we like to think of it as input decibels versus output decibels. So with this knowledge in hand, let's uh, begin coding up some audio parameters to control our uh, soon-to-be functional compressor. One of the things we need to think about is synchronizing these audio parameters with our GUI. Thankfully, Juice solves that for us with the audio processor value tree state class. This class synchronizes our audio parameters with the host application that is loading our plugin and with our plugins GUI. We're gonna need one of these in our audio processor. It's gonna need to be public so that the GUI can attach all of its knobs and sliders and buttons, etc., to it. Now parameters must be declared when the plugin is created. They cannot be dynamically created. As such, the APVTS expects us to provide the list of parameters when it is constructed. So we're gonna need a function that will provide that list for us in the form of an audio processor value tree state parameter layout object. Let's head on over to our plugin processor.h. Let's go to the end of the public section right here. And I'm gonna use an alias using apvts equals juice audio processor value tree state. Now I'm gonna declare this function first, static ap, oops. Um, parameter layout, create parameter layout. All right, now we can declare our APVTS. Give me the argument list. All right, we want this one. All right, we want to connect to this. We're not gonna use an undo manager. Um, we're just gonna call it parameters. And then the parameter layout will be provided by our create parameter layout function. All right, let's declare Let's see, I'm gonna use my alias now. APVTS. And then I gotta use curly braces here instead of parentheses, because it's initialization. Now we can go implement our, uh, the function that will provide the, param the parameter layout. Let's go to the CPP file. I'm gonna put this all on one screen. Let me hide this, uh, hide this assistant guy. All right, I'm gonna put this down in, uh, put this past the set state information. Put this right here. First things first, return type, parameter layout, and then the name of our class and the function. All right, first thing we need is uh, the thing we're gonna return, 
out and we're going to return that. All right, we're going to be using the juice namespace a lot. I don't want to have to type it, so we're going to use the uh, using alias. Okay, the first parameter we will create is the threshold parameter. I'm going to set the range for the threshold to be between negative 60 and plus 12. I'm going to set the step size to one decibel, meaning we can adjust the threshold in one decibel increments. The skew parameter will be one. Now the skew parameter affects how this range of values from negative 60 to plus 12 is distributed across the slider. That for the uh, slider that's going to be attached to this parameter. If you want to learn about this stuff, I covered all of this in detail in the simple EQ tutorial. Okay, here we go. Layout.add. We need to make a unique pointer. All right, we want to make a audio parameter float. This one right here. That guy off. We're not going to use this. Our first parameter is going to be threshold. The parameter name is also threshold. Normalizable range, uh, we'll figure that out in a second. All right, we want to have a default value of zero decibels for our threshold. Let's define a normalizable range next. Normalizable range, let's see, which one do we want? Uh, this one has start, end, interval, and skew. We'll use that one. All right, it's going to be a float type. Our range start is going to be negative 60. Range end is positive 12. Our interval value is 1 and our skew is one. All right, awesome. Next, I'm gonna dial in the attack and release. I want to have a minimum attack and release time of five milliseconds. So that means our compressor will always take at least five milliseconds to start compressing once the input signal goes over the threshold. I'm gonna set the max time to 500 milliseconds and I'm gonna set the step size and the skew to one. The uh, slider controlling the attack and release will be linear, just like the threshold slider. Let's do that next. First, let's define the range. Auto attack release range equals normalizable range. This guy right here. Float our range start is going to be five milliseconds, like we said. Um, then we're going to have 500 as the end, and then one and one for the skew and for the step size. Let's add an attack param and a release param. Layout.add, make unique. Uh, this is audio parameter float. And, oops, I forgot. This, we want this one right here. Okay, this is attack, attack. Our normalizable range will be this thing. Our default value will be 50 milliseconds. All right, we can do the exact same thing for the release. We just need to change the name. Paste that there. I'm gonna change this release time to be 250. I'm gonna need to add the closing caret to the template type. And then let's change this to say release. And let's line these guys up. Now, finally, we need to give ourselves some ratios. A one-to-one -one ratio results in no compression, and a 100-to-one ratio is basically brick wall limiting. I'm gonna use those values as like my start and end range, and I'm gonna add some values in between. And since I don't want to use linear steps between one and 100, because that would just provide a huge list of ratios, I'm gonna use audio parameter choice and hard code the choices that I'm gonna use, okay? the audio parameter choice constructor requires a string array of choices so i'm going to declare my choices first i'm going to convert them into strings and then i'm going to add them to the string array then i will create the parameter so here's my choices so i'm going to do i'm going to start at one one two three four five with a 1.5 this is a pretty common um just you know very very light compression Basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, linear steps. And then once we hit 10, I do 10, 15, 20, then 50, then 100. Okay, this 20, 50, and 100 are all basically gonna sound the same. They're just variously more aggressive forms of brick wall limiting. Now I can declare my string array. And now I can use, I can convert my choices into juice string objects. Now there's a string constructor that takes a, um, takes a double and we can specify how many decimal places get used. So that's the one I want here. Double, double value, int number of decimal places. I only want to display one decimal place. We're gonna do that first, and we're gonna pass the choice to it. That takes care of that. 
Now we can create the parameter. And I do not want one to one to be the default ratio. So I think three to one would be better. So I'm gonna use the index of this guy right here as the default value. And remember that indexing starts with zero in C++. So we go like this, layout.add std make unique audio parameter choice. All right, this is gonna be called ratio. This is also ratio. And my choices are the string array. My default index is, let's see, this is zero, one, two, three. That guy right there, all right. Like that, and then we need our carrot. All right, there we go. Let's run it, and we will see our sliders. Let's see what we got. This should show us some sliders. Okay, look at this. We got our threshold guy right here. We've got our attack time. We have our release time, and here we have our ratio. Awesome. Let's add saving and loading of the parameters next. Let's implement saving and loading of our plugin parameters state. It's very easy to do because the plugin state is stored in the audio processor value tree states state member. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Go over here, let's go to where it's actually uh, defined, jump to definition. Way down here in the at the end of the public section, there is a state member. Let's just look for that state. Right here, yes it was at the uh, bottom of this. Okay, this is the public member, the state. Okay, this is the state of the whole processor. All right, let's go back to where we were, plugin processor.cpp. Let's move to the get state information function. It's very easy to um, implement saving and loading of our plugins parameter state, and that's because the uh, plugin state is stored in that state uh, value tree, okay? Now the value tree serializes to memory very easily. We can use a memory output stream to handle the busy work which is needed to write the APVTS state to the memory block that this function has been given by the host. It's this thing right here. So all we have to do is create a memory stream, juice memory output stream. Uh, here's the block we're gonna write to. Okay, we're gonna write to destination data. Um, yes, we can append, because who knows if we're getting an empty one or a full one one that's empty or one that's already got a bunch of stuff in it. Let's give ourselves a member name, a variable name. And then we can just do apvts.state.write to stream and then write it to our memory output stream. All right, wasn't that easy? Now we can do the reverse and restore our plugin state from memory using a value tree helper function. The only thing we need to check for is whether or not the tree that was pulled from the uh, chunk of memory we were given, this stuff right here, we just need to check if it's valid um, before we copy it into our plugin state. Once we know that it's valid, we can replace the plugin state appropriately. Here is the free function to use, juice value tree, read from data. This is the one we want, so we're gonna pass it data. We're gonna pass it size in bytes. This is gonna give us back a value tree, auto tree equals. We just need to make sure it's valid if tree dot is valid. If it's valid, then we can replace it. APVTS.replace state with our tree. Awesome, let's test it out. Where did that go? Oh, you're hiding, okay, we'll put you here. All right, I'm gonna change the ratio from three to 10. Then I'm gonna save and quit. And then I'm gonna rerun it. The ratio should appear as 10. And there it is, perfect. All right, cool. Let's add a compressor next and get it to modify some audio next. If you get stuck or run into trouble while coding this or Simple EQ, just grab one of my free products from programmingformusicians.com and you can message me directly in the Slack workspace and I will help you directly. Juice has a generic compressor that we will be using for this project. In order to access it, we need to include the DSP module first before we can use it. So let's go to our juicer file. Okay, go to the module section, click on this plus icon right here, add a module, global juice modules path, and choose the juice DSP class, juice DSP module. Save and reopen. All right, now, there it is. Now we can use the juice DSP classes. Let's go to the private section of our header file, pro plugin processor. Let's declare an instance, and then next we will prepare it in Prepare to Play. So juice 
DSP, compressor, float, compressor. That was easy. All right, let's head over to the CPP file and prepare it. Go to plugin processor and go to prepare to play. Now we need to prepare our compressor. We do this by passing a process spec object to the compressor. We must first set up this spec object. Let's declare one, juice DSP process spec, give it the name spec. First, it needs to know the uh, maximum number of samples that will be processed at any time. So spec dot maximum block size equals this parameter here, samples per block. Next, it needs to know the number of channels. This compressor can handle multiple channels. We will use the number of ch output channels that our plugin can support as the number of channels to configure our compressor with. spec.num channels equals get total num output channels. Okay, and now it finally, it needs to know the sample rate, which is this parameter here. spec.sample rate equals sample rate. Now we can pass it to our compressor, which will prepare it. Compressor dot prepare spec. Next, go to process block. All right, now we can start using our compressor to squish our audio. The compressor wants a context to process, and this context requires an audio block in order to be constructed. So let's create an audio block out of the buffer that was provided to us. Let's get rid of this stuff right here. And we're gonna leave this code which clears channels that are not in the input. Okay, so first, Let's declare an audio block, juice DSP audio block. And we want to use the one that takes a buffer as the constructor. Float, pass it the buffer. Pass it this thing right here. All right, let's give it a name, auto block equals, whoops, let's spell that right. All right, now that we've got our block, we can create a context. Auto context equals juice DSP. And here's where we want our context. We're gonna use a replacing context, which means we're going to replace the audio in the buffer with our processed audio. Okay. And we want the one that takes a block as its constructor argument. Float block. Now that we have our context, we can process audio with our compressor. Compressor dot process context. Let's run it. Everything should sound the same. Let's try it out. And just to be sure that I've got some signal that stuff is actually happening, I'm gonna instantiate project 12. I'm gonna feed project 12 with our output. And this is just gonna be over here so we can see what's going on. Okay, let's play it. We're gonna run some sound through it. All right, now not doing anything to the sound. And if we bypass this, we can confirm that. Because sound is the same. All right, so this is because we have not wired up any parameters to our compressor to adjust the uh, threshold attack release and whatnot. We've got our parameters here, but they are not connected to the compressor that's actually doing signal processing. Let's do that next. Head on over to the header file, plugin processor.h. Okay, now the APVTS has a member function that returns pointers to the parameters that we created in the create parameter layout function. It does not make sense to call this member function for every single parameter. Every time process block is called, remember process block, um, if our buffer size is small, it could be being called 750 times a second. Um, so the cost of looking up those parameters could get expensive very quickly. And this is one of those optimizations that we can do. I know the rule, don't prematurely optimize, but this is one of the ones where it's okay to do it. All right, so let's create some member variables that will act as cached versions of our audio parameters for this compressor instance. We are gonna use the same types that we used when we created our parameters. If we go over here, go to our create parameter layout, we used audio parameter float, 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 and audio parameter choice. So we will create pointers to those, okay? So go to plugin processor.h and start declaring them here. Juice audio parameter, oops, let's spell that right. Parameter float, make a pointer, attack, initialize it. Okay, and we're gonna do the same thing for the release and the threshold. Release, threshold. And then the ratio is a choice parameter. Juice 
audio parameter choice. Let's move over to the process block next and use these guys first before we set them up. Okay, go to process block. All right, now here is how we use these guys. First of all, we need to use them. We need to configure all this stuff before we start processing audio. So I'm gonna do that before um, I create the block and the context. Okay, here is how we use these parameters. The float parameters have a get function that we can use, and we just need to call the appropriate compressor function uh, with this parameter value. So we do compressor.set, and you can see we've got choices here, attack, release, threshold, ratio. So let's start with the attack. Set attack, and then we call attack param, and just get the value. All right, let's do the same thing for the release and the threshold. Compressor.set release, release, get. Compressor.set threshold, threshold, get. Now for the ratio setting, we need to extract the float value from the current ratio choice. If you recall, let's scroll down here. If you recall, uh, the choices are stored in a string array. All right, so we need to get the float value of the current choice from the string. And thankfully there is a helper function in the string class which does this for us. And all we need to do is get the name of the current choice and then call that helper function. So let's do that next. We can do compressor dot set ratio and do the ratio parameter and we need to get the current choice name this guy right here it returns a string and then we just need to call that string helper function get float value and before we actually test this we need to initialize our member variables so they aren't null let's go to the constructor to do that because if you remember when we declared these guys they're all currently null. If we were to run this now, we would get a big old crash. All right, so let's go on up to the constructor. All right, now, as I said earlier, there is a member function in the APVTS that allows us to retrieve pointers to parameters that we have added. And all of these parameters are stored internally as ranged audio parameter. This is the base class that all parameter types come from. So we need to cast these parameters these ranged audio parameters to their correct type before we can assign them to the cached instances that we declared. So let's do that. We need Let's do the attack parameter first. Let's do attack equals, like I said, we need to cast it to a juice audio parameter float. And this is where we call apvts.get parameter. And our name was attack. Okay, now the get parameter function will return a null pointer if the parameter name that we provided is not found in the uh, list of parameters. In case we type the parameter name incorrectly, it's very useful if we assert when the parameter is null. So this is gonna help us catch any misspelled parameter names. So we can do j assert attack is not a null pointer. Remember this function returns null if it doesn't find this parameter. And if it does find this parameter, then um, if this cast succeeds, then the attack will not be null pointer. If this cast fails, like for instance, let's say the attack was actually an integer audio parameter int, or this cast would fail and we would have a null pointer here and we would hit a J assert. So this is really handy. So let's do that same thing for the uh, two other float parameters. Just copy this. We'll make this the release, release and change this to release and then we can do threshold 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 and threshold for the ratio we need to cast to audio parameter choice is this ratio 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 choice audio parameter choice and ratio all right perfect let's compile it and run it and tweak some sliders we should hear some audible effects here's how we're going to test this out Okay, change the ratio to like 50 to one. And then we're gonna set the threshold pretty low and then we're gonna start messing with the attack time. So, highly recommend get yourself some headphones to hear this. All right, let's run some audio through it though. All right, change that ratio to 50, drop that threshold down. And we can really hear it clamping on that signal. Let's adjust this attack time. So you can hear how the signal goes, you can hear how the signal peeks through and then gets clamped down real quick. That's that attack time. The wait once the signal is past the threshold before it actually starts getting clamped. We can hear if we change the 
change the ratio to something more subtle uh, to a, a lower ratio, we can hear that it's going to, um, it's not gonna be as drastic of an effect. So if we go back to 50, we can really hear it doing something major. And then if we set that attack time as fast as possible, we're not gonna hear any attack at all because our ears just don't hear it. We just hear the audio getting really slammed. Okay. If we set that release time really fast, we're not gonna hear so much. Oh, we can start to hear a lot of distortion happening. It's really smashing the signal. All right, let's bypass it. See what's going on. All right, let's increase that release time. All right, cool. So there we go, our compressor is currently compressing. All right, let's find something else to do to make this, to turn this into a multi-band compressor next. All right, cool. Let's add a bypass parameter. It's much easier to click on this parameter than it is to right click on the plugin in the audio plugin hosts filter graph and toggle that menu option. So let's head on over to the create parameter layout and add a bypass parameter. Stick this at the end. Layout dot add std make unique. And we want to add an audio parameter bool. Audio parameter bool. This one right here. All right, this is called bypassed. Same name, bypassed. And the default value is false, meaning it is not bypassed. That means it's active. Next, let's declare a cached version of this. Plugin processor.h down at the bottom. Stick this guy right here. Juice audio parameter bool pointer bypassed null pointer. We can toggle whether or not our compressor processes the audio by setting the is bypassed flag on the context. Let's head on over to the plugin processor.cpp, go to process block, and we can modify this context. Okay, this is the simplest way to do this. We can uh, toggle whether or not our compressor processes the audio. Let's just actually go look at this. Okay, if context is bypassed, then just copy from the input to the output and get out of here. Okay, otherwise, we do all this stuff which actually processes the code, processes the audio samples. All right, this is the simplest way to toggle bypassing. All we have to do is go context.isBypassed equals our bypass parameter and get that value. Okay, another option would be to write an if statement and wrap all of this stuff that creates um, that creates the block and the context and does the processing in that. But this is much, much simpler to just do this. Okay, so let's finally move to the constructor and initialize this param. We will follow the same pattern as before, initialize and then check it out. All right, we copied it, let's change this to be bypassed. And we want audio parameter bool. And this is bypassed. And then we just check it if it's null or not. All right, let's run and test it. Let's see what happens. Grab these headphones one more time. All right, there's our bypass parameter. Go ahead and start the music. Wow, it is really slammed. There we go. Bypass parameter is working as uh, expected. So this makes it much easier to compare the unprocessed and the processed audio so we can hear what our compressor is doing. All right, cool. That was easy, super easy. We are trying to build a three band compressor. What we have done so far is implemented the functionality of a single band. So it makes sense for us to wrap this functionality into a class so it can be reused easily. Let's do that next. Let's declare a compressor band struct. Let's go to our plugin processor.h. Turn on the assistant editor. Actually, before we do this, let's make a commit. Let's go over here, stage all this stuff. Um, I'll say implemented basic compressor functionality. All right, there's our juicer file. Filter graph, yes, we want that. All right, we added our params. And here's where we initialized our params. 
Here's where we initialized our compressor. Here's where we processed our audio. Here's where we saved the, uh, here's where we're using the generic audio processor editor. Here's where we are saving and loading the state. And then here's where we are creating our parameter layout. All right, as I was saying, let's go to our header file, go up to the top. Let's declare a compressor band struct. Let's add an instance of the compressor class to this and make it private. Now for the ease of initialization, I'm going to make the audio parameters public in this class. Let's just go copy them from our audio processor. Let's copy these guys. Let's make them public. Next, we are going to need some member functions that update the compressor settings that prepare the compressor and that also process audio through the compressor. Let's declare the prepare function first. Put that down here. It's gonna take a process spec object. Let's prepare our compressor with it. Now we can update our compressor settings by copying the code from the uh, process block function that we had written earlier. So let's do that. Let's just write this function right here, void update compressor settings. And then let's go to our process block. That's right here. And we're gonna grab these things and just copy that right over like that. Okay, the same goes for processing audio. We are gonna copy the code that we used here. It's these guys. And we just have to remember to pass in a buffer by reference since we will be modifying that buffer. So let's declare that here, void process, juice audio buffer, float reference buffer, and now we need our block and our context. We need to set the bypass state and then process. Boom. Now we can replace our compressor and the parameters in our audio processor with one instance of this compressor band class. Let's do that. Go way down to the bottom. Let's comment all of this out and change it to compressor band compressor like that. Now we need to do a bit of revision in the process block. It's right here, so let's take care of that. It's coming out the old way of using the compressor. Let's comment that stuff out. Now we just need to call the update function that updates the compressor, compressor.update settings, and then pass our buffer directly to the compressor, compressor.process buffer. Okay, the last thing we need to do is configure these parameters like we were doing, but um, we need to configure these in the constructor, but for this object instead of these directly. All right, we just need to go up to here. Now we need to make these all say compressor dot attack, that sort of thing. So these cached parameters now live in the uh, compressor band class, so we just need to update these variable names here. Compressor dot attack, like that. Ratio and bypassed. Okay, let's test it. Everything should function exactly as it did a moment ago. Let's try it out. All right. Oh, I forgot my headphones. All right, um, let's do a quick clean and rebuild just to make sure. Clean, rebuild. All right, one more time. All right, that works as expected. We can now start to think about how to write a multiband compressor now that we have this building block of the compressor band. All right, let's make a commit now that we have our compressor band. Um, let's clean up this code. Let's get rid of this dead stuff too. Let's see. It's gonna be in process block. That's down here. Let's get rid of this. Okay. 
Let's make a commit. Added compressor band wrapper. That's that, that's that. That's that guy, that's that. All right, and our filter graph stage. Okay, great. Let's figure out the roadmap for implementing the rest of the DSP in our plugin. Let's go up to the top. We'll put this at the top of the header file. Where's the header file? Here we go, at the very top. We'll put this below the Pragma ones. Okay, roadmap. Number one is figure out how to split the audio into three bands. Figure out how to split the audio into three bands. Number two is going to be create parameters to control where this split happens. Number three, we need to prove that splitting into three bands produces no audible audible artifacts. Okay, number four, we need to create audio parameters for the three compressor bands. Create audio parameters for the three compressor bands. And these need to live on each band instance. Just like we currently have one compressor band which has the parameters as cached members. Okay, number five, we need to create the two remaining compressors create the two remaining, not create, we need to add the two. Add two remaining compressors, because we already have one. All right, number six, we need to add the ability to mute, solo, and bypass individual compressors. Add ability to mute, solo, bypass individual compressors. Number seven. We need to add input and output gain because compression lowers the output level. Add input and output gain to offset uh, changes in output level. Number eight, we need to clean up anything that needs cleaning up. Clean up any um, anything that needs cleaning up. All right, that will conclude the DSP side of the plugin, DSP roadmap. Okay, let's get started on the first one, uh, figuring out how to split the audio into three bands. All right, it's time to break out the whiteboard. Okay, let me erase this graph of how the sound card talks to the process block and the speakers. Okay, sorry for the ring light. Okay, here we go. All right, we learned in the simple EQ project about low pass and high pass filters. Let's just draw what those are. So say we've got, um, say we've got a filter spectrum like this. Um, here's like, here are the different frequency ranges. This is like 20 hertz. This is 20k. All right, low pass is eliminating all the frequencies above whatever the, the threshold is let's say we got something like this so if i go let's say i want to eliminate all the frequencies below um let's just call this 1k right here if i want to eliminate all the frequencies i would use a high cut filter which is going to cut out the high stuff and our frequency response will look like this likewise we can have a uh, a low cut which is going to eliminate all of the frequencies below whatever our cutoff is set to. Let's set it to the same frequency. So I will have our filter response like this. All right, so that's what we learned in Simple EQ, the um, low pass and high pass, or low cut and high cut, however you want to think of it, okay? Now, if we duplicate our audio buffer, we can filter the copies separately. And if we set the cutoff of these two filters to the same frequency, then we will get a frequency response like this, where we have roughly flat, except for right here. Now there's a special type of filter that we can use for the low pass and high pass filters that will actually produce a flat magnitude response when we sum the output of both of, uh, both of these filters. This is the Linkwitz Riley filter. Let me write that here. L-I-N-K-W-I-T-Z 
O'Reilly filter. Oh, geez, that's like a terrible R. There we go, that looks like an R. Okay, now these are known as audio crossover filters. If you have a speaker that has multiple drivers in it, it is using some kind of audio crossover to send part of the signal to each of the drivers separately. For instance, you might have a 10 inch uh, woofer, you might have a five inch mid-range driver, and you might have a two inch tweeter. So let me show you, um, let me move this stuff over here. Let me just draw a quick diagram of a speaker. The speaker's crossovers might be set up so that the 10 inch woofer only covers uh, frequencies below 100 hertz. Let me draw that on here. So the uh, speaker's crossover filters may be set up such that the 10 inch woofer only outputs uh, audio that is below 100 hertz. So that might be, that's this guy right here, this might only cover 100 hertz and below, which means it's only covering this range, like that. The five inch driver might be set up to only output 100 to 5,000. That might look like this. Let's see, here's, here's 5K right about there. And that means the tweeter can only output stuff above, well not can, the tweeter may be set up so that it only outputs audio above 5,000 hertz. So this is 5K plus. That looks like this. Let me clean up this line right here because this one's bad. Mm. Okay, now on a frequency plot, we can see that this is a pretty even distribution. The mid range is doing a decent amount, the um, low range is kind of handling there. Now, why do we do this? The reason is because it's pretty difficult to make a big, heavy 10 inch speaker move fast enough to produce frequencies above 5,000 Hertz, right? You got all that mass, you're trying to move it at a really, really fast frequency, and it's really difficult. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Likewise, it's really difficult to make a small two inch speaker like this tweeter uh, produce any kind of frequency below 100 hertz. You know, all of us are very familiar with listening to um, audio on our cell phones, on the speakers that are built in, and there's no bass whatsoever coming out of that tiny little speaker. So some really smart people figured out that if we split the signal using these special filters, these Linkwitz Riley filters, we can have much better sounding music come out of our speakers when we dedicate each speaker to a specific frequency range. All right, now in the juice module, there are Linkwitz Riley objects that we can use to split our audio into separate bands. Before we start using those, however, we need to start creating parameters that can control our filters and compressors. So we're going to have a lot of parameters for these compressor bands, so it makes sense now to refactor how our audio parameters are being created. We don't wanna to have to type so much code since there will be a lot of repetitive code in the next few sections of this course. Okay, let's get started creating a new approach to declaring our parameters. The system we are going to create will let us easily look up the names of our parameters and not have to worry about misspelling anything either, which is cool. All right, let's go to our header file. First, let's declare a namespace called params. Let's put this above compressor band. Namespace params. I am going to add an enumeration and this enumeration will represent all of the parameters that we are going to have in this project. We are going to add to it as we add more DSP functionality and add more GUI functionality as well. For now, here is the basic enum. I'm gonna call it names. I'm going to add two entries for the crossover frequency parameter first. Low, mid, uh, mid crossover freak and then mid high crossover freak. And then I'm going to add entries for the threshold, attack, release, and ratio for each of the three bands. 
Finally, I am going to add an entry for the ability to bypass each of these bands. Bypassed low band. We'll do low, mid, and high. All right, now I am going to create a map that will act as a lookup table for the string name of the parameters. If you remember, when we create our parameters, let's go way down here. When we create our parameters, we pass a string in, okay? So we're gonna pass in the names enumeration value and that will give us back our string name. That's how this map is gonna work. So this is going to eliminate the chance of misspelling anything. And we'll be able to use autocomplete to choose items from the enumeration when we look up our parameter names as well, which is cool. So here we go, inline const std map. We're gonna use our names enumeration paired with juice string. And this function is going to return this map as a const reference. I'm gonna call it get params. All right, now this is what is known as a Myers singleton pattern. Well, it's kind of like Myers singleton. It's more like a local function um, singleton pattern. First, we're gonna declare a static map and we're just gonna return that map. Map, uh, we'll call it params. And we'll declare what it is in just a second and then we will return params. Okay, so now we just need to um, supply um, pairs for the map. So we just need to start declaring them. So let's do the first one. We're gonna use this guy, low, mid, high crossover. And then I'm gonna provide the name for what I want this parameter to actually be called. Low, mid, crossover, frequency. Eh, I'll just do freak, so it's all within one line. Okay, we just need to do this for all of these guys here. So I'm gonna copy this. All right, last is to add a, oops, we need to add commas at the end of all of these. There's our map. Now what is interesting about this pattern is that this static map that we've got right here, it does not get created until we actually call this function. So that's pretty handy. Okay, let's update our existing parameters to use this map now. So we need to change where the parameters are created and also where they are assigned to the current compressor band. So let's do that first. All right, head on over to the create parameter layout function. I'm gonna switch from using, um, I'm gonna get rid of the assistant editor. All right, head over to plugin processor.cpp and go to create parameter layout. I'm gonna save myself a lot of time by adding the namespace alias right here. Not alias, by using the using keyword. And I'm gonna get a local reference copy of the parameters map. Const auto params equals get params. Now I just need to replace all of these strings with the uh, correct entry in the map. And I'm going to set all of these as though they were being assigned to the low compressor band. So the first one becomes params.at names threshold low band. Let's do the same thing for the attack and the release. And change this to attack low band, attack low band. And then for the release, let's fix this indentation as well. This is release, low band. Next, we need to do our ratio. Let's put these on separate lines. Copy these guys right here. Ratio, low band. And then finally, the bypass. Bypass, low band. Bypass, low band. All right, that was easy enough. Let's revise our um, constructor where we initialize the cached parameters next. Head on up to the constructor. I'm gonna do the same trick I used before of using um, the namespace and caching the, uh, sorry, not caching, but getting a local reference copy of the params map. Using namespace params, const auto params equals get params. If we look at our enumeration in the params class, we have a lot of float parameters. And the plan is to add solo and bypass functionality as well as mute 
which are Boolean parameters. And I don't want to have to keep typing this casting code more than I need to, so let's write a helper function to do that. Let's go back to our constructor. You can see what I'm talking about. I don't want to have to write this line more than I need to. Okay, so let's write a helper function. We are going to use an in place lambda, and I'm going to capture all the stuff that I use in the lambda by reference. Call this float helper. Auto float helper equals lambda, lambda, lambda. All right, we're going to need to capture the APVTS because we're using that to look up the parameters. So actually, let's do this. Let's, um, let's copy these lines into here, and we'll adjust what we've got. So we're going to change this to say param equals that, and then we'll just say param is not null pointer, null pointer, param. And then for this, we wanted to say uh, params at name, like that. Or we can do param name. OK, so what do we need to capture? Let's capture APVTS. APVTS equals this, APVTS. We need to capture the params. Capture those guys, capture these guys by reference. Now we need to pass in the parameter, this thing right here. So we'll just use auto. And then we also need to pass in the param name. Const auto param name. All right, cool. Unused variable. Let's use it now. I'm using auto here because I want the compiler to figure it out. And you can do that with lambdas, which is pretty cool. Again, all of these are being treated as though they are being attached to the low filter band. The first one we're going to do is the attack param, so do float helper. And our parameter is compressor.attack. And then our parameter name is the names low band attack. Okay, that takes care of this. Now we need to do the release param. That takes care of this. And now threshold. That takes care of this. Now I just need one for the choice parameter and the Boolean parameter. And remember, we're going to have three different choice parameters because we're going to have three different uh, compressors with ratios. And a Boolean one for the bypassed mute and soloed. So it makes sense to just create it now. So I'm just going to copy this. And we're just changing what the cast we're just changing the cast that gets used, really. So this is going to be audio parameter bool. Uh, not bool, we're doing choice first. Choice. So this is the choice helper. We can call it choice helper. We got compressor.ratio. And our param name is names uh, ratio low band. All right, that takes care of this guy. And now let's add our uh, boolean helper. Duplicate, paste, bool helper, change the cast type. And now we just call it bool helper compressor.bypassed. And we got names bypassed low band. All right, let's run it just to make sure everything works as expected. My headphones. We're going to adjust all the parameters and see if they work the way they should. Or if we get a JAssert false. All right, no JAssert, that's cool. When you make big changes like this, sometimes you need to recompile the code. So let's do a, you need to clean it out and um, recompile it from scratch. So let's do that. All right, here we go. Change that to 50. Drop that down. All right, that works for me. Save, quit. All right, awesome. All the controls are doing what they're supposed to be doing. All right, if you were curious as to why when we loaded this up, our previous parameter settings were no longer found, it's because we changed parameter names. So they fell back to their default values. Okay, onward. Let's make a commit of our changes. Let's see what we've done. Added road, added roadmap and params namespace. All right, that's that. 
and then we added where we use our params and all that good stuff. Okay, now let's uh, go to our roadmap. Let's tackle this guy right here. Figure out how to split the audio into three bands. I had mentioned Linkwitz Riley filters earlier. Now we are going to use them. Let's go look at the documentation for this class. Okay, it says that um, these are used in uh, audio crossovers that have two outputs, a low pass and a high pass, such that their sum is equivalent to an all pass filter with a flat magnitude frequency response. Remember this, it's, they're talking about this, like the response of the filter when you sum them together gives you a flat response. Okay, they are saying that summing the output of two filters is identical to the same result you would get if you ran your audio through an all pass filter. We are going to use that information later when we prove that the filters do not add any audible artifacts to the signal. For now, here is what we need to know. We can split the audio into two bands using the Juice Linkwitz Riley filters. Low band and high band. Once we do that, we need to split one of these bands into two other bands. But that comes with its own set of problems uh, that we need to deal with. So for now, let's just get a high band and a low band working first before we add a mid band. Okay, so let's go down to our plugin processor.h. So we're gonna go to our private section of plugin processor. We down at the bottom. We're gonna do this after our compressor band. Let's declare two instances of this Linkwitz Riley filter. I'm gonna use an alias to make typing it easier using filter equals juice DSP link with Riley come on autocomplete filter float all right give me two instances filter low pass high pass all right we are also going to need a cached audio parameter for the crossover frequency juice audio parameter float low crossover null pointer all right, each of these filters modifies the audio. If we low pass our process block buffer, then high pass filtering it will not give us the expected results. Here's my audio band. Okay, we're doing low pass and high pass. So if we low pass a bunch of signal like this, this is what's left in the buffer. Okay, this stuff right here. This is what's left in the audio buffer. All right, we originally had, you know, this was full spectrum. And then, you know, we chopped out all of the high pass. We did a low pass, which kept all of the low frequency and everything above it got cut. Now, if we try to high pass this at the same frequency, you know, we're trying to cut out everything below, you know, let's say this is our high pass. That means we're trying to cut out everything below this point, but there's nothing here. This is all gone. So the only thing we're gonna get left with is this chunk right here. That's not what we want. That is not the result that we want to have, okay? So what we need to do is use separate buffers. And these are what we are going to sum later. As the documentation said, if you sum the results together, you'll get a flat uh, magnitude response. All right, let's declare an array of buffers. STD array, juice, audio whoops let's spell that right audio buffer float two of them filter buffers let's spell that right okay let's create a filter parameter next and then initialize it and then prepare our filters and buffers head over to plugin processor.cpp create parameter layout let's do this at the bottom after we make our bypass param layout.add here we want std make unique we want an audio parameter float all right we are going to set the crossovers range to be the auditory range of human here of human hearing 20 hertz to 20000 hertz and we're going to set the default frequency to 500 okay so first things first let's provide our um, our names so params.at names crossover low mid All right, copy that duplicate it let's give our default value of 500 
and then we need a normalizable range normalizable range our range start will be 20 our range end will be 20,000 our interval value will be 1 meaning our value can change in increments of 1 Hertz so 20 21 22 23 all the way to 20,000 and our skew will be 1 Next, let's initialize our parameter. Go on up to the constructor. We can use our helper for that, float helper. Let's put this at the bottom. Float helper. We are initializing our low crossover with the names low crossover. Awesome. Now we need to prepare our filters. So go to prepare to play. Let's do this here. LP.prepare spec highpass.prepare spec. And now we need to prepare our buffers so that they don't allocate whenever we copy the input buffer into them. Let's do that next for auto buffer and filter buffers. Buffer.set size. The number of channels is spec.num channels. Number of samples is samples per block. All right, let's go to process block now. Let's disable the uh, compressor while we mess with these um, while we mess with these filters for a little bit. So comment those guys out. First, let's copy our incoming buffer into these dedicated filter buffers for auto filter buffer filter buffers. FB equals buffer. Each buffer in our filter buffers array now contains a copy of the input of the buffer that we were given from the sound card. All right, next we will update our filters cutoffs. Both of the filters are going to share the same cutoff. So auto cut off equals low crossover get. Now we can do LP dot set cutoff cut off and then HP dot set cutoff cut off. Now we must create blocks and contexts for the filters. Right, so we can do auto FB zero block filter buffer zero block equals. Okay, so we've got one audio block pointing to the first filter buffer and then another audio block pointing to the second filter buffer. Now we can create our contexts. All right, just initialize each context from the appropriate filter block. And now we can process our audio. LP dot process. LP gets the first filter buffer of the two. FB zero context. HP dot process. FB one dot context. Oops. No dot. Okay. Now that our input buffer has been turned into two separate buffers, each of which has been filtered separately, we need to sum them back into a single buffer. Now, in order to uh, ease some of this struggle with copying, let's cache some of the details of the um, input buffer. So auto num samples equals buffer dot get num samples. Auto num channels equals buffer dot get, whoops, let's spell that right. Buffer get num channels. And we need to clear our input before we start um, adding our filter buffers to it. So buffer dot clear. Okay, each channel of our filter buffer needs to be copied back to the input buffer. So I'm going to write a helper function to do that, um, and use a use a lambda in here to do it. Auto add filter band equals lambda lambda lambda. First thing, let's see. First thing we're going to do is um, create a parameter for our input, and then a parameter for the source that we're going to copy from. So here's our input buffer, input buffer, and then um, where are we going to copy from? So const auto source. All right, now we just need to simply loop through all of the channels that were in the input buffer and copy from a source buffer into that. So we can do for auto i equals zero. i is less than uh, num channels is what we want. So let's capture that by copy num channels i is less than num channels plus plus i and now we can do input buffer dot add from 
And let's see, what are our parameters? Let's see, buffer dot add from. Let's do this. Okay, our destination channel is going to be I. Our destination start sample is going to be zero. So let's just do this. We're going to do I. We're going to do zero. Our source is going to be the source. Source channel is going to be I. Source, source start sample is going to be zero. And then our num samples is going to be um, this because buffer and the source have the same number of channels. So we'll just call that NS. All right, this is what we add here. Done. All right, and we need to capture NS. NS equals num samples. Okay, right, just to go over that. So we are capturing our num channels and num samples. We are passing in this guy. We're gonna pass it in as a parameter. And we're going to copy every single channel from the source one at a time and add it to our input buffer. Now we just need to call this helper function with our filter buffers. Add filter band. Our input buffer is buffer and our source is filter buffers zero. Add filter band buffer filter buffers the second one. All right, perfect. Let's run this and see what happens. Grab my headphones. All right. Okay, all the top end is gone. Let's go figure out why that happened. Let's go look at how this class gets uh, created. All right. We have a type parameter, sets the filter type. Well, we didn't do that. Let's see what type this thing defaults to. All right, default filter type, low pass. So that makes sense. We're basically running our audio. Uh, this is low passing it, and then this is also low passing it at the same frequency. Let's solve that. We need to call that set, um, set type function. Let's do that in the constructor. Go on up to the constructor. All right, go down to the bottom. Let's configure our filters. LP.setType. Here we go, juice DSP. Link with Riley filter type. All right, our, our LP is low pass. And then let's do it again for the high pass. This is HP, and this is high pass. All right, let's test this again. Now remember, we don't have our compressors turned on, so we're literally just going to hear this filtering, the result of our audio going through the LP and the HP filters. Here we go. All right, no audible, um, no audible effects to me. And if we adjust the slider, which is adjusting the crossover, nothing, no audible effects. So that's fantastic. All right, perfect. We are halfway through splitting the audio into three bands. Before we go further, let's prove that our filters are producing no audible artifacts. We will also demo that the filters are actually doing something by soloing each one. We'll do all that stuff next. Let's make a commit of our progress. It's always a good idea to do that. What did we do? We added link widths Riley filtering. Here's where we did all the processing. Here's where we set up our filters. There's where we prepared them. Here's where we processed with them. Here's where we created the parameter. Let's go back here. Let's save and quit this. Okay, we can bypass the filtering by exiting the process block before we clear our input buffer and copy our filter buffers to it. It's just temporary, but we can use our single compressor's bypass parameter to control this. All right, the purpose is just to show that the filters don't introduce any audible effects. When the buffer copy step is bypassed, we are listening to the input buffer still. And when it's not bypassed, we are listening to the sum of the filter buffers being copied into the input buffer. So this is very easy to write. Uh, we just need to do it after this num channel. So we can just say if compressor dot bypassed. If it's bypassed, um, don't clear, just leave the function. All right, we've done our filtering, but we're not clearing our buffer and we're not copying stuff into it, okay? Okay, here is how we can prove that this is actually what is happening. Let's run this. 
Okay, first things first, make sure this bypassed low band is toggled on. Next, let's add a breakpoint right on buffer.clear. Now, if we press play, notice that the breakpoint does not get hit. And it's not until we uncheck the toggle button that it actually gets hit. And this is going to cause like some weird audio stuff, but you know, just bear with me. Okay, here we go. Gonna unbypass this. All right, hit the breakpoint. So let's remove the breakpoint and push continue. All right, now we can stop our audio. Okay, but that proves uh, the point I try. I was trying to make that. Our audio is actually running through our filters, and we can hear the difference between if it's um, between if we're hearing just like the raw buffer input, or if we're hearing our filtered input. Okay. All right. Let's talk about this crossover filter and one of the special properties of it. When you have a pair of these filters, like we have here, and you sum their output, like we are doing here. The result is the same as though you had run your signal through an all pass filter with the same cutoff frequency. I want to show you what I mean by that. So let's add an all pass filter and then demonstrate toggling it with our LP and HP filters so we can see how they sound the same. Okay, let's go to our header file. Let's go down here to our uh, filter. Um, let's add another filter, we'll do filter AP like that for all pass filter. And now it needs its own buffer, so let's give it one of those. Juice audio buffer, float AP buffer. All right, we will prepare it and set the type next. Let's go up to the prepare to play function. Prepare to play. Let's do ap.prepare spec. All right, let's uh, set the buffer size. AP buffer dot set size spec dot num channels samples per block. All right, let's go set the type in our constructor. We learned our lesson from the first time we messed with these filters and we're going to make sure we're going to set that type now. AP dot set type. Whoops. Set type juice DSP. Let me just copy this. It's all pass. Next, we will make our process block toggle between our low pass and high pass doing the filtering versus our all pass doing the filtering and we're going to use that bypass parameter um, like we used earlier because it's you know it gives us a toggle button that we can just easily click on and off okay let's go do that next all right let's go to our um, process block let's get rid of this bypass code let's just comment it out for now now we can copy our input buffer to our all pass buffer ap buffer equals in uh, buffer Okay, we gotta make sure we do that before we clear. All right, let's do the same processing. You know, we're gonna create a block and a context and then process with the filter. So I'll just grab these two lines right here and I will just rename them. This is AP block. And then this will be AP block. This is going to be AP buffer. And then this will just call this a all pass context. And let's do our processing, ap.process, ap context. All right, now we can revise our logic that does the copying. If the bypass toggle is unchecked, use the low pass and high pass buffers. Otherwise, use the all pass buffer. So if compressor bypassed get, if that toggle button is unchecked, use these guys. Otherwise, add filter band buffer from the AP buffer. This logic will let us hear the LP and HP buffers by default. We already know that they don't add audible artifacts and toggling this checkbox will show that the AP buffer produces the same result. So let's test this out. We're going to just run this. We're going to toggle the thing on and on, on and off. Grab our headphones. All right, so let's play it. Turn this down. So if I toggle this. All right, let's push stop real quick. Now we can confirm that it's working by making sure bypass is unchecked. 
and then setting a breakpoint in the else block. Let's press start. Once we click that checkbox, the breakpoint will be hit. Perfect. This is expected. Show all the GUI. Okay, so that works as expected. So let's investigate soloing the low and the high bands next. Okay, our compressors will be able to compress either band, so it's important to know what these bands sound like. Let's check that out next. All right, soloing one of these bands is really easy. We just need to comment out which buffer gets added to the input. So let's solo the low pass output by commenting out the second line. All right, we can toggle between hearing the all pass filter and the low pass filter using our checkbox. Let's run this. Oh, you know what? We can adjust this. There it goes. I was wondering why I wasn't doing anything. It's because I had this, this cutoff way up high. All right, so right now we're listening to the low filter, uh, the low pass band. Now we're listening to the all pass. All right, cool. Save that, quit. All right, let's do it again and switch to the high pass. Okay, so uncomment this one. Or sorry, comment the first one out and then uncomment the second one. All right, let's run and test. All right, we'll drag the same crossover slider again so we can change how much bottom end is actually cut out of the signal. All right, so there you go. So that is how soloing and the muting of the bands works, okay? It's all about figuring out which buffer you want to copy to the input. All right, so we're gonna do one more little test with these audio filters next. Okay, the final test that we will do is to sum the inverse of the all-pass filter with the output of the low-pass and high-pass filter. The purpose of this is to show how the two outputs sum to zero or silence. Again, we will be using the bypass switch to toggle uh, between this behavior versus hearing the output of the low pass and high pass filters. So let's comment out uh, this code. Actually, let's copy this first because we're gonna need this. Let's copy this. Now we can comment this out. All right, now paste this here. Okay, we are going to always copy the output of the filters into our um, into the buffer that we were given by the audio uh, audio system. Okay, now if the bypass switch is turned on, we will invert the all pass filter buffer and add that to the output. We can do that by going if compressor.bypassed get. If the switch is toggled on, then we need to invert every channel in our all pass buffer and then add that to the filter band. So let's let's set up the add band first. Add filter band buffer, we're copying from the all pass buffer. Okay, and now we just need to invert. So let's do this for every channel and we can do this using float vector operations. So for auto CH equals zero, CH is less than num channels, plus plus CH. Now we can do juice float vector operations and there's a, there's a way that we can multiply a fixed value against every sample in a particular channel. So we're gonna use that multiply and we want the one that takes a multiplier. Okay, our destination is going to be um, a right pointer to one of the channels in the AP buffer. So AP buffer dot get right pointer because we want to be able to modify this buffer. That's why um, our channel number is CH. Our multiplier will be negative one to flip it upside down. And we're going to do this for every sample. So num samples. All right, now that they are inverted, um, we already, we're already adding them over. Okay, so now the next thing to do, and this is actually something we forgot to do earlier, um, is to go up to where we are setting our cutoffs, and we need to set the all pass filter to that have the same cutoff as the other filters. We forgot to do this earlier, so when we were, when we were dragging the slider back and forth, 
yeah, it's just a fluke that um, it didn't sound audibly different to me. Let's go to the last step. We can test this out now. And if it works as expected, we will hear silence when we toggle the bypass switch. Let's check it out. All right. Silence, there we go. And if we adjust the frequency, again, silence. All right, awesome. So that is doing what it is supposed to do. Okay, let's learn a little bit more theory about this whole LP plus HP versus the all pass filtering and how we can use this to make three separate audio bands that sum to produce a signal with no audible artifacts. Once we have this knowledge, we will implement it and check off item one in the DSP roadmap. Let's make a commit of our progress from uh, working on this filter stuff before we start diving into filter band theory. All right, what did we do? Uh, we updated the filter graph. Okay, we um, uh, tested using all pass filter. That's basically what we did. Got our filter here and our filter buffer. Here's where we set up the uh, filter type. Here's where we prepared it. Here's where we set the cutoff. Here's where we did our processing. And then here's where we did the um, inversion to basically cancel out the regular filtering. That's what's going on there. All right. All right, let's talk about filter band theory. All right, let's discuss some theory behind these filters before we create the three band splitter. Filters work by delaying part of the signal. Let me get this more on camera. We've got a pair of filters here, a pair of Linkwitz Riley filters. We got a low pass one and high pass one. Okay, every time we filter the signal, we introduce a delay. Now, I don't know how the math of this delay actually works, and that's beyond the scope of this video. That's what they end up doing in the math is they apply delays to certain frequencies in the uh, spectrum, and that's how you end up getting that stuff to be muted. So when we split the signal into low pass and high pass bands, we are introducing the same delay, so to speak, to both parts. And then when we run the signal through an all pass filter, the same delay is produced. Of course, that's assuming the all pass filter, the low pass and the high pass all have the same cutoff frequency. So that means that we can use an all pass filter to equate this same delay, okay? So whenever we have a pair of these, we can replicate that same delay by using an all pass filter okay now we can use this to our benefit we can split our signal into two bands like we're currently doing and this split will just add one delay to the signal you know delay so to speak okay if we then split one of these bands into another delay we will end up with three bands let me show you what i mean all right so check it out we've got our three bands here this band this band and this band Okay, that's what we're trying to accomplish, three bands. However, the problem is that LP1's output, the signal that runs through this chain, only has one delay. Whereas the signal that is split from high pass one, this guy and this guy, there are two delays. And that means that our signals will not sum correctly. Okay, now as we learned earlier, the all pass filter introduces the same delay as this. So all we need to do is replace this line. You just, we just need to add an all pass filter here, set to the same cutoff frequency as these two filters. And we will have a, um, we'll have our solution. So this is the solution that we need to use. Okay. We just run LP one through an all pass filter. And that gives us um, an output that has the same number of delays as the other uh, signals over here. Okay. So the low pass one to all pass two contains all of the audio below filter cutoff zero. And then the uh, high pass one to low pass two contains all of the audio uh, between filter cutoff one and filter cutoff uh, zero, this range right here. And then high pass one into high pass two contains all of the audio at filter cutoff one. All right, so there we go, three bands that sum to a flat filter response, okay? And we can prove that this nulls out by creating two more all pass filters set to filter cutoff zero and filter cutoff one and inverting their output and then summing it with the output of these three bands, okay? All right, in project 12, you will learn how to dynamically create 
uh, n number of bands. You'll learn how to figure out, okay, if I have seven bands, how many all-pass filters do I need? How many low-pass filters do I need? How many high-pass filters do I need? And um, how do I structure them so that way it can all sum together and can all uh, do everything that it's supposed to do? My computer can handle about eight filter bands when I'm in debug mode. Um, maybe yours can handle more than that, but it's a really, really interesting problem to solve and is very cool. So let's code that up next and um, begin filtering. Let's restructure our filtering. I find that it helps to declare them visually in the same way that they will be structured. I'm also going to write the name of the cutoff parameter that will control that particular uh, group of filters um, above that filter itself. So let's get rid of our old filters and the buffers and stuff and start writing this first. All right, here we go. So filter, uh, we've got an LP1 and an AP2. All right, that's part one. We've got HP1 and that feeds into LP2. And then we've got our HP2 on the bottom. That guy, let's add these cutoffs next. Here we've got our FC0, filter cutoff 0, and filter cutoff 1. Let's rename this crossover and add another one for the mid-high. Right-click, refactor, rename. I'm going to call this the low-mid crossover. All right, let's duplicate this. And this is going to be the mid-high crossover. Mid-high crossover. Finally, we can give ourselves a third filter buffer because we have three bands. Let's add another parameter for the mid-high crossover. Then we will set our filter types and then prepare our filters and then use our filters. Head over to pluginprocessor.cpp, go down to create parameter layout, go all the way to the end where we create the low mid crossover. Copy and paste it and change this to the mid-high crossover frequency. All right, now while we are here, I'm going to change the range of the crossovers so they do not overlap. So this first one is going to go from 20 hertz to 999 hertz. I'm going to change the default to 400. And then for the second one, it's going to have a range of 1000 to 20,000 hertz. And the default value will be 2000 hertz. All right, let us set our filter types next and then initialize our cached crossover variables. Head up to the constructor. All right, let's go to, let's do our cached value first. So float helper, and we're doing the mid-high crossover. Names, mid-high. Now let's tackle these errors. We just need to rename these types. So it's LP1 now and HP1 and then it's AP2. And then this just needs to be duplicated for LP2 and HP2. All right, cool. Let us go prepare these next. Head over to prepare to play. Again, renaming the old filters. This is LP1, this is HP1, and this is AP2. And just copy these and rename. We've got LP2 and HP2. All right, we don't have an all pass buffer anymore, so this line gets removed. All right, let's configure some three band filtering next. Head over to process block. All right, the first thing to do is to configure the filter cutoffs. So the low mid cutoff is applied to LP1 and HP1. All right, let's rename this parameter as well. Refactor, rename, and this is low mid cutoff. The mid high cutoff is applied to LP2, HP2, and AP2. So let's get that value. Next, auto mid high cutoff freak equals mid high crossover get. And then this is AP2. AP2 gets the mid high cutoff. And then let's copy these guys. And this is LP2, HP2, and they also get the mid-high cutoff. The next thing to do is to create audio blocks and contexts for each filter buffer. Now there is a DRY way to do this, 
But if you want to know how to do that, you need to take Project 12, because Project 12 covers um, all that. In this video, we are going to hard code it. So the first thing we need to do is let's add a block for our third filter buffer. So copy and paste this. FB2 block goes to filter buffers two. Let's add a context for it. Copy this line. FB2 context goes to FB2 block. And now we need to run the appropriate context through the appropriate filters. LP1 and AP2 get the first filter buffer. AP2.process FB0 context. Next, HP1 and LP2 get the second buffer. But here's the thing we need to know. Let's come back to my chart here. OK, the thing to know, and I've written the names of like which filters go with which params. The thing to know about this is that um, HP2 needs the result of HP1. So we have to filter this first. We have to filter HP1 first and then copy it to the second filter buffer before we can run it through HP2. OK, that's the only gotcha that's going on here. All right. So, okay, so currently in our code, we've got LP1 and AP2 processing the first filter buffer. That's this line right here. Okay, now what we need to do is process HP1 into filter buffer 1. And then we can copy it to filter buffer 2 and run it through here. And then run LP2 through filter buffer 1. So we've got filter buffer 0, filter buffer 1, filter buffer 2. All right, let's do that. Let's turn that concept into code. All right. Let's see, HP1 processes filter buffer context 1. Then we copy the output of filter buffer 1 into filter buffer 2. Filter buffers 2 equals filter buffers 1. All right, now we can process LP2. That gets FB1 context. And then HP2 can process filter buffer filter buffer two. Okay, this is very important. Now our audio has been filtered into three bands and now we need to sum it back. Let's get rid of this um, code right here, the AP buffer stuff, because we don't have that anymore. And let's get rid of this stuff here as well. Let's just clean this up. Now I want to make the bypass act as a toggle like we did earlier, so we will just exit um, before we clear. We'll go like that. Okay, I am going to comment out all of this all pass invert code um, because I do want to come back to it in a little bit. Um, but for now, we just need to add the third band. And I am not going to use a loop for this, even though this is pretty repetitive. And that is because I eventually want to have the ability to mute and solo and bypass individual bands. And that is accomplished by not adding a filter buffer to the input buffer. And writing a loop right now would make that, you know, we'd have to revise it later, which is annoying. So for now, we'll just leave it. Uh, we'll just manually add each one like that. Okay, let us go test this out. We're going to toggle the bypass. We're going to drag the sliders, all that good stuff. All right, let's test this out. Just the sliders, toggle the bypass. Sounds good to me. I'm not hearing any of that phasing. That's fantastic. All right, now we can confirm that this is working by toggling the bypass checkbox and then adding a breakpoint anywhere after that bypass param check. So I'm going to add it on buffer.clear and let's push play. And then once we unbypass, our breakpoint will be hit. Yep. All right. So it works as expected. Okay, the last test I want to do is the null test with the inverted all pass filters. We will do that next. All right, let's close this guy, save, quit. Go to plugin processor.h. Okay, I showed earlier how a single inverted all pass filter will null the output of a pair of low pass, high pass filters when they are all tuned to the same cutoff frequency and you multiply the output of the all-pass filter by negative one. 
I'm going to show that the same thing is true here with these three bands. Each stage in the filtering acts as a delay. That's this stuff right here, the LP1 and the HP1, that's stage one. Um, and each delay can be nulled out with an all pass filter set to the same cutoff of that stage. So we've got two stages, so we need two all pass filters. Let's add them here. Filter, INV AP1, INV AP2. All right, now we are going to need one buffer for the all pass filtering since they are processed in series. Juice, uh, audio buffer, float. Inv AP buffer. Next, we need to set their types, then we need to prepare them, and then we need to process audio with them. Head to the constructor in plugin processor.cpp. Let's go down here. Let's do this at the bottom. All right, let's just copy uh, copy this all pass two dot set type. Let's put this at the bottom. All right, we're going to call this INV AP two and INVAP1. Go to prepare to play and prepare them as well as the buffer. Let's just copy this, paste, paste, INV. All right, and let's prepare the buffer, INVAP buffer dot set size, spec dot num channels, samples per block. Let's filter and invert some audio next. Go to process block. All right, we're gonna do this after we do our initial set of copying. First, we will copy the input buffer into the buffer that we will be processing, in AP buffer equals buffer. Next, we'll set the first inverted all pass filter to have the same cutoff as LP1 and HP1. Then we will set the second all pass filter to have the same cutoff as the second stage. Now we need to make our block and context to filter our all pass buffer with our filters. I'm just going to copy this and duplicate that. Let me do that after we process this guy. I'll put that right here. So this is inv ap block and we will use inv ap buffer and then here's inv ap context ctx and this is fed by inv ap block all right now we just need to process it inv ap one dot process ap ctx and then inv ap two dot process ap ctx Let's get rid of this bypass functionality for just a moment. If the bypass button is not ticked, let's see, let's comment this out. Let's talk about what we're gonna do. If the bypass button is not ticked, we will be hearing the audio running through our three filters. If the bypass button is ticked, we will be hearing the sum of the three filter bands added with the inverted all pass filters. That's what we're gonna implement next. All right, let's re-enable this chunk right here. And then let's change the names so it compiles. This is inv ap buffer. And then uh, that's it. That's all we need to do. All right. So we're always adding these guys. Um, and if our bypass button is turned on, then we are adding the output of the inverted all pass buffer after it's been multiplied by negative one. Okay. So clicking the bypass button should produce silence when we test this out. Here we go. All right, let's press play. Again, if we click this button, we should get silence. All right, and drag in the sliders. Perfect. All right, awesome. So this wraps up the theory side of things. We can start compressing our separate bands once we remove this inverted all pass filter stuff. All right, let's remove the all pass uh, filter stuff, the inverted all pass filter stuff. We're not gonna be using it anymore in this project. We are done with all of that. So let's head on over to plugin processor.h and we can get rid of this inverted all pass filter. We can get rid of the buffer. We can get rid of um, the stuff in the constructor. Stuff down here, get rid of these two guys. 
go to prepare to play. Basically everywhere, if we were to build this now, everywhere that we have errors is where we need to comment this stuff out. Okay, we don't have these three anymore, so I'll get rid of those. And then in a process block, that's gonna be right here. That's gonna be here and right there. That's gonna be all of this code right here. The actual block, context, and filtering. We don't need that. Let's turn this bypassing back on. And then we can get rid of all of this code that inverted the samples. We can get rid of this stuff right here. Let's build and test. Bypassing should not produce any audible differences. That's what we're aiming for when we use the bypass button and, um, versus if we uh, drag the sliders and whatnot. All right, let's try it out. No phasing. No audible difference here either. Awesome. All right, we can check off the first item in our DSP roadmap. Figure out how to split audio into three bands. Done. Cool. Let's make a commit of that. Figured out how to split audio into three bands. All right, here's our buffers and whatnot. Fill the graph, yes. All right, here's where we set our types. Here's where we prepared our filtering. Here's where we set our cutoffs. Here's where we did our processing. Um, and then this is just, here's our parameter. And then this is just where we are adding our third filter band. All right. Awesome. Let's create audio parameters for the compressors that we will be adding. We can also remove two other items from the roadmap since we completed them as well. Goodbye number two and goodbye number three. All right, so we are on number four now. All right, let's head over to create parameter layout in plugin processor.cpp. All right, we already created param names for these extra compressors, so we just need to create the parameters for it. Since they all are gonna have the same settings and range of settings, we can literally just duplicate most of this code that creates the current set and just change the names. So let's copy, let's do the threshold first. Copy this, paste it twice, and then hold down Option, Shift, to select multiple lines and then change this to mid. Same thing for this one here, change that to high. Done, couldn't be easier. Let's do the attack param, select this, paste, paste, option, drag, mid, option, drag, high. Boom. Okay, let's do the release param. Copy this, and option drag mid, option drag high. Perfect. All right, let's do the ratio parameter next. Copy, paste, paste, option drag mid, option drag high. And then the bypass parameter is next. Option drag mid, option drag high. All right, cool, let's run it. All right, look at all the parameters that we have access to now. All right, that was super easy. All right, let's close this. Now in project 12, I teach a much more optimized solution for creating the parameters and looking them up versus using this params, get params, uh, dot at thing that we're using here. All right, let's go on to the next item in the roadmap. Since we are up here, let's see. We're done with this, done. So now we need to reinstate our compressors and add two new ones. Let's do that next. Let's go to plugin processor.h. We'll go down to where we are declaring everything. Go to our private member variable section. The first thing I'm going to do is create an array of compressor band instances, and then I'm gonna create aliases to each one. 
Now the reason is so that I want to have the option to be able to loop through and I also want to have the option of being able to target each one individually without having to use array indexing. So check that out. Let's do std array compressor band three. There's my compressors. We're going to change this to be plural and now we're going to do compressor. Let's see, I'm going to do this on three lines. So you write this three times. Compressor band band comp. Uh, let's see, capital B. Band comp equals compressors like that. All right, let's just fill it in. All right, first, this is going to be the low band. This is going to be the mid band. And this is going to be the high band. This will be the first one. This will be the second one. And this will be the third one. Boom. That was easy. All right, now we need to initialize all of the parameters for all of our compressors. So go to pluginprocessor.cpp, go to the constructor. All right, I'm going to rename the very first one, and then I can just copy and paste the three lines to initialize the other two compressors. All right, so let's rename this right here. This is going to be low band comp, like that. Now I can copy and paste it and rename accordingly. All right, change this mid band, and then this one is high band. All right, do the same thing for the bypass and the ratio. So first rename this low band comp ratio, and then copy and paste this two times, and this is the mid band and the high band um, oh you know what I forgot to do all of these need to be um, let's see this is low so these need to be let's get let's line these up that could have been problematic let's see um, all right go to the end arrow over one two three mid same thing here high that awesome okay do the same thing here this needs to be mid with the capital M and then high with a capital H that could have been a disaster all right let's do this let's see this is low band comp bypassed copy and paste this and let's see this needs to be low this is mid this is high all right, and then this is going to be the mid band, and this will be the high band. Perfect. All right, the compressor parameters are initialized. Now we can prepare our compressors. All right, so when you're doing this step, be very careful to make sure you're initializing the low band compressor with the low band parameters. All right, you know, mid band with mid params, high band with high params. Okay. Just be careful, be very careful when you're doing this on your side. Go to prepare to play. All right, remember what I had said about the ability to loop through these? We can just do four auto comp compressors. Comp. Boom. Done. Onward to process block. First, we need to update all of the compressors settings again looping for the win for auto compressor compressors let's turn that on now we can't actually compress any audio until after it has been filtered so we need to move this line this compressor dot process until after all of the filtering has been completed so let's go do that all right that happens down here Okay, now one of the important things to note was that filter buffers zero, this guy right here, this holds the low pass audio. And that same index zero is the same index of the compressor that is set up for low band processing. So isn't that convenient? That means that it makes it really easy for us to run the correct buffer through the correct compressor. So it would be a problem if it wasn't done this way. Imagine if we had to remember that filter buffers two was 
the um, buffer to use for compressor zero. All right. Anyway, it's very easy to do this. We just need to use an index-based loop instead of a range-based loop for size t i zero. I is less than filter buffers dot size plus plus i. Now we can do compressors i dot process filter buffers i. Wasn't that easy? How simple is that? All right. Let's get rid of this uh, bypass stuff. Let's clean this stuff up too. We don't need that. All right. Let's get rid of this bypass stuff. We can delete it for good. And uh, that's it. All right. We can get rid of this stuff as well. All right. Let's test it out. Our compressors should be able to be um, tested separately. So grab your headphones and mess around with it. Here we go. Let's put this on screen so we can see more of the parameters. And let's um, let's see. Let's make the output of our compressor feed project 12 so we can uh, actually see the result. Let's just turn off all processing first. Okay. If uh, we're going to run some audio and then we're going to um, you know, adjust and adjust each individual band and just kind of mess with them. All right. So we got our low band. We're going to hear a, the way this is set up now. We're not going to hear a lot of low band. Right. We can really see this if we clamp it down. We can see that a lot of the low band is gone. Let's go down here. Let's see that that low end is really chopped. We turn it back. If we bypass it. We can see that uh, that happened. All right. Let's let's uh, chomp down the mid band. Wow, it's really getting chopped. All right. Let's adjust our mid band so it's tighter. And let's change that ratio. see this dip that's happening right here uh, between 1k between as we show here 761 and 2300 it's kind of a dip right here between 1k and 2k let's change this to be closer to 300 so that's right around where this line is you can see this dip right here so if I bypass the mid band see a little bit of a boost here let's change this ratio to be like really dramatic and really slam it All right, we can see a big dip right there, okay? All right, so that's a pretty good test. Next, let's add the ability to solo and mute the individual compressors, because that's a very cool feature. Let's save this and quit this. Let's um, make a commit. Let's see, what did we do? We um, uh, reinstated all three compressors. All right, so here's where we did that and filter graph and here's where we set up our parameters here's where we set up our ratio param our bypass param here's where we prepared them here's where we did our settings updating here's where we actually processed audio and we got rid of some code there here's where we created our params 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 good times commit all right solo bypass mute next Let's check off roadmap item number five. Add two remaining compressors, done. Number six, add the ability to mute solo bypass individual compressors. All right, we can already bypass an individual band. We just need to be able to solo and mute them. So let's duplicate the bypass enum entries and rename them. Go to the params, copy this. Paste, paste, and we just need to rename. So option shift mute and sorry, not shift, just option drag to select and then solo. I don't know if that's a thing on Windows, but on Mac it is in Xcode. It's very handy. All right, we just need to add them to our map below. Let's go down here. Again, copy, paste, rename. 
One, two. Let's get that back on the screen. All right, first things first. This is, um, let's see, we'll do mute first. Copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. All right, and then solo will be the second set. Solo, solo, copy, paste, paste. All right, awesome. Now we need to add solo and mute parameters to our compressor. Let's go to the compressor band and declare two more Boolean audio parameters named mute and solo. So duplicate this, copy, paste, paste. This is mute and this is solo. Now these aren't going to be used in the compressor class at all. They will be used in process block. We still need to create the parameters in parameter layout before we can initialize them in the constructor. So let's do that next. Head over to pluginprocessor.cpp and create parameter layout. All right, go to the bypass parameter. Where is that? That's down here at the end. All right, copy paste, rename. Do this for mute and solo. All right, change this to be the mute and mute again option drag mute and then we'll do solo here at the end solo whoops solo solo all right awesome let's go initialize the parameters in our compressors next go to the constructor all right Copy and paste the Boolean helper code for the bypassed param, and then rename accordingly. Whoops, let me add an extra line. Okay, this should be mute. Let's do all three of these. Um, let's see. Oh, I can't because their line lengths are different. But I can copy and paste. This is solo. Copy and paste. All right, now for these I can do it at the end. So this is, all right, no, because high is too long. All right, got to do them individually. All right, this is mute and then uh, solo and solo. Okay, excellent. All right, let's go solo or mute our separate bands next in process block. All right, this happens after buffer.clear. Right here. Okay, the logic is surprisingly simple. If any of the bands are soloed, we copy only the solo band's buffer to the output. Otherwise, if a band is not muted, we copy that band's buffer to the output. So first, we need to figure out if any band is soloed. And this is pretty easy to do. We start with a Boolean flag, and then we loop through the compressors and just check their solo param. If it's true, then we have at least one band that is soloed, and we stop checking once we have at least one. That looks like this. Again, we start with a flag. We loop through every compressor. If the solo parameter is true, then we have at least one that is soloed, so we don't need to check anymore. Let's comment out the old way of looping, of um, adding the filters. All right, now we just need to check if bands are soloed or not. All right. If bands are soloed, else. If any of the bands are soloed, copy only the soloed bands buffer to the output. Now we cannot use a range based loop here because our filter buffers don't live with the compressors, so we have to use an indexed loop instead. But that's okay, that's easy to use for size ti equals zero i is less than compressors dot size plus plus i again uh, let's get a compressor auto comp equals compressors i if comp dot solo if it's soloed then add filter band add the buffer and this one we want filter bands uh filter buffers we want i -th index i apostrophe th all right cool that's very simple to understand all right again if a band is soloed loop through all of the bands and if a band's solo parameter is on then we add the associated filter buffer that that particular band is using all right let's implement what happens when nothing is soloed next 
go to the else block. If nothing is soloed, then copy only the buffers that are not muted. Let's use the same loop again. And we need this uh, compressor part as well. Oops. All right. If comp.mute get, all right. If it is not muted, it's very important to include that exclamation part. If it is not muted, then we can add that filter band. Okay, that's it. That is solo, mute, and bypass. Let's test it out. Let's mess with the solo buttons and the mute buttons. Grab your headphones. All right, here we go. All right, this is bypass. Let's mute, let's solo the mid band. All right, and we can adjust this, adjust this range. We can see how, we, we, we can make this mid band really narrow, like that. All right, and we can bypass it as well. So we can see what our mid band actually is like and what it actually sounds like. What that means is that we can go up here and dial in all this stuff. Like say I want real slow attack time. I want to let all of that, you know, snare information through. I don't want that to get clamped down. So I can adjust all that stuff. What's this ratio? All right, let me stop. Let me stop soloing it. You know, it's funny about that. I was adjusting all those parameters and it was bypassed. So I wasn't even hearing it. So that's a whole, that's a whole thing. Like you shouldn't be able to adjust these sliders um, if it's bypassed, but that's something we implement later. All right, so we can mess with this mid band, see what it actually sounds like and use the bypass to, um, uh, kind of, you know, adjust this stuff. Let's change this ratio so it's real dramatic. There's a lot of information that's being, uh, let's see, is it in the high band? Well, the high band is real wide. All right, so we can dial in a lot of the snare stuff that's going on here. Anyway, that's solo, mute, and bypass. We can actually mute, all, mute the mid band. We can see it gets dipped out there. Let's mute the high band. Stuff gets kind of dull. If we mute the low band, it'll sound like a telephone. And we can, like, you know, tweak all this stuff further. Okay. All right. That is solo and mute and bypass of three separate bands with our filtering. So we can check another item off of our roadmap. Let's solo this. I'm not solo. Let's save this, quit, go to our roadmap, turn off the ability to, uh, let's mark it as done. That's awesome. And then uh, let's see, we're gonna add input and output gain to compensate for level changes. And then we're gonna clean it up and that will be the DSP side of things. Let's make a commit. All right, added mute solo functionality and bypass. Bypass functionality. All right, here's where we set up the uh, mute and solo params. Here's where we implemented the actual DSP. Here's where we created the params, uh, marked it off the list. Here's our enum, here's our param names, and here's our parameters um, on the compressor band. Excellent, done. All right, input and output gain next, and then a cleanup, and that will conclude the DSP side of this plugin. Awesome. All right, now it is time to add input and output gain because compressors lower the output level of the signal. The input gain is mainly if the incoming signal is not high enough or if it's too high and we need to turn it down. First, we need to add some entries in our enumeration that will point to the parameter names. Let's put these at the bottom. Next, we need to add two entries, so copy these. Stick these at the bottom. Number four. All right, we need to declare some gain processors and cached parameters. Go to plugin processor.h way down at the bottom where we are declaring all of our stuff. Let's put this after our filter buffers. Uh, let's see, juice, DSP, gain, float. We got input gain, output gain. All right, 
And then we need two parameters. These are going to be audio parameter float as well. Okay. We need to create some actual parameters that represent our input and output gain. So let's go to plugin processor.cpp, create parameter layout. So we're going to put these at the top. So I'm going to define a range of negative 24 to plus 24 with a step size of 0 0.5. This means we can boost or cut our incoming signal with a range of, uh, not in, with a range, but with steps of like 0 0.5, such as, you know, 1.5 dB of gain, 2 dB of gain, 2.5 dB of gain. Same will go for the output uh, gain levels. All right, so let's define that first. Auto gain range equals juice normalizable range. Actually, I didn't need to type juice. Just type normalizable range. Range start is negative 24.f. Whoops, that's a float in the wrong uh, placeholder. Here we go. Range start negative 24.f. Range end positive 24. Interval value 0.5f and our skew will be 1. Okay, that's our gain range. Now we can define our parameter. Right, let's just copy this. Paste, paste. Let's change this name to be gain in, and we'll change this to use our gain range. All right, and let's just duplicate this. Copy, paste, replace that. All right, now this can be gain out. All right, now that we have created the parameters, we need to initialize our cached parameters in the constructor. All right, let's uh, let's do this after our. Um, our crossovers, where's that? That's right here. Okay, float helper, input gain param. As with every other DSP processor, we need to prepare our gain processors before we can use them. Let's go to prepare to play. All right, we also need to specify the ramp duration for these processors. Now this function, uh, the ramp duration, it controls how long it takes to transition from one gain level to another. Um, whenever the gain level is changed. So anything quicker than five or 10 milliseconds is pretty audible and it sounds, it produces like clicks and pops. So I'm gonna go with 50 milliseconds. We'll go input gain, gain dot prepare. What do you want, Sarabi? Come say hi to everybody. Oh, yes. Everybody say hi to Sarabi. She's very whiny. Can you whine? You gonna whine to everybody? All right, down you go spec all right output gain dot prepare spec let's set those ramp times input gain dot set ramp duration in seconds 0 0.05 because there's a thousand milliseconds in one second so 0 0.5 seconds is 50 milliseconds all right do the same thing for the output copy paste copy paste Okay, now that this is all set up, let us start processing our audio with our gain processors. All right, um, let's see, go to process block. And before we start applying gain to our input buffer, we need to update our processors with the most recent gain parameter values. So input gain dot set gain in decibels, because we're storing our parameter in decibels, input gain param get. Do the same for the output. All right, we must apply input gain before processing audio through the bands. So I'm gonna call an imaginary function that I haven't written yet that applies the gain. And then we'll implement that imaginary function next. But first, we'll do that here. We'll call apply gain um, buffer and our input gain. I'm doing this because I'm gonna be applying gain. Uh, I just don't wanna have to write the code that actually applies the gain twice. Let's implement this imaginary function next. Head over to the header file. Plugin processor.h down at the bottom. All right, I'm gonna declare a helper function that will apply the gain. We are very familiar with creating the context for a particular buffer, so I'm tired of typing that code. So I'm gonna write this helper function. And I'm gonna use templates because I'm too lazy to figure out the type that each of the arguments should have. So, you know, why should I have to think about that stuff when the compiler can figure it out for me, you know? All right, so here we go. Template, type name T, type name U, uh, void apply gain, passing in a buffer, and passing in a gain. All right, let's make our block auto block equals juice DSP 
audio block float out of the buffer, make it out of the buffer. Let's make our context auto ctx equals juice dsp process context replacing float. This is out of the block. And then we can do gain.process ctx. All right, head back over to process block so we can apply output gain next. All right, now finally we apply output gain after processing all of the audio. Do that way at the end. After all of this stuff. Apply gain buffer output gain. All right, cool. Let's test this out. The gain sliders should change the volume. Headphones. All right, cool. Gain in at the top, gain out at the top as well. Let's mess with this. We'll adjust our levels. Let's just bypass um let's bypass our compression for right now. Turn down the input. That works as expected. All right, cool. That is awesome. That works as expected. All right, so here's an interesting test. Um, let's turn down the input gain to like negative 12. Negative 12, and then let's turn up the output to positive 12. All right, let's run some audio through it. Now, if we toggle the bypass of the plugin, oh wait, hold on, I need to unbypass this stuff. Okay, so let's see. All right, if we bypass this, the audio will sound the same. Okay, so this, you would think that we would hear some type of compression, especially if the compressors have a pretty low threshold prior to modifying the input and output gain. But when we do this, we don't actually hear any compression. All right. So the reason is because we turned down the input gain level, which means the low threshold that we had in the compressors is no longer low relative to the signal level. So we need to lower these thresholds by 12 dB in order for them to actually do anything. All right, so for example, if, let's see, um, I'm gonna do it to just the low band for now. Turn the mid band back up. Okay, I'm gonna set this to negative 20. All right, all right, let me just solo this real quick. Oh, look at me tweaking stuff. All right, here's our solo low band. All right, now because this is applying negative 12 to the input, um, it, our signal may not be hot enough to actually trick, to actually trip the compressor. So what we need to do is lower this by 12. So I'll put this to 32. There we go, now, we, now we're starting to hear it smash. You can hear it on the bass. Boom, 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 boom. that up a bit if we bypass okay all right so that's the interesting test do that now it'll be really be it'll be really be it will really compress it and if we put this back to 20 negative 20 we'll hear the same results that we heard a moment ago okay Okay, so that marks another item on our DSP roadmap. Let's save and quit this. Let's go up to our roadmap. Uh, where's that? Plugin processor.h, way at the top. Add input and output gain, done. Okay, so now the next thing to do is to clean this up. Let's do that next. Okay, uh, head on over to create, pro uh, create parameter layout. All of these thresholds use the same um, normalizable range, so let's DRI that, DRY that. Auto threshold range equals this thing. Cut, paste, semicolon, replace. The next thing to do is to move all of the code that updates the DSP processors into a function. Process block always operates in this order. Let's go to process block. Let's, see what, let's actually just see what I'm talking about. Process block always operates in this order. 
first thing we do is update DSP processors with the latest parameter values, and then we process the audio. So again, DSP processing is entirely state-based, and the parameters rep represent the state, so we update the stuff that does all the math with the latest DSP state before any math um, computations are actually performed. So I'm going to call an imaginary function first. Uh, I'm going to call that right here, update state. And then uh, we just need to move all of this code that happens here, all of this stuff, we just need to move that to that function. Okay, so let's do that next. First we go to declare it, plugin processor.h way down at the bottom. Void update state. Now we can go implement it. Uh, I'm gonna put this right above uh, plugin, I'm gonna put it right above process block. Put that right here. Simple MB comp audio processor update state. Let's update our compressor settings. All right, we need to update the uh, filters. Let's grab all this stuff. And then we need to update the gain processors. So let's grab these as well. Let's clean this up as well. Get rid of that stuff. And get rid of that. And get rid of that. All right, cool. And now process block is much simpler. Okay, we update our state, then we apply our gain. The next thing that happens is we split the audio into separate bands. So let's do the same thing. We will uh, call another imaginary function. We'll call that right here. Split bands, and we'll pass our buffer to it. Let's go declare it. Go to plugin processor down to the end. Okay, go back to plugin processor, and let's just move the relevant code again um, above process block. Void simple. I mean, comp audio processor split bands. Okay, so this is where we make this copy first. And we do our contexts, and this needs to say input buffer. We do our contexts and our processing. All right, cool. So again, we are making process block just that much simpler and easier to understand, right? We update our state, we apply our gain, then we split our bands, and then we're doing compression. All right, now I'm just thinking out loud here, but because the apply gain function is set up for a generic processor, we technically we could use it. Um, I mean, we could use it here for all of these, but um, there are five processors being used, which means that we would be creating five blocks and five contexts. And right now we're only creating three blocks and three contexts. So I'm gonna stick with what we have because it's, um, even though it would simplify this function a lot, uh, what we have now is um, a light, it is less CPU intensive because it has less objects being created. Okay, everything else that happens is already pretty simple. We do our compression. Um, we do our, solo check, then we do our, um, if it's soloed, here's which buffers get added, otherwise these are the buffers that get added. Um, let's clean that up. So we could refactor it, but we're not gonna really gain anything here. Instead, single line comments can be used to explain what is happening um, in case it isn't readable what's going on. But in my opinion, this is very readable, right? We're clearing the buffer, we're figuring out if a band is soloed, and then we're using whether or not a band is soloed to add stuff to um, our input buffer. Okay, so let's just run and test this to make sure. And it should be all good, but let's just make sure. Okay. Right, that still works. That still works. Still works. All right, cool. And solo still works. All right, sounds good to me. This concludes the uh, DSP portion of this uh, simple multiband compressor. Um, in project 12, we tackle how to dynamically change the number of bands. So you can have six bands, two bands, three bands, up to eight bands if you um, if you need that much. 
Um, along with uh, how to do a bunch of other stuff like a draggable GUI for adjusting the crossovers and adjusting the thresholds and whatnot. Okay, so we can move on to developing the GUI and making it as simple and as intuitive to use because this will never fly in front of the customers. The customers will look at this and say, uh, I don't know what, I don't know how to use this. I don't know, yeah, this is, I will not give you my hard earned cash if this is the GUI that I'm working with. All right, let's work on that next. Good times. Save, quit, let's make a commit. Added IO gain, cleaned up DSP. Here's where we, um, let's see, checked off these things. Here's where we added our input gain uh, strings. Here's where we added helper functions and parameters. Here's where we set up our parameters. Here's where we prepared our DSP processors. Here's where we did some cleanup. Here's more cleanup here, uh, more cleanup there, and more cleanup here. And here's where we added those parameters. Let's see, that goes there. Here's where we added the parameters, and here's where we refactored um, the threshold parameter. Okay, excellent. Onward to the GUI. All right, the DSP is done. Let's get rid of the old roadmap. Let's sketch out the roadmap for the GUI. All right, first thing that we're gonna do is the global controls. Let's add this in here, well, GUI roadmap. All right, number one, global controls. These are the X over, X over sliders and the gain sliders, okay? These are gonna go in the middle of the display. Um, input gain on the left, output gain on the right, crossover controls in the middle. Okay, next. We're gonna have the main band controls. These are gonna be the attack, release, threshold, ratio sliders. All right, these are gonna go below the global controls. And these controls will be assigned to the mid band first. All right, next, we're going to add solo mute bypass buttons. Um, again, these are gonna be assigned to the mid band first, and these are gonna be on the right side of the main band controls component. Okay, number four, band select functionality. This is also known as resettable parameter attachments. This band select functionality will allow us to have one set of controls for all of the bands. And it will also give us some buttons to switch which band is currently being controlled by the sliders and the solo mute bypass buttons, okay? We will be using the band controls, so we will need to have a mechanism to change which parameter a control is assigned to. It's a pretty cool system to implement. Um, it's not, not the simplest thing, but it's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting problem to solve. Okay, next, five. Band select buttons reflect the solo mute bypass state when we switch the bands. Now this is to give us some visual feedback when we click any of these, um, you know, low band, mid band, high band buttons, okay? We also need to implement the logic that um, prevents you from having both uh, the mute button and the solo button set at the same time, for example, because it doesn't make sense to be able to be muted and soloed at the same time, all right? So we're gonna deal with that. All right, next, number six. Um, custom look and feel for the rotary sliders and the toggle buttons. All right, so custom look and feel for sliders and toggle buttons. We will be modifying the look and feel that we developed from the Simple EQ tutorial. So if you don't have, um, if, you didn't, if you didn't do Simple EQ, um, you know, pause right now and go through that and then come back here so that way you have those files. I will also be including links to uh, the Simple EQ repository. So if you don't wanna go through it, you can just copy that code and um, you know, paste what you need, you know, copy the parts you need and paste it into this project. Let's see, number seven, spectrum analyzer overview. Spectrum analyzer overview. Okay, the spectrum analyzer in this project is slightly different than the one in Simple EQ. So I'm gonna go into detail about what is actually different. Number eight, um, data structures for spectrum analyzer, all right? We're gonna grab these from the Simple EQ tutorial. 
and then we're gonna you know modify them at some point number nine we are going to uh, let's see what are we doing here we are going to do FIFO usage in uh, plugin processor process block oh, I got weird capitalization going on number 10 uh, well sorry before we do that okay so for the FIFO usage in process block um, we need to do a little bit of DSP modification to make this happen correctly all right and then let's see number 10 is okay implementation of the analyzer rendering pre-computed paths again this is going to be taken from simple EQ the simple EQ analyzer took a decent chunk of time to develop in that course so there's nothing gained if I duplicate that same chunk of video in this video other than to make this video an hour and a half longer so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to include links to the relevant code and we will be copying what we need and reusing it. Okay, number 11, drawing crossovers on top of the analyzer plot. Okay, this is where we are going to customize the spectrum analyzer. Number 12, okay, drawing gain reduction on top of the analyzer. Drawing gain reduction on top of the analyzer. Again, this is the final customization and we will need to write a little bit of DSP code to make this happen. So we will be doing a little bit of work in plugin processor. Um, and then let's see the last one. Uh, let's see, analyzer bypass, analyzer bypass. Um, we're gonna use the same code that we used from simple EQ. And then number 14, let's see, we have a global bypass button, global bypass button all right and this is just something that every plugin should have because um, it's it just makes it really easy to uh, compare what your plugin is doing with um, if it's not processing anything okay that is wrapping up the GUI we have our roadmap so let's start coding up the very first item global controls if you get stuck or run into trouble while coding this or simple EQ just grab one of my free products from programmingformusicians.com and you can message me directly in the Slack workspace and I will help you directly. Now that we are tackling the editor, we can disable the generic editor and use our customized editor. Plugin processor.cpp, create editor, comment out this line, and there we go. All right, we wanna return our customized editor. Go to plugin editor.h. All right, the first thing we are going to do in the roadmap is tackle the global controls. I'm not sure what size I want my different GUI components to have right now, so I'm going to use placeholder components that will show me the sizes I've set. These are gonna be empty components that only draw a single color. So the good thing about this approach is that once I've dialed in the placeholder uh, positioning, when I finish developing the real component, the screen position is already locked in and I won't have to mess around with the positioning of uh, the component itself. Let's declare a placeholder component. We'll put this here at the top. Um, and this component is going to draw a single color and that single color is going to be defined when the component is constructed. And this, compo this color is going to be randomly generated, but it will never change once it's configured. So here we go, struct placeholder. Let's define our paint function first and we're going to fill the whole thing with this custom color and then the next thing we will do after this is to declare our custom color now that we have used it. Okay, let's declare our custom color next and we will initialize it in the constructor next. First we need to declare a constructor and because the autocomplete is not responding as quickly as I would like in this header file I'm going to define this constructor in the cpp file so let's go over to plugin editor.cpp next all right let's put this at the top all right let's start placeholder i'm going to use the juice random class to generate some integers that will populate the rgb values of our custom color okay cool Let's give ourselves some placeholder components and position them on the screen next. Head over to the editor class declaration and add some placeholders. Plug in editor.h down here at the bottom. The editor will be split into four sections. At the very top will feature the analyzer bypass buttons and the global band bypass button. 
Below that will be the spectrum analyzer with the part that shows the threshold as well as the gain reduction. Then below that are the global controls. And then finally, we will have the actual compressor band controls at the bottom. So let's declare four instances of the placeholder and give them appropriate names. All right, let's add these to our display in our editor's constructor. So head on over to plugineditor.cpp next. We need to add and make our child components visible if we want to be able to see them. Let's give ourselves a little bit more room and make our editor a little bit wider and a fair bit taller. I'm gonna go with 600 by 500. All right, let's go to resized. For the control bar at the top, I want to have the analyzer power button on the left and the compressor global bypass button on the right. So I'm gonna make these sit within a bounding box that is um, uh, 32 units tall. So first let me get the local bounds. And now I can get a 32 pixel tall rectangle that will form the bounds of our control bar by calling the rectangle remove from top function. This member function will remove a chunk from the top of the rectangle and give us that chunk that was removed as a separate rectangle. So I'm gonna use that here to give the control bar a bounds that is 32 pixels tall and the same width as our editor and is positioned at the top of the screen. Next, let's position the actual compressor band controls at the bottom of the screen. And I think I need something between 130 and 140 uh, units in terms of height, so let me try 135 first. And just like remove from top, I am going to use the rectangle remove from bottom function here, which behaves just like the remove from top, except the chunk is taken from the bottom of the rectangle. Let's dial in the analyzer bounds next. I know I want this to be taller than the band controls and the global controls in the center, so let me choose something between 200 and 250. All right, let's go right down the middle and use 225 and remove that from the top of the bounding box. Again, we are just removing chunks from the get local bounds rectangle and using those chunks as the bounding boxes for our child components. Okay, we removed a small sliver from the top, which was for the control bar. Then we removed a chunk from the bottom for the actual compressor band controls. And then we removed a large chunk from the analyzer and that leaves us with a rectangle that will be used for the actual global controls. Let's run and test this. I'm gonna to switch to the standalone editor and we can, find, we can fine tune these values after we see what it looks like this very first time. All right, this looks okay to me. This, is, um, this rectangle right here is gonna be the control bar at the top. Uh, this is going to be the band controls. Here's our global controls in the middle, and then this rectangle right here, this is the analyzer, okay? I'm happy with these placements. We have created placeholders for the main parts of this GUI, so now we can dial in custom components for the global controls. Let's make a quick commit, added placeholder components. Right. Um, also added GUI roadmap. All right, here's our roadmap, the graph. Here's where we change to the custom editor. Here's our placeholder and the usage. And here's our placeholder constructor, adding all of our child components and positioning them. All right, let's declare a global control component, plugin editor.h. Let's put this after the placeholder. I'm gonna start dialing in the graphics before I add sliders to it. And the reason is because I want to reuse the sliders that were used in Simple EQ and migrating those files over to this project will require a bit of code surgery, and I wanna do this simple task first. So let's declare the class first. And we just need to add a paint function for now. Okay, now we can replace our placeholder with an instance of this global controls. Let's flush out the paint function, this one that we've got right here. Head to the CPP file. Let's put this after our placeholder paint function. Let's put this after our placeholder uh, constructor. Okay, let's flush this out. I want to draw a border around the component, but I also want to have a gap between this component and the others. So I'm gonna use the draw order to handle this since I don't want to have to mess with the component bounds again in the editor's resized function. So the first things first, let's fill the component with our border color. 
Uh, I'm going to be using the juice namespace in here a lot, so let me just do the using namespace trick. If we're going to fill our component bounds, let's get them first. All right, and I'm going to use uh, a blue violet color for right now. Next, let's reduce our bounding box a little bit and fill a rounded rectangle with all black. There we go, we reduced, we set the color to black, and then we filled a rounded rectangle. Let's take a look at this, just run it real quick. Let's see what this looks like. It's kind of hard to tell because this is a similar color. Okay, to make this easier, let's hide some of our placeholders. Go to plugin editor.cpp, go to the uh, editor constructor, and let's just see the uh, global controls. So comment out the control bar, the analyzer, and the band controls. All right, let's run it again. All right, let's get rid of this and we'll fill it with all black. Go down to this paint function. So we're, we will comment all of this out and do g.fill all, fill it with all black. Now let's run it again. Okay, great. Let's add this little gap that I was talking about next. I wanted to have a little bit of a gap between each of these widgets. Right, go back to global controls paint. Okay, so I want to draw a black border around the entire bounds of this component. And since I'm reducing bounds here, I need to make a copy of this before I reduce it. Um, I need to do this before I do the reduction. All right, now I can reduce like I'm doing here. Now I can draw this black border. So I will give myself a small gap between this component and the surrounding ones without messing with the resized function. Now for what it's worth, I could have accomplished a similar result if I do g.drawRect. I could have achieved a similar result by using a juice path and adding a rounded rectangle to it and then calling g.strokePath, but that would have given me rounded corners on the outside in addition to the inside. So this way I end up with a square, uh, end up with square outer corners and rounded inner corners. And I like the way this looks a little bit better, personally speaking. Let's take a look. All right, so you can see there's a, a little bit of a gap between this and the right edge of the component and between the purple line and the left edge. I think this looks really clean, you know, this nice little gap. And there's gonna be a little bit of a gap between each of the components. I want to use this border effect in the compressor band controls and with the spectrum analyzer, but I'm gonna wait to refactor this paint stuff until it's actually time for that. The next step is to grab the look and feel and rotary sliders from simple EQ and get our global controls functioning. So let's just, we'll close this for now and we'll figure out how to do that stuff next. Let's make a commit. Added global control graphics. Okay. I want to reuse the rotary sliders from Simple EQ in this project. These sliders depend on the custom look and feel class that we developed in the Simple EQ project. And the easiest thing to do is to copy the classes from that project and just add them here. Now, if you did not complete Simple EQ, Visit the repository linked below. The classes will be in the plugin editor.h and cpp. So we're going to copy the declarations for the look and feel class and the rotary slider with labels class. Let's paste them above our placeholder components. So let's go grab simple EQ. We can grab it from here, matcap music, simple EQ. We can go to our source, plugin editor.h, and we are looking for look and feel. All right, here's our look and feel. So we need the look and feel as well as the rotary slider with labels class. This guy right here and this guy right here. Copy these guys and you can clone it if you want and grab it that way. Um, go to your plugin editor and put it below, no, put it above our placeholder components. Okay, now we need to grab the relevant implementations. You draw a rotary slider, draw a toggle button, all of this stuff. So go back to the um, source on GitHub, go to the CPP file, plug in editor, and we are looking for the look and feel draw rotary slider, the next look and feel class, and then rotary slider with labels paint and any other rotary slider with label functions. All right, there's a few of them. Plug in editor.cpp, let's put these at the top. Put those right there. I'm gonna put this line between myself and between these classes and the placeholder just so I can tell them apart. 
All right, once it is pasted, we have a few error messages to deal with. Let's find out where those are. Do a quick build and it should show them to us. Unknown type name power button. All right, let's deal with these two type errors. I want to have a global bypass button in this project and I want to use the power button graphics from Simple EQ for it. So the easy thing to do is to grab the power button class from Simple EQ and that is found in the editor.h. So go back to the uh, source code on GitHub, or if you have the project, grab it from there. Plug in editor.h and look for power button. All right, paste that, grab the power button, and paste that before the placeholder, before the placeholder, after the rotary slider with labels class. Plug in editor.h after rotary slider with labels, before placeholder. What's the next error? Analyzer button. And I want to use that same button that we used in Simple EQ to toggle the spectrum analyzer on and off. So again, just copy the code for this class from the Simple EQ project. And we'll paste it after the power button class. So go over here. Here it is right here, right below power button, analyzer button. Copy that. And put this in plugin editor after power button and before placeholder. All right, now try to build it. All right, build succeeded. So with these errors out of the way, we can now add our global controls to the GUI now. All right, here is the plan for the global controls. Number one, add generic juice sliders, and then uh, do some refactoring because I'm pretty sure we're gonna reuse some code between the paint function and the resize function for determining the bounding box our sliders will sit inside. Then we will add parameter attachments. Then we will replace the sliders with our rotary slider with labels classes on the heap and start using look and feel. Then we're gonna dial in the colors for the sliders and the borders a bit. Then we're gonna add the range labels to the sliders. We're gonna add a title. That's the plan, okay? So let's dive in and add some generic sliders. We are going to need a constructor for adding them as child component. Where's our global controls class? Where is that? Global controls, okay, down here, all right. Constructor first. Right. We're going to need a resized function for positioning them. And then we will need some private slider instances. We have our input gain slider, our low mid crossover slider, our mid to high crossover slider, and then our output gain slider. All right, let's head to the CPP file next and then add them as child components. Plug in editor.cpp. Let's go after our placeholder constructor. Let's add some child components. All right, let's position them. Add a resized function after paint. I'm gonna use Flexbox for this. So first let's get our bounding box. Then let's make a setup for row positioning because we're arranging these in a row. Now, I don't want to write juice all over the place. So I'm gonna use my using namespace juice. Let's move this up. All right. Here we go, flexbox. All right, I've declared my flexbox. It's gonna be a row flexbox and I don't want anything to wrap around. Now we just need to add every slider with the same amount of flex. And then finally, we just perform the layout. All right, let's see what we get. Let's run this. Okay, those are not rotary sliders. We need to customize the type to be rotary. All right, instead of doing this for every single slider, Let's declare a rotary slider class and make it inherit from slider. And then we'll just set it up so that way it is it has the rotary style with no text box. All right, let's do this after, let's do this right up here, app, um, right before our global controls. All right, let's initialize the base class. Rotary slider inherits from juice slider and it uses the rotary horizontal vertical drag slider with no text box. Let's change the type from juice slider here to rotary slider. All right, and let's test it out. Go ahead and run it, let's see what we get. All right, much better. Okay, let's add attachments next, and then we will replace these with our rotary slider with labels that we created from Simple EQ. All right, let's declare one attachment per slider. Let's see, where am I right now? Global controls, we're down here. All right. I'm going to allocate these on the heap so that way I can optimize a bit in the constructor. I will explain when we get to that stage. 
For now, let's just declare a unique pointer to the attachment and create one attachment per slider. Okay, one attachment per slider. Now, if we are using attachments, we need the APVTS to look up the parameters. So let's modify this constructor. And let's change now how we initialize our global controls. We need the audio processor dot APVTS. That's why we made that thing public. That's why it's a public member variable way down here. All right, let's change our constructor, plugin editor.cpp, go to the global controls, go up to this constructor, juice AP processor value true state, APVTS. Okay, now all of these attachments are unique pointer, which means we have to call std make unique to create them. Now the slider attachment constructor wants three different parameters. Number one, the APVTS, number two, the parameter name, and number three, the slider to attach to. The first thing that we need is our parameter map so we can look up the names. So let's do that before we start adding these things as child components. The next thing that we will be writing a lot is attachment equals make unique attachment and then the three things. And that sure seems like an opportunity for not repeating myself by writing a free function. Now I'm too lazy to look up the type names, so I'm gonna use the templated function instead and let the compiler figure out the type names. So let's head over to the header file. We're gonna write a function called make attachment. Let's, we're gonna put this after our rotary slider. It's gonna go right here. Okay, let's start by writing a function with no parameters. Now in the body, we will call the actual make unique call using generic names in our parameter map. So let's do void make attachment. And here we're gonna do attachment equals std make unique. It's gonna be an attachment. And let's see, what do we say? The first argument that is needed is the APVTS. Second argument is the parameter name, which we get from our map. And then the third argument is the slider itself, okay? Now that we've got this, we can dial in the um, parameter list, and then we can use template parameters for the five variables that are used in this function. This is variable one, two, three, four, and five, and then there's this thing right here. So the first argument is uh, the unique pointer itself, std unique pointer of type attachment. All right. Next, we have the parameter name. Let's see, well, I guess next is actually the APVTS, but um, we'll just do these in this order. Yeah, we'll do APVTS next, APVTS. All right, then we've got our, par our parameters map. That's this thing here. So params, params. Then we've got the name, param name, name. Let's make those guys const. And then finally, we've got our slider, slider type slider. Okay, now we can just add um, template parameters for each of these. Template, go like that. And now we can do type name, name attachment, type name APVTS, type name params, type name param name, and then type name slider type. Okay, great. So again, what we did here to figure this out was we just made an empty function with no arguments. We implemented what we were gonna call and then we said, all right, what gets used? Let's add parameters for all of that stuff that gets used. And then let's just, you know, use template parameters for that. And then we can use um, the compiler feature um, template type name deduction when we call this function. We'll just, you know, pass it all the stuff it needs and the compiler will figure out all the types and. It should all just work just like magic. With this helper function in place, let's go back to our CPP file. And now we can write a lambda that lets us DRY calling that make attachment stuff with five parameters. Instead, we can just call it with three parameters. So that's DRY for the win. All right, here we go. Auto make attachment helper equals lambda, lambda, lambda. Now we just need to call make attachment. All right, so we just need to pass in our attachment. We need to pass in the, uh, let's see. We're gonna be using the params, so we need to capture those. 
Let's capture those by reference. We're going to capture the APBTS, and then everything else is uh, passed by passed as constructor arguments. Okay, so here's our APBTS. Here's our params. Our param name is something we can pass in here, and we also need to pass in our slido. So let's do auto attachment. This should be lowercase. And then let's do um, const auto name and let's see, auto slider. All right, so we can just do name and then slider. So this is a very similar idea to what we did in the constructor for the audio processor where we made a lambda to basically DRY a bunch of um, code that initialized parameters. Okay, next step is to call our attachment helper for each of those three, um, each of the attachments for the sliders. So make attachment helper. Our first attachment is the in gain slider attachment. And for this, we want names gain in, and we're attaching this to the in gain slider. All right, let's do it again for the low mid crossover. Low mid attachment, names low mid crossover, and then the low mid slider. Make attachment. We're doing mid high now. Mid high attachment. Whoops, not make attachment. Attachment helper. That's the one. All right, so mid high attachment. Names mid high and then the mid high slider. Last one is the output slider. Make attachment helper. This is the out gain attachment names out gain and then name um let's see this is the out gain slider all right cool let's build and test now if we run and tweak some knobs then quit and rerun the sliders should return to the same position that we left them in all right so this is input gain so i'm going to turn this all the way down and we will quit and rerun Perfect. All right. Double click to reset. Okay. Our compressors are not connected to any GUI controls, but the input gain and output gain parameters are. So let's switch to testing with the APH to make sure the gain controls actually adjust audio levels, um, which they should since, you know, we just saw it be attached to the parameters, but you know, there's nothing wrong with testing. Okay. Switch to the VST audio plugin host and let's run this. All right. Let's run some audio. Grab your headphones. Turn down that input. All right. Perfect. Okay, we can switch these sliders out with our rotary slider with labels next. So let's go over here. Let's make a quick commit. As well, save, quit, commit. And we want to say that we added, um, not simply key, we want to say that we connected up. What do we do? We add connected. Let's see. Let's do two commits here. So first, number one is added LNF and rotary slider with labels from simple EQ. That's this stuff here. Stage this, stage this. And that's these guys. And then that's also this stuff here. Here's our look and feel. That's the look and feel stuff. This is all rotary slider with labels, stage U. Okay, cool, so that's adding the look and feel and rotary slider with labels from Simple EQ. Now, what did we do next? Next we did, um, let's see, we added um, sliders to global, global controls. And then we also wired up the attachments. There's our global control constructor. There's where we laid them all out with Flexbox. Okay, great. Next, let's connect them to the rotary slider with labels. All right, go to plugin editor.h. Let's switch these sliders out, the rotary sliders, um, with our rotary slider with labels class. Now this RSWL class has constructor parameters, specifically it wants an audio parameter first. Now we have this parameter names map right here. 
um, in our constructor with the attachments. So I'm going to put these sliders on the heap. And this is going to let this will allow me to initialize them um, inside this constructor so I can reuse this map. Okay, if I didn't do that, then I would have to use uh, this params um, dot get params at uh, for each of these um, sliders. And that would be super annoying. It would also be really verbose. Okay, so that's why I'm not going to do that. So let's put these on the heap. Let's get rid of these guys right here. Let's change this to be std unique pointer rswl and do using rswl equals rotary slider with labels. All right, even though we're not using this anymore, I'm just going to leave it leave it as is. Okay, let's build this real quick and tackle some of these errors that are going to appear. All right, number one, um, these need to be dereferenced because they are all a pointer. So hold down option, drag to select all the lines and add the star to dereference. Let's do the same thing in resized. Okay, now we can initialize these. So let's do in gain slider equals std make unique rs. Oh, that's not going to show us the full name. So show me the full name. Rotary slider with labels. All right. Okay, we can fill in our suffix before we start dealing with our the thing that gets the ranged audio parameter. So let's see. For the uh, in gain, we want to use decibels. So we need to look up a parameter from the APVTS. So let's write another helper function that's templated that'll do that for us. Let's do the same thing. Go over to the header file. We'll do the same thing that we did, like we did with make attachment. We'll just do it with um, you know get the parameter. So we'll start by calling functions on the objects that we haven't declared. So let's first get a function. We'll just do void get param like this. And then what we need to do is get our parameter from the APVTS using our map. Auto param equals APVTS dot get parameter params dot at um, name or position. We'll do name. This function returns a pointer, so let's make sure it's not null. J assert param is not null pointer. Okay, now the, let's see, what, what does this want here? This wants a reference. Let's dereference the parameter that we looked up. So let's go return param. Okay, this J assert right here will fire if our parameter is not found, but that should never happen because we are using our map to provide the names and also to create the parameters. All right, now we can start filling in function parameters. We need our map, we need our APVTS, and we need our name. Okay, so let's do, um, let's see, APVTS, APVTS. We need our params, so params, params, and then our uh, name, so name, name. And this should be const reference, and this should also be const reference. Now we just need to template it. Template type name APVTS type name params, type name name. All right, now we can call it. Plug in editor.cpp. All right, and let's add a helper function just like we did here. Our make, um, our get params function needs three parameters and three of those parameters, or sorry, two of those parameters are the params map and our APVTS. Yeah, we can use a helper lambda to make it so we only need to pass in the name. So let's do that auto get param helper equals lambda 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 and let's grab our params and our apvts by reference and now we just need our name const auto name we need to explicitly specify that this thing is going to return by reference so let's do that and now we can call our function super simple all right cool now we can fill in this placeholder with our lambda get param helper and here we want names in gain gain in and then finally we can replace our alias our uh, rotary slider with labels with our alias r s w l cool that's clean all right now we just need to initialize these let's do the rest of them in gain slider let's see there's the in gain slider all right this is going to be the low mid crossover slider this is the mid high crossover slider and this is the out gain slider all right this was low mid this was mid high 
and this was uh, gain out. And let's see, this is in hertz and in hertz. Let's build that, figure out if it's going to continue to give us errors or not. Oh, you know what? Of course, I forgot to change this return type here. Void, void uh, function get param should not return a value, but it is returning a juice ranged audio parameter reference. All right, that's important. That could have bogged us up for a while. All right, let's try it again. Build, that should solve all the errors. All right, what's wrong with this one here? Oh, you know what? It's because these need to be dereferenced because this is a unique pointer now. So dereference that because it wants the actual object like that. All right, let's try building it again. Voila, magic. All right, let's run this and see what we get. All right, awesome. Those look nice and clean. They display the value. Good times. I'm very happy with that. Okay, the problem is that they are smashed up to the top of this component. So let's dial in this positioning next. And we can also switch to using the standalone. Okay, go to the resized function. Now let's shrink our bounding box a little bit. Just, just enough. I'm going to go with 5. Reduced 5. All right, I want to add some spacers between the sliders and also at either end of the row. So let's make some instances of the flex item class that will do that for us. All right, spacers are going to go in between the sliders and then end caps will go on the very ends. This is just to kind of nudge everything in towards the center a bit. Let's make the end cap a little bit bigger. Okay, we need an end cap at the beginning and the end of the items array and then spacers in between each item. All right, here's my end cap and then a spacer between each item. Let's test it out. All right, cool. So there's a bit more of a gap here, a bit more of a gap here, and then the gap in between is also a bit... Um, it has made these a little bit smaller. And notice there's a little bit of a gap at the top too, which is great. All right, let's tweak these colors next. All right, actually, I want to add labels to the sliders next, and I want to revise how this was accomplished in Simple EQ. So let's take a quick look at what was done in that project. So if I go to the Simple EQ constructor, um, let's see, which class? You can go to any of these classes. We'll just look for dot labels. Okay, here we go. In Simple EQ, I was hard coding these ranges. Okay, now what I would like to do is actually extract them from the audio parameter for this project. In this one, I only care about the minimum and the maximum value of the parameter. So let's write a helper function that can populate the labels array of our sliders. And all we need to do is just give it the parameter um, for the range and the suffix. So it's time for some more template magic. Let's declare a function and pass in our labels, the parameter and the suffix, and um, we'll get, it's just, it's going to populate this labels array with the good stuff from the parameter. Let's go to our header file, plugin editor.h. Let's go after get param. Now let's see, we're going to modify the labels object and we're going to modify labels, but everything else can be const reference. All right, the first thing we want to do is first declare this function void add label pairs. Labels, this is what our labels are. All right, everything else is const, so we've got our const param type param, and then we have our suffix type. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is clear whatever labels are in the array. So labels.clear. All right, so let's just add the first thing, labels.add. Um, let's take a quick look at what was done here. All right, it was, uh, we used curly brace because it's this position object. We can take a look over here. Let's see. It's in the middle of this class. All right. First object is position. Second object is a string. All right. Labels.add. Curly brace. First object is a string. No, first object is the percentage, 0.f. And the second object is um, the string. Okay. Um, and actually, let's add some template parameters for now. We just need three. Let's just copy and paste this and do labels, param type, suffix type. Perfect. All right, we know that we need to return a string right here. Um, so let's create a function called get val string. 
and it's going to return juice string get val string. Okay, we know we need to pull our value to display from the parameter, so let's make that a function argument, one of these things. Next, we are going to only display the minimum and maximum values, so let's add a Boolean flag to the parameter list, and this flag will indicate if we should use the low end of the parameter range or the high end of the parameter range. Bool get low. Um, the thought behind this comes from where we declared all of our parameters create parameter layout. Um, we always declared, you know, minimum, the range start and the range end, and then it was always um, step size and skew. Um, but, it, you know, this is like the low end of the range and this is the high end of the range. And that applied for every normalizable range that we created, negative 60, positive 12, five and 500. Um, was there any others? No, there's not. Okay, so that's where that comes from. All right, plugin editor.h, that's where this get low flag is coming from, the idea behind that, okay? Finally, we need to append our suffix. So let's make that be the last function parameter. Now, if this was a templated function, we could define it here, but we know all the types, so let's uh, just declare it here and define it in the CPV file to the top. Um, well, we'll define it in just a second. Let's use it first, though. All right, go down here and then replace this quoted stuff with a call to it. Get val string. All right, now we can pass in our param. We can pass in our suffix. Yes, we want to do true because we want the low parameter at the 0%. And then we can repeat for the 100% position. 1.f, and this should be false. We do not want the low. We do not want the low param. We want the, um, yeah, we want the end per value. Okay, let's go implement this uh, get val string next. Go to plugin editor.cpp. Way up at the top. Let's put this up here. All right, juice string get val string. Are you gonna autocomplete for me? No, all right, let's copy it over from the header file. Copy, paste, remove that semicolon, add curly braces. All right, we need our string, juice string, str. Let's return it next, return str. All right, let's get our parameters minimum and maximum value from the parameters range. Auto val equals get low, param dot get normalizable range dot start, or param dot get normalizable range end. Okay, that's part of the puzzle. Let's add our suffix, str suffix. Now, something that I really liked from the rotary slider with labels class was that um, the k that got appended to the little, the letter k that is appended um, to the suffix whenever a parameter's value was 1000 or higher. So let's refactor that into a function that we can use here and in rotary slider with labels and in look and feel. So I'm going to, let's see, where does that happen? Let's take a look at that logic real quick. That's right here. If the value is over 999 um, divided by 1,000, and then we're going to add the K. And then it's like, if we have to add K, then um, we just stick a K on there before we add this suffix. Right, very simple. All right, so I'm going to just add a function at the top. I'm going to call it truncate kilo value. Let's see, um, let's do void for right now. Truncate kilo, kilo, geez louise, value. And let's see, I'm not sure what type I'm going to use, so I'm going to do that. Let's template this. I'm declaring it here in the CPP file because this is the only place it will get used currently. All right, here's the logic. If the value is over 999 divided by 1000. Okay. We're passing in by reference because we're going to actually modify this thing. And then, um, let's see, if we did perform a truncation, let's return true. And if we didn't, let's return false. So if value is greater than 999, let's cast this 999 to whatever type T is. All right, if it's over 999, value equals static cast T1000. 
return true, return false. All right, so if it's over 999 divided by 1,000 and return true, meaning yes, we did perform a truncation. All right, let's go use it. All right, so we can do bool use k equals truncate, truncate kilo value, kilo value, value. All right, and then um, let's see. Don't forget this function is going to modify this if we used if it performs truncation. So we can add our string now, str val. If we should use kilos, append it as well. If use k, str, the letter k. We can make use of this in that get display string function over here, get display string. It's a float param. Now, just looking at the rest of this function here, we could probably revise it to use our get val string function too, but that's not something that I want to do. I just want to replace this with our code. So I'm just going to comment this out and do add k equals truncate kilo value. All right, a little bit of a code surgery. All right, um, let's see. Let's go back to where we are creating our um, sliders. Because once we've or once we've made our let's go back to where we are making our attachments. It's under global controls constructor. Because after we make our attachments, we're going to add our labels. But let's do a quick build to make sure we don't have any template errors first. Make sure our truncate function works. All right, cool. All right, let's use our helper function. Let's do this right here. Add label pairs. So the first label is going to be the uh, let's see. I'm going to do the in gain slider labels and the param is going to be get param helper uh, let's see names in and the suffix type is going to be decibels all right let's do it for the next one let's put these on their own line add label pairs let's see we got the low mid crossover slider labels param is get param helper names low mid and this is Hertz. Again, add label pairs, mid high, get param helper, names, mid high, also Hertz. All right, last one is the output gain slider. Add label pairs, out gain slider labels, get param helper, names, output gain, whoops on the next line and decibels okay let's run this and we should see some labels next to our sliders let's see what we got oh build failed what happened no matching call for get val string uh, what did i do wrong oh my get param helper let's see what's the problem candidate function you want a reference parameter what is being passed I'm passing a const reference. Oh, that's why this should be const. And that's because that's because it's const right here. Okay. Am I going to run into a bunch of const issues? Let's see undefined symbol. Yes, because I made one const and the other not const. Okay, this needs to be const up here. Get val string this should be const. Right. Build completed. Build succeeded. Boom. All right, we've got our labels. Negative 24, positive 24, 20 hertz to 99, 1 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz. Perfect. And this shows 1K. Awesome. That's fantastic. All right, cool. Let's commit that. Very happy with that. Make our commit. Let's see. Added label pairs to sliders. Is that what we did? Um, oh no, we did uh, switched to RSWL and added label pairs to sliders. Perfect. All right, that was a lot. It, it's not a lot of code here in this commit, but in terms of like what we actually implemented, that's a lot of functionality. Okay. Okay, let's look at this constructor real quick. We are calling get param helper twice. We're doing it right here when we make our slider. 
And then we're doing it here again when we make our label pairs. So let's fix that. Let's cache our parameters here and then replace accordingly. That right here, so auto gain in param equals, okay. Let's replace accordingly. All right, and these ones down here. All right, cool, let's build and test to make sure everything is cool. All right, I'm gonna change that to negative six. Change you to negative six. Quit, rerun. All right, awesome. That works as expected. All right, let's add titles to our sliders. So we're gonna add a third constructor parameter and give it a value of no title. So let's go up to our um, rotary slider with labels class, plugin editor, get rid of this build target thing. Plugin editor, go to the ranged, uh, no, not ranged, rotary slider with labels. Um, we're gonna add a third constructor parameter to this. Let's see, where is that? That's right here. All right, we're gonna put this on its own line. And we're gonna give it a default value so everything still constructs, um, still builds without any errors. Const juice string title equals no title. All right, that's the first part. We will display the component's name in the paint function. So we'll call set name title. Now let's go to the paint function, plugin editor, rotor slider with labels paint. Wait, why does this say just? Oh, that's just, should, that should say juice. All right. Uh, paint function, right below where we get the slider bounds. Let's see, I want to draw this title at the top of the slider. So we need to modify the get slider bounds function to account for this. So let's draw our title first and then adjust the slider bounds next. First, let's get the local bounds. Auto bounds equals get local bounds. Next, let's set a color and draw some fitted text. I'm gonna go with blue violet and let's draw some fitted text. G dot draw fitted text. All right, I'm going to use the rectangle remove from top function to create the bounding box that the title text will be placed in. And I'm gonna use the get text height function plus a little bit more for this bounding box. First things first, the text we will display is the name. Get name, the area. Let's see, we're gonna be centered. Justification, centered, we'll do centered bottom. And we're on one line. All right, let me put these on separate lines. Uh, let's see, we're gonna do bounds dot remove from top. And the amount to remove is our text height plus a little bit. All right, let's see how that looks. Let's comment out this draw rotary slider stuff to begin with. All right, cool, no title, excellent. All right, let's uncomment this. Okay, so we need to dial in these slider bounds next. All right, go down to get slider bounds. Now we need to remove some space from the top of the local bounds. So let's do text height minus 1.5 and see how that looks. Let's see, what are we doing right now? Auto bounds is get local bounds and let's trim off the top. Bounds dot remove from top. Let's do get text height times 1.5. Let's see how that looks. All right, that's very small and it's still colliding with the title. So shrinking, let's see. So let's change the Y position of this rectangle to be the Y position of our bounds. Let's do, let's comment this out and do r.setY bounds.getY instead. Okay, cool. So it's not covering up the title now. That's good, that's progress. All right, let's adjust the, the uh, slider size by adjusting the size of this rectangle here. This thing right here. Now, shrinking the size by twice the text height is too much, so let's change this to be 1.5 and see what it looks like. Now, that's much better, okay? This is a much more reasonable size. Let's remove the default parameter next. Go back to plugin editor.h. Let's get rid of this default parameter and um, let's 
uh, build and add our titles where the error messages appear. Okay, in gain slider, you are going to say input trim in all caps. Low mid is going to be, uh, let's see, low mid x over like that. Let's do this one. This will be mid high, no gh, x over. And then this will be output trim, output trim. All right, let's take a look at this now that we've got our titles in here. Okay, that's fantastic. Now, I don't like this black square in the middle that's surrounding the numbers, uh, but we'll fix all of these colors later. All right, for now, that wraps up the global control. So that's fantastic. Let's take a look at that one more time. All right, awesome. Very cool. Let's make a commit of that. Added titles to RSWL. Bing, bang, boom. All right. So we adjusted that. Just that part, just that part. Here's where we actually added the titles. We can start working on the actual compressor band controls next. Let's create the compressor band controls next. Here's the roadmap for this component. This guy way down here, compressor band controls. Number one, we're gonna add sliders for the main compressor controls. Once that's done, we will add the solo mute and bypass buttons. Then we will add band selection functionality, meaning we're gonna change the parameters that the sliders are connected to um, whenever we click those buttons. Then we will dial in the colors before we add in the spectrum analyzer and drawing the thresholds and the gain reduction. All right, let's dive in. All right, we are going to reuse our, uh, where is that class? We're gonna reuse this rotary slider class for right now. Okay, let's put this, um, yeah, we're gonna put this after rotary slider. Oh, uh, let's put it after these functions. Let's put it above global controls. Okay, here we go. All right, we need four instances of um, the rotary slider class for our four compressor controls. Okay, attack slider, release slider, threshold slider, and ratio slider. You know what comes next, a constructor and a resized function. Let's implement those next. Head to the CPP file. Let's do this above our global controls uh, constructor. Compressor band controls, compressor band controls. Let's add all of these sliders as children. Is there anything in here that I can copy? Yeah, I'm gonna copy this. We have four sliders. Those are four sliders being added. All right, let's just delete this. All right, now we can add our sliders. And let's see, they all end in the word slider. So I'm gonna add that, and now I can fill them in. Tack slider, release slider, threshold slider, ratio slider. Now I am going to copy the global controls resized code to position these. I'm gonna move them later when we add the buttons, but this is just to get them on screen. So go to the compressor band, uh, sorry, go to the global controls resized function, and we're just gonna copy the whole thing. And then we're gonna paste it. Now we just need to change these names here. Um, attack slider. Oh, sorry, we need to change this name first to be uh, compressor band controls. All right, now we can do attack slider, release slider, threshold slider, and ratio slider. It's very convenient. All right, let's change our band controls in the editor to use our compressor band controls class next. Select this and copy it. Let's go back to the header file. Let's get rid of our placeholder in our editor. Get rid of band controls here. Whoops, that's the wrong key command. Get rid of band controls and get rid of this comma. And now add an instance here, band controls. All right, now we just need to make it visible again. So go to plugin editor.cpp, go to the plugin, uh, go to the editor constructor, and we're gonna make our band controls visible. Let's test it out. Make sure you're doing the standalone version. Let's see what we get. All right, awesome. 
our four sliders, very cool. So we'll turn them into these um, sliders with the labels and stuff in a little bit. All right, I want to add the same border that the global controls has to this compressor band controls component. So let's add a paint function. I'm just gonna copy this declaration, put it right below resized. Now we can literally just copy the global controls paint function and just rename the class and we'll get that. So go to plugin editor, go to global controls paint, literally copy this, paste it after the compressor band controls resized function and just change the class name. Compressor band controls, change it to like that. All right, let's run it and see what we get. All right, I am very happy with that. Remember I had said I wanted to have a border with a bit of a gap between the um, between these modules. All right, so that's very clean. Let's refactor it next because we are literally repeating the exact same code in those two paint functions. Let's refactor this module background paint code so we aren't repeating ourselves. I would like to declare a free function and it's going to be identical to what we are doing in paint except for the call to get local bounds. That's this thing right here. Instead, this rectangle bounds will be one of our parameters. So I'm going to just put that, um, where should I put that? I'm gonna put that, um, I'm gonna put that right above this paint function for, for right now, we'll move it later. Void draw module background, add an empty argument list. Now we're gonna copy these guts over. So grab this, copy, copy and paste this, and let's see. All right, first things first, we need a graphics context to draw into. Then we need that rectangle, bounce. All right, now that can let us remove this line. There we go. Okay, that takes care of that. Now we just need to comment out this old code here in our, um, let's see. Let's do global controls first. Let's comment it out down here. Let's get rid of this. And let's see, I am going to need uh, the bounding box. So we'll do uncomment that line and now do draw module background bounds. Set. Oh, we also need our graphics context, okay. Let's just uh, verify that this works. Let's run this real quick. All right, global controls is still cool, awesome. Let's do the exact same thing in global, uh, in compressor band controls. Copy that line, scroll on up here, comment all of this out and replace it like that. All right, perfect, looks good to me. Let's get our sliders connected to the parameters next. We will create attachments first and then we will change to rotary slider with labels. All right, let's clean this up. We don't need that. And we don't need this stuff. Let's get rid of this code. Okay, fantastic. All right, head over to your plugin editor.h, go to the global controls, and now copy these attachments from global controls. We're gonna copy them. We are going to paste them in our compressor band controls and rename them. Put them right below our sliders. Now we're gonna do attack slider attachment release slider attachment, threshold slider attachment, ratio slider attachment. Let me line these back up. Let's update this constructor next. All right, go to plugin editor.cpp, go to compressor band controls, the constructor. And let's see, what can we borrow? All right, we're gonna do the uh, same parameter initialization stuff that we did in uh, compressor band in global band control so we can grab these things copy this stuff and we'll fix these incorrect names in just a moment all right go up here to the constructor and paste all this stuff let's copy all of that code that initialized those attachments from uh, global controls so go down to global controls grab all of this stuff the make attachment helper we're gonna need that stuff too grab this code paste it here all right now we need to change all of these names um, but we'll fix that in just a moment. We need to copy the params declaration and update the constructor to receive an APBTS. So let's copy that stuff from the global controls constructor as well. Grab this thing right here, right? And paste that here as a constructor argument. Now let's update the declaration next. Copy this stuff right here. Go to plugin editor.h and modify this constructor. Oops, uh, this has an extra set of parentheses. There we go. Now we need to revise how our class gets constructed in our editor. So go down here 
and just copy these, um, copy how the global controls are initialized and just paste it here. Now we can fix all of these errors in our um, constructor here. All right, so first things first, we are doing the um, attack attachment, attack slider attachment, and this is the attack slider. And this name needs to be the attack. Let's do the, um, I think we said we were doing the, the mid band. Let's see what we did. Uh, yeah, we'll do, we'll do the middle band first, okay? So we'll change that, all right. So there's the attack. All right, now we need to do release, release slider, release slider attachment, and then this is the release mid band. All right, now we've got the uh, threshold, threshold attachment, threshold slider, and then threshold mid band. And then finally we have our ratio. So this is ratio attachment, ratio slider, and then ratio mid band. All right, when we add band switching functionality, we will be able to dynamically uh, switch these attachments, which will be a very cool thing. All right, let's test it out. We are going to drag a slider, quit and rerun, and the slider should display this updated position. Let's see what we get. Okay, I'm gonna do the uh, I'm gonna do the attack time. I'm gonna yeah, I'll do the attack time. I'm just gonna put it at 12 o'clock. Quit, rerun. The attack slider should be at 12 o'clock. All right, perfect. It is. Double click to reset to the default value. Awesome. Our next task is to change rotary sliders with labels so that it accepts a pointer to a parameter instead of a reference. The reason is because we will be dynamically changing the parameter in the compressor band controls class whenever we change which band is currently being displayed. So the other thing we will do is to move the look and feel to our editor. This way every child component inherits the look and feel of the parent class. Let's go to rotary slider with labels in the header file. Let's modify this constructor to take a pointer. Let's change this member initialization. Let's remove the look and feel member variable. Copy this and comment it out. Now, by removing the look and feel, we no longer need um, to set it here, and we also don't need, need this destructor. So that's cool. Now, let's see. Before we add a look and feel to the editor, let's add a member function, which will allow us to change the parameter whenever we want. Let's go put this here, right below get display string void change param and we'll give it a juice ranged audio parameter pointer like that all right now we can go all the way down to our editor and add a look and feel member make sure this is the first member variable that gets constructed let's go to our editor's constructor we want to set our look and feel right here set look oh let's do it before uh before we make these guys visible, set look and feel, LNF, make sure you're taking the address of it. And now we must remember to set it to null pointer when our component is destroyed. Here we go set look and feel, null pointer, oops, null pointer. Okay, now we can adjust where every RSWL is created since the constructor wants a pointer, not a reference. So let's build it and start fixing all of those errors. Command B to build. All right, where does this happen? Okay, so the only spot where we created these sliders is in the global controls function. So we just need to pass pointers instead of references. So we just need to add our ampersand in front of all of these, and let's test it out. That should clear all of the errors. All right, build succeeded. Let's test it out. Let's adjust the in-gain slider and see if it sticks. Whoa, look at these guys. All right, turn that down. I'll turn that down to 10. Quit, rerun, it should be at 10, 10.5, interesting. Let me do that one more time, 10. Okay, there it goes. All right, cool, that looks good to me. Now, let's see, I just wanna look at that one more time. Now, changing the look and feel um, and making the editor own the instance that all child components inherit from really messed up how these compressor band controls uh, end up looking. So let's fix that next. All right, go to compressor band controls in the header file. All right, this class is going to need access to the APVTS in order to look up parameters as needed. So let's add a reference to that. We can just copy this one 
right here from our global controls constructor. All right, next let's change all of these sliders here, the attack, release, threshold, and ratio sliders into rotary slider with labels. So grab this class right here and paste it there. All right, we will need to use the member initializer list to initialize all of these next. All right, go to plugin editor.cpp, go to the compressor band control constructor. Let's initialize all of these members. First things first, let's do the APVTS, APVTS, and I'm gonna rename this to be APV. Now let's do all of our sliders. Attack slider. All right, we're gonna start with null pointer, and our suffix is milliseconds, and our title is attack. Let's do the others, release slider, same thing, null pointer, MS, and release, oops, don't forget the quotes. Do the other two. All right, let's fix this error in the capture list. Now we need to do APVTS. Let's see, APVTS equals this APVTS, like that. All right, now we are capturing this class's instance of the AP, APVTS by reference, okay? All right, let's test this out. Oh, we need to um, adjust this make params helper. Oh, you know what? I don't know if we actually need this get param helper yet, so I'm going to comment that out. Might need that in a little bit. Sure. Okay, let's test this out. We'll see what happens. Maybe we will have sliders with titles. Who knows? Uh, what's going on here? Oh, this is because it doesn't have a parameter. All right, let's fix that. It's going back here. So it turns out we did need this. We need to get our parameters. And now we can call change param on all of our sliders. Let's do that right here. Attack slider dot change param get param helper. Let's see, this thing returns a reference, so we need to get the address of it. And the name we want is names attack midband. All right, let's do the others. We got our release slider. So I'm going to just copy this line. Whoops. Copy this line, paste, paste, paste release slider, threshold slider, ratio slider. All right, now this is release midband, threshold midband, ratio midband. Let's test this out, see what we get. An error. Undefined symbol. Yes, we did not implement this. We declared it, but did not implement it. So let's do that next. Let's go up to where our rotary slider with labels get display string is. We're going to put this at after it void rotary slider with labels and change param is the one we want. So whatever parameter we pass into this is um, what we need to give it. Um, let's see, so this becomes param equals p. And then once we get a new param, repaint. Let's try this out. All right, awesome. So these are almost fully functional. We just need to add labels next. All right, go back to the constructor. We can use the add label pairs function that we wrote for all of our sliders except the ratio slider. And the reason is because the ratio slider labels need to have a colon one at the end. So we need to define those manually. So let's start here, we'll do add label pairs. Our first labels are the attack slider dot labels. Parameter is the get param helper attack midband. We'll refactor this in a little bit. Those need to be cached. Does that want a reference? It does want a reference, we're giving it that. All right, and our suffix is going to be milliseconds, okay? Let's do the same thing for the release, paste, release slider, release midband, and then threshold, copy, paste, threshold slider, threshold, midband, and this needs to be decibels, db. So the first label for the ratio slider, the first ratio is one to one. So let's make a label position element. Let's add a curly brace for this for default initialization. All right, so at the 0% position, we want to see 1 colon 1. All right, now the second one should be the highest ratio uh, defined in the list of choices. So let's get our ratio param. Um, let's see, this is a juice audio parameter choice. And we want to call get param helper. We want our names, ratio, midband. All right, now we just need to get the last entry from this. 
let's add our line first. Um, why can we not? Why can we not use? Cannot converse from this to that. Um, oh, this returns a reference. That's right. We should take the address of the reference it returns. Okay, so now let's see. We want ratio slider dot labels dot add, and this is for the one hundred percent position. And now we are going to add. Um, let's see, ratio param choices, and we want the last one. How can we do that? We can do get reference, and then ratio param choices size minus one. Okay, let's see how that looks. So this is displaying 100.0, and we want it to say 100 colon 1. So we need to get the integer value of this string, and then turn that into a string, and then append the colon 1 to the end. All right, we can do that. We need to change this to be uh, choices get reference. I'm going to put this down here. All right, choices get reference. Give me the last one. All right, now you're going to give me the int value, and then... Um, let's see, I need to turn this into a string first. Put that in parentheses, juice string. And now I can append colon 1 to it. Let's see how that looks. There we go, 100 to 1. Perfect. Now let's make the center of the sliders display the current ratio next. So for this, we will need to derive from the rotary slider with labels and customize the get display string function. All right, head over to your header file, plug in editor.h, go to the, uh, what's the name of this class? Go to the rotary slider with labels class. All right, we are going to override this get display string function, so we need to make it virtual first. Virtual. And then we need to make these member variables protected instead of private, so the derived class can access them. Let's clean this up too while we are here. All right, let's declare a ratio slider class below this. Now this is a ratio slider, which means we can hard code the title whenever we are initializing the base class. We still need everything else though. So let's just copy all of this, paste it here, change this class name, and fix this indentation. All right, so all we need is the suffix, and the rest is for the base class. Rotary slider with labels, and put this on its own line. All right, we're passing it in our ranged audio parameter, our unit suffix, and then ratio. Perfect. Curly braces. All right, now we can implement the function that we care about, this guy right here. Get display string. Override. Let's implement it next. Let's go to the plugin editor.cpp. Go to the uh, change param function. We're going to put it right below that. All right, so let's start the implementation. This function returns a string. Okay, what we need to do here is get the name of the current choice. To do that, we need to convert the param into a choice parameter. So that's uh, step number one. Auto choice param equals dynamic cast. Juice audio parameter choice param. Let's make sure that we can cast it. Once we have our choice param, we can just get the current choice name. Now, if you remember, it displayed 100.0 when we used the choice name directly. This is because we declared our choices as doubles because I wanted 1.5 to be one of the choices. And everything else is an integer value, basically, which means it's going to end up with that 0, .0 at the end. So if the choice ends with 0, .0 just remove that from the string. If current choice dot contains 0, .0, get rid of it, current choice equals current choice dot substring. Our starting index is zero, and our end point is the index of that period, because the end index is not included in the substring. We go from our starting point up to, but not including, the end. Current choice dot index of. Okay, once we've done that, just stick the colon at the end. Current choice colon one. All right. And there's our display string. Let's test it out. Let's return it. Return current choice. Let's see what happens. Nothing. And that is because we forgot to change our ratio sliders type. Copy this ratio slider. Go to the header file. Go to the 
Um, where is this class? Go to the constructor, go to the compressor band controls class and change the ratio slider to be that ratio slider. All right, let's run this. We should see the ratio in the center. Nope, we, uh, what's wrong? Oh, we don't need this uh, third parameter, that's why. All right, let's fix that. All right, third time's the charm. Okay, cool. There we go, we're seeing our ratio in the middle. Let's cycle through them, see what we get. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 15, 20, 100. Perfect, and what happens when we get to 1.5? Is that a thing? Perfect. All right, let's make a commit of that. So implemented basic comp band controls. Perfect. Stage, stage. Let's add the solo, mute, and bypass buttons next. We will position them and then connect them to parameters. Go to the header file, go to our compressor band controls, and let's add these after our attachments. Juice toggle button is the weapon of choice here. Okay, bypass button, solo button, mute button. Let's set the name next. Go to the plugin, uh, go to the constructor, compressor band controls. Let's do this after we add our sliders. Bypass button, dot set name. We're gonna draw the name. The name is what will be drawn when we configure the look and feel. Bypass, we'll give it an X. Solo will have a big S in it and mute will have an M. Okay, let's add them next. I'm just gonna copy three of these. Paste, and now copy, paste. Copy, paste, copy, paste. Let's go to our resized function. Okay, this component will have band control buttons on the right and band select buttons on the left. So let's write a helper function to wrap this vertical arrangement um, of these buttons in a flexbox since, since we are using flexbox already for the sliders. So first we will pass in a vector of pointers to components. That'll look like this. STD vector component pointer comps. Then we'll declare a flexbox that we will be adding the buttons to but the column direction, we can just copy this. The column direction, or the direction will be column instead of row. That's the only change we're gonna make there. Number six, I want a small spacer between them, so I'm gonna copy this. Again, this is vertical, so we're gonna do with height. And I want it smaller than four, two pixels is fine. All right, now we just need to loop through our components, add a spacer before, and then add the component to the flexbox. For auto comp comps, flexbox.items.add, add the spacer first, then add the um, add the component. Add a flex item with a flex of one. Now our item list currently goes spacer component, spacer component, spacer component. So we need to add one more spacer at the end. Now we can return our flex box. All right, so this is going to be used for the buttons on the right, the bypass mute solo buttons, and then the band select buttons on the left. All right, now we can call it, we can call our Lambda like this with our band control buttons, with our, um, not band control buttons, with our, um, uh, yeah, band control buttons, that's right. Um, the bypass mute solo buttons. Auto band button control, correct capitalization. Auto band button control box equals create band, band button control box. And we need to provide a vector of our, uh, a vector with our components. We want the address of the bypass button, address of the solo button, and the address of the mute button. Okay, next. Let's get rid of this end cap for now, and we're gonna replace it with a spacer. And now let's add the band control button box on the right. Flexbox.items.add band control button box, band button control box, and let's give it a width. Uh, this needs to be wrapped in flex item. Declare a flex item. 
and let's give it a width. Uh, let's see, 30. I you know I usually enjoy buttons. And I like GUIs that have buttons around like the 20 to 30 size, so we'll start with 30. See what we get. Okay, we're not seeing them. Let's check the look and feel class next. All right, let's see. Go up to the look and feel draw toggle button. All right, if it's a power button, it's going to draw something. If it's an analyzer button, it's going to do something else. Okay, it doesn't do anything if it's neither of those. So let's add an else clause. Pretty silly error. Okay, let's draw a rounded rectangle with the component name in the middle. All right, if the button is on, we're going to draw black text on a white background. Otherwise, draw white text on a black background. We'll dial in these colors later. First, let's get our uh, bounding box. Auto bounds equals toggle button dot get local bounds. And let's shrink it a little bit. All right, if the button is on, um, it would be nice to know. All right, let's give ourselves a corner size because remember we're doing rounded rectangle. All right, let's fill a rounded rectangle with the background color first. G dot set color. If the button is on. We're going to do white, otherwise we're doing black. And now let's fill our rectangle. And then invert the colors and draw a rounded rect followed by the text. So G dot, let's just copy this line. Invert the colors. So if it's, we're going to do black first and then white, depending on if the button is on or off. Now let's draw a rounded rectangle. G dot draw rounded rectangle. Our corner size is going to be corner size. Our line thickness will be one, and our rectangle will be bounds dot two float. All right. Now let's draw our text. G dot draw fitted text. We're going to draw the uh, button get name. We're going to draw it in bounds. We're going to be centered, and we're going to occupy one line of text. All right. Let's test it out. Boom. All right, got some toggle buttons. Fantastic. All right, let's connect them to parameters next. Okay, go to plugin editor.h, go to the bottom of compressor band controls, and let's add some attachments. Uh, I'm just gonna copy this code. We only need three of these. We're using a different attachment. We're using button attachment, and we cannot use an alias without redeclaring one. So let's do BTN attachment like that. Indent, 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 indent. We don't need, uh, we only need three of these. So we'll do bypass button attachment, solo button attachment, mute button attachment. And let's indent these so they all line up nicely. Okay. And now head over to the constructor. We want compressor band controls. And let's use our attachment helper to initialize them. Make attachment helper. And our attachment is going to be, let's see, we'll start with bypass button. Oops, bypass button attachment. Our name is names. Um, we were doing mid band, right? Bypass mid band. Our slider is the bypass button. I'm glad we templated that class because it means we can use it with any component, not just, um, not just sliders. All right, let's do this again. So I'm just going to copy and paste this and rename stuff. All right, so we've got bypass, we've got solo attach, um, we've got mute attach. Let's see, this was solo button, this was the mute button, solo mid, and mute mid. Okay, let's test it out. That was very quick. All right, let's let's see. Um, let's um. Let's close this. This will be bypassed. Close that. Rerun. All right, bypass is still working. All right, let's go test this out in Audio Plugin Host. And we adjust the sliders and the solo bypass buttons and see if we hear any differences. All right, here we go. Oh, headphones. All right, they're soloing the midband. And we can adjust all this stuff. That is definitely working. Mute that band. Seeing it dipped out, very cool.
Let's give it a real quick release time. That is definitely working. All right. Bypass that. Turn that off. Stop. Save. Quit. All right, we're getting there. Okay, all of these are working. The next step is to add buttons that let us select which band the sliders are actually controlling. Let's do that next. All right, let's add three buttons to allow switching of the bands. Go to the header file and just put them at the end of the list. Low band, mid band, high band. Let's go to the uh, constructor and set their name. Where's the brand? It's going to duplicate this. I'm going to put this after the attachment stuff. This is low band, mid band, high band. Low, mid, high. Okay, these buttons need to be grouped together so that when you click on one, the others toggle off. That's what the radio group ID is for. So low band dot set radio group ID. Just set them all to one. Right, we'll do low band. Mid band, high band. These are all part of the same radio group. Let's make them visible. We will position them next. Paste, and now copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Okay, let's add another flex box. Go to the resized function. We've got our band button control box. Let's add another one for the select buttons. Auto band select control box equals create band button. All right, let's add our vector, our three buttons. Low band first, mid band next, high band last. All right, let's get rid of the end cap. Let's replace it with a spacer. And now add the band select box on the left. Flex box items, add flex item, You're, you are going to control the band select control box with flex of one. And we're gonna need one spacer after this. Let's see, uh, I'm not gonna do it with, with, with this flex, actually, I'm gonna do it with a fixed width. Um, let's see, okay, so the band control box had a width of 30, um, and that was displaying a single character of text. So I know that this needs to be wider because it's displaying, you know, three or four characters. So let's try 50. And we need a spacer after it as well. All right, let's take a look. All right, those look nice. Like that. That looks good. It's nice, um, nice positioning of everything. So I'm happy with that. So let's save this, quit this. Those buttons don't do anything, but we will fix that in a bit. For now, let's make a commit of what we've done. What did we do? We added um, added control buttons to um, band control. What is this thing called? Compressor band control class. Compressor band controls. That's what we did. Stage, stage that. Um, let's see, here's where we customize the look and feel. Here's where we added all of our buttons. Here's where we added them to the flex box. Stage, 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 commit. All right, awesome. If you get stuck or run into trouble while coding this or Simple EQ, just grab one of my free products from programmingformusicians.com and you can message me directly in the Slack workspace and I will help you directly. Let's make these band switcher buttons work. Whenever we click on one of these buttons, we will simply reset the slider and the button attachments and recreate the attachments. Okay, the tricky part is figuring out which button was clicked. Now we're going to be doing all of this stuff before we make our buttons visible. So first, let's define a lambda that will be called whenever each button is clicked. Let's capture a safe pointer that is alive for as long as this class exists. All right, we're going to just speak some stuff into existence. All right, we're going to do this after we set our radio group and before we set everything visible. All right, here we go. Let's make a let's make this lambda. All right, we have uh, declared that a safe pointer member variable exists, so let's um, let's go make one. Okay, go to the 
plugin editor.h. At the bottom of the compressor band control, let's add one here. Juice component safe pointer. Come on, autocomplete. There it is. All right, and it is a compressor band controls, and it is an instance created from this, and it's called safe pointer. And initialization requires curly braces. Okay, all right, go back to that constructor. Okay, well, let's do a quick build to clear that error. Okay, if our safe pointers component is valid, let's call a function that updates the attachments. If auto. All right, if the safe pointer component exists, let's call a function on it. All right, I'm going to uh, just call a function that doesn't exist yet, but it will. Update attachments, okay? It doesn't exist yet, but it will. Let's go declare it next. Plug in editor, go to the bottom of this. Put it right here, void update attachments. All right, we've got our declaration in place. Let's go implement this after we finish doing what we need to do in the constructor. So go back to the constructor because we're not done there. We can do a quick build to clear that error. All right, we've got this lambda, so let's assign it to the onClick member function. Why is that still giving? In it? Oh, there it goes. Error is gone because it says build succeeded. So that's just Xcode has just taken a while to catch up. All right, here we go. Low band dot onClick equals button switcher. Do the same thing for the other three bands: low band, mid band, high band. Oh, sorry, don't no parentheses. All right, we want low band, mid band, high band. Okay, whenever one of those buttons is clicked, it is going to call this function. Now, before we implement update attachments, let's make the low band the default band choice by setting the toggle state to true. And then we can call our attachment updater function, which will connect all of the attachments to the appropriate sliders. So first set the toggle state to true, low band dot set toggle state true and we do not want to send a notification the reason is because sending a notification will trigger this lambda and we don't want that to happen don't use notification type don't send notification all right let's call update attachments update attachments now we can go implement the update attachments function all right, let's start this after the paint function right here. Void compressor band controls, update attachments. Okay, there are a few problems we need to solve in this function. Number one, we have to figure out which button was clicked. Now we can do this by checking the toggle state of all of our buttons. They are part of a radio group, which means only one button can be toggled on at a time. Problem number two, we have to figure out which parameters go with which buttons. And number three, we have to create the parameters like we did in the constructor. So first things first, let's figure out which button is clicked. I don't want to use integers for this, so I'm going to declare an enumeration and declare a variable that uses that enumeration as the type. Then I'm going to immediately invoke a lambda that will de determine that variable's value. So first things first, here is the enumeration. Scroll a little bit. And here is the immediately invoked lambda. All right, this logic is very simple. If it's the low band, we're gonna return low band type. If it's the mid band, we return the mid band type. If it's high band, well then the only thing that's left if it's not low or mid is high. Okay, very simple. All right, next, the plan here is to use a switch statement that works off of whichever button was clicked to populate a vector that contains the names from our param names enum that we can use to look up the parameters. Once we have that vector, we can easily figure out which parameter to use with each attachment. We have our band type from this lambda. Now we simply switch based on this band type. Let's let the autocomplete fill out all of the cases for us. Switch band type. Let's get rid of these. And press build and wait for autocomplete to tell us that we are missing enumeration values. There it is. All right. Add missing switch cases. Thank you. Let's re indent those correctly. All right. Let's get rid of this. Get rid of these placeholders. 
Okay, we have all of our cases now in our switch statement. We can declare our vector next and then fill it with values from the param names enumeration next. I'm talking about this enumeration right here. This thing from a long time ago in this project. All right, let's create our vector next. We're gonna need our params namespace using namespace params, std vector names, names. Okay, we can fill in the switch cases next with the param names for the selected bands. So for the, let's do the low band first. Names equals, let's see, um, we need to do this and it's gonna complain if I don't define the type because it doesn't know what I'm doing. Let's see, this is going to be names. If it's the low band, then we're using the attack low band. We're using the release, release low band. Then we're doing the threshold. Uh, let's see, attack release threshold ratio and the bypass mute and solo. All right, this is what to do when it's the low band. All right, I'm gonna put this in curly braces. Okay, we need to do the exact same thing for the mid band and the high band. So grab this stuff, paste it, and just start replacing the values. Yes. One, two, three, H-I-G-H. -H. Okay, great. All right, fix any errors that come up while you're typing it. Make sure that for the high, if the high button is switched, you're using high params. If the mid button is switched, make sure you're using mid uh, params. All right, so here's the thing to notice from this. We are always doing the same order. Attack, release, threshold, ratio, mute, solo, bypass. Attack, release, threshold, ratio, mute, solo, bypass. Same for here. Attack, release, threshold, ratio, mute, solo, bypass. Let's define another enumeration for the possible positions in this name vector. And we will index into the names array using this position uh, vector. So enum position, attack, release, threshold, ratio, mute, solo, bypass. Let's get our param name map. Let's auto params, whoops, that begins with a P, params equals get params. Now the next thing to do is to update the parameter that the slider is connected to. Let's grab that param helper lambda from the constructor. We need to modify it to use the names vector uh, to provide the parameter name. So let's go up here, let's go to our constructor. We want the param helper, copy this thing here, copy, go back to our attachment function we're going down here after our position enumeration. And we need to capture our names vector. And we're going to be using our position thing to index into. So let's just change that POS just so we know what we're doing. And now we're going to use, let's see, let me call get param, return get param. Okay, we're passing the APVTS. Yes, we are passing our params map. And our name is taken from our names vector at the position, this thing right here, okay? So we're looking up, um, let's see. We have our names array and we're pulling out a position from it. So if we pass attack into names and it happens to be the high band, we're gonna get back this enumeration value. And then we're gonna pass that into get params as the name of which position to get for the map. Okay, it's a little bit of uh, indirection there to figure out all that stuff. All right, now we need to reset the attachments before we create new attachment. I'm not sure exactly why this is necessary as make attachment ends up calling the same destructor of the slider attachment class. However, if this is omitted, then the sliders don't display the correct value when they are refreshed. So if I figure out the answer, I will let you know. But for now, just you know, trust me on this, attack slider attachment dot reset. We have to do this for all of the sliders, all of the sliders and all of the, for all of the attachment. All right, we need to work on that now. Now we can change our parameters and add label pairs to our sliders. So let's cache the parameters so we are not calling the uh, helper function twice for each parameter. Now remember that 
changing the parameter repaints, so we need to add the labels before we actually change the parameter. So let's get our attack parameter first. Auto attack param equals get param helper. And our position is going to be the position attack. Okay, remember we are using our names thing to look this up. Right? And our name, our names vector is one of these three choices. It could be could contain all mid-band param lookups, or could be a low band param lookups, could be high band param lookups. All right. That's how all that stuff works. Okay, let's get um let's add our label pairs. Add label pairs. Attack slider. Uh, labels. Our param is gonna be the attack param. And our suffix is milliseconds. All right, and now we can change the param. Attack param. Excellent. Now do the same thing for the release param and the threshold param. Now for the ratio um, in the constructor, if you recall, we could not use add label pairs. Instead, we had to uh, manually code them up. So let's grab this code because we're going to reuse it. Actually, all this stuff is going to end up getting commented out. Um, but let's copy this and actually we need to clear our ratio slider labels ratio slider dot labels dot clear okay all right copy this stuff actually we don't need any of this now there's none of this this is all getting set in that attachment um, update attachments class we can come with that out now oh we don't need our end cap I'm a big fan of not having any warnings all right way down here at the bottom all right Let's get our um, our ratio param, auto ratio param as a um, let's see as a ranged audio. Let's see. Right now we can replace this. All right, our ratio param is going to be ratio param wrap. Right, and then now we can change our parameter ratio. Uh, ratio slider dot change param ratio param okay great now we are ready to start updating our attachments so let's use our make attachment class directly in uh, our make attachment function instead of that make attachment helper well we could use that actually let's see where is that helper there's button switcher there's make attachment helper okay here we go grab this guy let's see let's see if we can use this Make attachment helper. All right, make attachment helper. First one is the attack slider attachment. Our name is going to be the names array, and we want the position attack. And our slider is the attack slider. Okay, let's do that for the release slider next. All right, now for the threshold slider. And now the ratio slider. Next, the button attachments. Let's do bypass button first. Then we'll do solo. And finally, the mute button. All right, now we can go to the constructor and delete the code that configures the attachments and the sliders because this function does all of that for us. This is a bit of a monster function. All right, go up to the constructor. All right, we don't need any of this um, Attachment stuff. All right, cool. We don't need any of this get get uh, get param helper, which means we don't need these either. Is that right? Can I get rid of that too? I can get rid of that. Excellent. All right, let's run this. Switch to the standalone editor. That was a big, uh, big chunk of surgery we did there on the code. Out of range. Why is that happening? Name that position. What is being called here? What position did I choose? Ratio mid-band. Oh, uh, this is the wrong one. Okay. This, yeah, this should not be the names ratio. This should be position ratio. There we go. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay, we're defaulting to the low band. That's good. All right, so to test this out, let's... Uh, let's see, we're on the low band now. Let's switch the threshold to like whatever, like negative 24. Cool. Let's switch to the mid band. That goes back to zero. Let's switch back to the low band. 
negative 24 perfect all right cool all right the sliders are currently reflecting let's test the low band i'm going to change this from 50 to 150 whatever go to the mid band go back all right cool that works as expected if i go to the high band and change i'm going to change the release super short so this was five now it's 250 now it's five all right perfect so the next thing to do is to make the solo mute and bypass buttons have custom fill colors to reflect their state then we will make the band selection buttons reflect that state as well so that way if you're on the high band and the low band is bypassed this button will reflect that it's bypassed even though these buttons are currently showing the high band state we'll do that next let's close this let's make a commit of what we did what did we do we added um, let's see wired up band selection buttons that's a good way to describe it all right let's clean up that constructor um, where does that that's here we have a lot of code that does not need to exist let's get rid of this stuff and this stuff all right great let's clean that up stage commit there we go commit awesome all right next we will um, Next, we will adjust the um, colors that get used whenever you click on a button. Okay, the next thing to do is to make the bypass, solo, and mute buttons change the slider enablements as well as change the color of the band select buttons. Also, because these buttons are not part of a radio group, that means we need to manually make sure that only one button is toggled on at a time. That means we need to modify the audio parameters so that only one parameter can be true at a time. And remember, clicking the button changes the audio parameter, and the GUI then updates itself to reflect the latest value of this audio parameter. So we need to accomplish a lot of stuff whenever we click one of these band control buttons. So let's use button listener instead of the button on click lambda to coordinate all of this. First things first, let's go to our header file and let's inherit from button listener juice button listener let's add a destructor and the appropriate callback all right there we go got my destructor and the appropriate callback for the listener class let's add our band controls as a listener to all of our um to our three buttons where are those guys those guys are right here let's do this before we set our name Let's do this, yeah, right here is fine. Bypass button, add listener, this class. All right, do the same for the solo and mute. Paste that, copy this, paste, paste. Let's add the destructor and stop listening to these three buttons. Put that right here. Press our band controls. Let's just copy these guys. Copy these three lines, paste it, and change this to say remove listener. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Okay, the next thing to do is to implement the button clicked function. All right, let's put this after paint. Go to the paint function and put it before update attachments. Void compressor band controls, button clicked. Step number one is to update the slider enablements if you mute or bypass a band. If, um, if a band is muted or the band is bypassed, the sliders should be disabled. It's extremely common for audio engineers to be adjusting a parameter, you know, tweaking a knob, and they think that the sound is totally changing, like totally different. Wow, this sounds so much better when I tweak this knob, only to find out that the plugin was bypassed the entire time when they're done. It's this placebo effect, but it's with audio. So implementing this will prevent this from happening. So let's call an imaginary function that does this first and we'll implement it next. So here we go, update slider enablements. That's the first thing we will do. Let's go declare the imaginary function that we just called. Copy this, header file, go to the bottom of it, put it after update attachments, and let's put this right after oh let's give it a return type void let's put this right after our button clicked class for right now void compressor band controls implementation real quick okay here is the logic to implement if 
the band is muted or bypassed, disable the sliders. A simple OR statement will give us our disabled status. Auto disabled equals mute button dot get toggle state or bypass button get toggle state. If a button is mute, if the band is muted or bypassed, it should be disabled. Once we have our disabled state, we just set each slider to that state. Attack slider dot set enabled. If the mute button is on, then that means disabled is true, and it should be disabled if disabled. It should not be enabled, so we want opposite of that, disabled. Okay. If disabled is true, then enabled should be false. So if an, so, we want to pass the opposite of disabled. All right, do this for all four sliders. Attack slider, release slider, threshold slider, ratio slider. Let's try this out, run this, and now let's bypass. And cool, we, can't, uh, we cannot interact with these. And now we can, perfect. All right, the next thing to implement is replicating the radio group functionality. Now we cannot use the radio group functionality that comes with the juice button class because those require one button in the group to always be on. We don't want that. We want to be able to solo and unsolo we want to be able to mute and unmute, bypass and but and bypass, and also prevent being soloed and muted at the same time. So that's way different. Okay, we need to be able to have. Uh, I'll show you what I'm talking about. We need to be able to have these buttons in toggled off state, and radio group will not allow that. At least one button needs to be on in the radio group. Well, not at least one button needs to always be having a toggle state of true in the um, in the radio group. Okay, so that's why we cannot use radio group. Let's write a function that is called after this guy that updates the solo mute and bypass toggle states. So we need to pass in the button that was clicked so we can update the non-clicked buttons accordingly. Let's call our imaginary function and then implement what it does next. Update solo mute bypass toggle states and update it with the button we passed in. And we're going to pass it as a reference because yeah, because it's, yeah, let's, let's just do that. All right, let's go declare it. Copy this function name, go to the editor, put it at the bottom, void, and pass in a juice, a regular juice button as a reference. Clicked button. Excellent. All right, let's implement it next. Go back to plugin editor.cpp. Let's put this after slider enablements before update attachments. Void compressor band controls. Update solo, whatever that huge name was that we came up with. All right, the logic here is pretty simple. If you click the solo button on, toggle the mute button and the bypass button off. If you click the mute button on, toggle the solo and bypass buttons off. If you click bypass on, toggle the mute and solo buttons off. And if you click a but if you click a button off, don't do anything. And we need to remember to send the notification as that is what alerts the parameter attachment to update the audio parameter. All right, so here is what this code ends up looking like. I'll show you the first one. If the clicked button is the solo button and the solo button was clicked on, set the bypass to false and send that notification to update the parameter. Do the same for the mute button. Set the mute button to off and send the notification. All right, now we need to do the same thing for the mute button as well as the bypass button. Okay, there we go. If the clicked button is the mute button and the mute button was toggled on, turn off the bypass button and turn off the solo button. If the clicked button is the bypass button, turn off the mute button and turn off the solo button. Let's try this out. We should be able to click on the buttons and only one should be toggled at a time. All right, solo, mute, mute, bypass, bypass off, solo on, solo off, mute on, mute off. All right, cool. That works as expected. So the next thing is to make these solo, mute, and bypass buttons use a custom color whenever they are toggled. Let's make a commit before we go any further. What did we do? We added um, 
let's see, we uh, added solo mute bypass um, click functionality. That's a, I don't know any other way to describe it, and that's a pretty good description of what it's doing. Um, added extended click functionality. All right, commit that stuff. Okay. All right, like I said, the next thing that we have to do on our to-do list is to make the band buttons. Ref um, first, we have to make the solo mute and bypass buttons show a custom color whenever we click on them, and then we need to make the band select buttons reflect that state of the band. But before we do that, uh, we're gonna do something else. Before we tackle the next item in the uh, band controls to-do list, let's create separate files for all of the classes we currently have in editor, um, editor.h and editor.cpp. So these, this, these two source files are getting pretty cluttered. So what we're going to do is one class or namespace per source file. So here is the process. We're going to use projuicer to create a new set of source files. We're going to migrate the class over and we're going to repeat this until all non-original classes and namespaces have been moved into their own source files. Once that is done, we're going to correct all of the include directives and keep trying to build until it builds successfully. So let's go over to producer. Let's sorry, let's go to our header file first. Let's go all the way to the top. All right, first thing we're going to do is look and feel. Okay, first thing we're going to do is look and feel. New CPP and header file. Look and feel. All right, that went in the wrong place. Let's get rid of that. Put it here, look and feel. All right, save and open. Now go to plugin editor and just start migrating stuff over. Okay, let's do the CPP file next. This is an instance where it's very helpful to use the assistant editor. All right, that's one class. Oh, we don't need this anymore. Let's get rid of that. Okay, let's do rotary slider with labels, and we will put the ratio slider in that class as well. Because it's, you know, it has like minimal, there's no reason for it to be its own, to be in its own separate source file. So we'll grab all of this and put it there. Okay, let's do ratio, let's do um, rotary slider with labels. Rotary slider with labels. Grab these guys. Cut. Paste. And we need our juice header. We need to copy these functions. Collapse, collapse. And ratio slider. Okay. Cut and paste. All right, next we can do our buttons, the analyzer and the power of buttons. These guys are implemented in class, so we just need a header file for that. Well, you know what, let's do header and source. Custom buttons. Right. Cut, custom buttons. Include juice header. All right, let's move this uh, analyzer toggle button. Copy, paste, add the fully qualified name, and get rid of this. There we go. And we don't need the override keyword. Okay, uh, placeholder component, and eh, we can leave that. We do need to, um, yeah, we'll just add those as like, um, what will we do? we'll just do like utility, utility components. Utility comps, utility components. these guys paste them here juice header plugin editor all right need our placeholder constructor might as well put the uh, paint function there and now our rotary slider there we go okay next 
All right, we need some utility classes for all of these templated guys. Utilities, I'm just gonna call it utilities. All right, let's see, we need to move make attachment. That goes here. What else goes here? Um, get param, that should go there. Get val string, declaration of it, that should go there. Let's grab um, get val string. That goes here. Let's see. Um, we can do this truncate kilo value, that's templated, so that can go here as well. And then add label pairs. All right. Let's see what else should go there. I think we can use our um, draw background function. Where did that go? Is that here? That's in this class. Draw module background. Let's do that one too. That should move as well. Cut this. Put that at the end of this CPV file and grab the declaration. Okay. All right. Now we need uh, compressor band controls. Compressor band controls. Right, you know, let me uh, let's organize these. Um, let's see, sort alphabetically. There we go. Okay, plugin editor.h. Let's grab compressor band controls. Paste it here, and don't forget the juice header. All right, let's collapse all of these so they're easy to copy. Size, paint, button clicked, update enablements, update solo mute, update attachments. Okay, copy all of these over. All right, what do we have left? Global controls. Okay, last one. Global controls. All right, plugin editor, we need our global controls. Paste them here. Include the juice header. And now let's grab our global controls from the CPP file. Collapse all these down. Okay, cool. It's just three functions. Very cool. All right. And is there anything in plugin processor? Yes, we have our params. Let's do that next. Params. Let's add the juice header. And we can probably move this to the CPP file. Um, it's not necessary though. All right, next one is compressor band. Let's do that next. Compressor band. All right, let's copy this guy over. Include juice header. Awesome. And let's see, we can do all of this CPP file. Very simple, all right. Just turn all these into declarations. Oh, you know what, we're here. We can check off some things. We did our global controls. Those are done. We have added our main band controls. That's done. We added solo, mute, and bypass. And we did band select functionality. Very cool. So we have split all of this stuff up, and if we build it, we're gonna have a ton of include errors. Let's fix that stuff next. The way that you do this is just start uh, building it and tackling the errors. Expected namespace, so we need to include that. Include params.h. Just start building it until stuff disappears. All right, compressor brand control, unknown type name, rotary slider with labels. So let's include that. Include rotary slider with labels. Let's go to the next one, ratio slider. That's part of that class, that's fine. Um, okay, button listener, let's just see what it does. Let's just start clearing stuff out. 
look and feel needs to know about the rotary slider with labels class in the CPP file. Include rotary slider with labels. You need to know about our utility function, kilo value. Include utilities, I believe is what I called it. Yes. Uh, plug-in processor, you need to know about the compressor band. All right, plug-in editor, you need to know about look and feel. Include look and feel. What else do you need to know about? You need to know about global controls and compressor band controls. Include global controls. Include compressor band controls. Global controls, you need to know about rotary slider with labels. Global controls constructor, you need to know about params. Right. Placeholder, where is placeholder located? Include utility, utility components, that's where that was. All right, global controls needs to know about get param, that's in utilities. All right, cool, power button. You are located in those custom buttons. Is that what it's called? Is that what you called that file? Yes. All right. Draw module background. That is found in the utilities. All right. You need to know about the params. Oh, build succeeded. All right, let's run it. Let's see if it looks the same. Fantastic. All right, cool. Let's make a commit of that. All right, refactored into separate files. That's huge. There's our compressor band, custom buttons, global controls. And actually what I want to do, uh, before I commit that, I actually want to put these into uh, DSP and source folders. So here is, let's see, programming, simple MB comp, uh, not build, source. I'm going to add a new folder. I should have done this when I created the files. Uh, right click. Um, how do I make a new folder in here? New folder. DSP. And then I'm going to make another new folder. GUI. All right. DSP stuff goes in here. Cust uh, compressor band goes in here. That's in DSP. Params is part of DSP. Um, everything else seems to be GUI. GUI, look and feel is definitely GUI. Custom buttons, compressor band controls is definitely GUI. Rotary slider with labels is definitely GUI. And utility components is definitely GUI. Um, utilities, this is all GUI stuff. So we'll just leave it in there. All right, now let's fix this. By deleting this, so we'll just delete the entire chunk. Um, just remove the references and just drag the whole source file in. Perfect. Save and reopen. Okay, now we need to fix all of these includes now that they are organized correctly. So let's do a build and start fixing errors. Look and feel not found because it is found in GUI slash like that, all right, global controls, all those are in the GUI. We can really just look through this, okay, this is, um, params is fine, let's see, compressor, that's all gonna be in there, so it's really just plugin editor that needs this stuff, and then plugin processor needs that stuff that way. All right, params, you are gonna be located in dot dot slash DSP slash, like that, all right, include, dot dot slash DSP params. Yeah, that was right. Okay. All right, any of these files that need it are gonna be the same. This is DSP slash, same for global controls. All right, build succeeded. Let's run it just to make sure. Cool. All right, now we can make our commit. Let's just stage all of this. Okay. Here's our compressor band. Let's look at this. All right, compressor band, that's cool, that's cool. Also cool. 
right? Because we didn't, we opted to not move this to the CPP file. Okay, compressor band controls. So all this stuff. All right. This is fine. Let's commit these 23 files. Okay, great. That was an epic refactor. But now our plugin editor is much simpler. Let's customize these button colors. Let's enable the ability to customize the color per button by using the find color member function of the component class. These are toggle buttons that we're currently doing, uh, but we will use the text button color IDs to figure out which color we want. Let's, I just wanna show you which ones I'm talking about. If we go to draw, if we go to the toggle button class and then actually go to the text button class, there are several color IDs that we can use. We can use the color ID when the button is off, when it's on, and then the text color for when it's off and when it's on. Okay, so we'll be working with that stuff. All right, let's work through this revision. Let me show the code first. All right, we are calling set color twice right here and right here. One for the background, that's what the first one does when we fill our rectangle. And then the second one for the border, that's what this one does. And then the text, that's what this line does. Okay, for the background, we want to use the button on color ID and the button off color ID. Okay, the trick is to remember to call find color on the toggle button itself. That means we need to remember to set both of these colors, the button on color and button off color. We need to set both of these on the button itself in order for this find color lookup to actually work. We are going to customize the border color later when we work on the color scheme for the entire plugin. So for now, let's head back to the compressor band controls class and assign some default colors to these guys. Head over to compressor band controls.cpp. All right, we're gonna do this after we add our, uh, after we set our low band's name. We're gonna do, um, we're gonna do low band and we're gonna set the color and we need to do the on color and the off color. So low band dot set color and then we need to provide the name. We're doing juice text text button color IDs and we're doing the button on color. For this I'm gonna do gray. All right, for the off color let me copy this. For the off color, I'm gonna do black. Now don't forget the on button and the off button color need to be set for this to work. All right, let's do the same. Do the same thing for the other two bands. All right, we just need to change the names here. High band. All right, next, let's set the colors for the bypass, solo, and mute buttons. When these buttons are toggled on, they should each have a different fill color. I'm gonna go with yellow for bypass, green-ish for the solo, and then red for the mute. Because usually when a button, when a track is muted on a, like an actual console, it's got a red LED. All right, and then if you solo it, it's, I don't know, maybe it's yellow or whatever. I don't know, it's, I haven't looked at a console in a while. Regardless, let's add these colors next. All right, here's the bypass. We'll do the bypass button first. Set name. Okay, first color I'm gonna do, for bypass, I'm gonna do yellow and black. Yellow when it's on and black when it's off. For, this is the fill color, not the border color. The solo button next. I'm gonna do lime green and black. And the mute button is gonna be red and black. Red when it's on, black when it's off. Okay, let's test this out. Let's do a quick run. All right, cool, so we get gray when it's selected. That's cool. And this is yellow, this is green-ish, and red. All right, fantastic. The next thing to do is to make the band select buttons, these guys right here. We need to make their fill color reflect the state of the band. If the band is soloed, then we want this button to be green. If the band is bypassed, we want this to be yellow. If this is muted, we want it to be red. Every time we click a button, we need to refresh these colors for the active band. So let's head down to the button clicked function next. All right, head to the header file, and we're going to add a pointer right here 
that is going to keep track of which band is the active band. This is based off of which band select button is currently toggled on. Juice, toggle button, pointer, active band, and it's gonna default to the low band. All right, now we need to update which band is the active band whenever we make new attachments. Go to the CPV file, go to update attachments, and we can do this in the switch statement. If we click on the low, the low button, then we need to say that the active band is the low band. If we click on the mid band, then it's the mid band. If we click on the mid band button, the active band is the mid band. And then finally, if we click on high, active band is the high band. What's cool about this is we don't have to check toggle state to figure it out. All right, let's go back to button clicked. All right, let's call another imaginary function, update the active band fill colors. Let's call it first, then we will declare it and then implement it. Update active band fill colors. And we'll pass it the button that's currently being used. All right, let's go declare it next. Go to the header file, let's put it down here. Void update active band fill colors. Juice button clicked button. Now this function is basically going to call active band arrow set colors with specific colors. Let's go implement it now. Copy this thing, go back here, and let's put this above update slider enablements. Put it right here, compressor, controls, update band fill colors. Um, what's it called? Yeah, that's right. Uh, whoops, let me just use autocomplete. There it is. Okay, first things first, let's make sure our active band is valid. I don't see why it would ever be, but just, you know, let's just make sure. And let's print out the name, just so we know what's going on. Active band, active band, get name. Next, if the button's toggle state is off, we need to reset the active band's colors back to the default colors. So let's call an imaginary function for that. If clicked button dot get toggle state is false, if the button is off, then reset active band colors. We'll fill that in. We'll implement that in just a moment. Otherwise, we need to refresh the active band's colors and we need to pull the colors from the button that was clicked. So let's call another imaginary function. Refresh band button colors. Active band and the clicked button. Okay, let's implement reset active colors next. First, let's declare it. Header file. Void reset active band colors. And let's put this above slider enablements. Void compressor band controls, reset active band colors. So first the button was clicked off. Let's restore the active band to the default fill slash off colors. Active band, set color, and we're gonna do the button on color. Text button, color IDs, on color. And we wanna do that gray color, juice colors. Now we're currently using gray for the default color, but we will eventually build a system that lets us look up colors from the global color scheme. It's gonna be similar to that uh, params names system that we built earlier, but it's gonna be for colors. Okay, let's implement the other function after we do the rest of this. All right, so we got our active color for on is this, and then we need to do the off color, and we're using black here. Now changing the color doesn't cause it to repaint, so let's do that next. Let's implement the other function, refresh band button colors. Let's declare this guy right here. This one right here. Copy it, go to the header file, void. Let's make it static so we can use it with any button pair that we need, static. And the first thing is gonna be juice button, band and then juice button color source. We're gonna pull colors from the color source and apply them to the to the first param. Let's go to the implementation. CPP file, uh, put it above, reset, void, compressor band controls, refresh. Okay, we're going to do band.setColor, and now we need to copy, copy the button on color ID from the source to the band. Button on, and we're copying, um, we are copying color source, color source dot find color this thing. Since we want this color to persist when we change the selected band, we need to also set the off color to the color sources on color. And what I mean by this is if I click the solo button on the low band and then switch to the mid band, I still want the low band to 
show, I still want the low band select button to show me that it is soloed. Um, and when you switch bands, it uses the off color when it's no longer toggled on. So that's why we have to do it this way. So we go band.setColor. Um, I can just copy this line. Okay, we are setting the off color button color ID to the on color of the color source. And then once we set the colors, we need to repaint the buttons. Band.repaint. All right, let's test that out. All right, let's bypass and switch to the mid band and it still shows up as yellow, so that's awesome. The only issue is the text is white instead of black. And then if we switch back, this is cool. All right, solo, let's bypass you. Very cool, solo and bypass. Very cool, all right, that's awesome. That works as expected, so that is fantastic. All right, here is a test. What happens if we mute a band other than the low band? Let's see, uh, let's just mute, let's mute the mid band. Let's quit and relaunch. What do you think is gonna happen? Okay, the button, the mid band button does not reflect the state of the band when the GUI opens. Once we click on the band, it happens. So we need to update the band select button colors when the GUI is loaded. Disable that guy. Or we'll leave that on actually, so it's a good way to test. Okay, so let's write a function that does that. And it's only gonna be called from the constructor as the band select buttons reflect the band state correctly after the GUI has finished loading and one of the buttons is clicked. Okay, so this is just like, we only have to do this in the constructor. All right, let's declare it first. We're gonna call it update band select button states. Go to the header file. Let's put this down here. Void update band select button states. All right, here is what it is going to do. Number one, it is going to query the audio parameters for all three bands um, for their solo mute and bypass states. It is going to update the band's select button's fill color appropriately. Back again, huh? You want some more time on camera? Is that what this is? It's gonna make all the noise now. All right, here is what this function will do. It is going to query the audio parameters for all three bands. Um, it's gonna look for their solo mute and bypass parameters, and it's going to update the band select buttons, fill colors accordingly. This function, again, is only gonna be used during construction to ensure that the band select buttons show the correct colors when the GUI is initially loaded. Let's go call it in our constructor. Where is our constructor? It's here at the top. And we can do this after we um, after we update our attachments and before before we uh, make the low, mid, and high bands visible. And we also need to enable, we need to configure enablements as well. So let's do that too. Update slider enablements. And then we can do update band select button states. Let's add this before update slider enablements. Just a good place to put it. Void compressor band controls. Update band select button states. All right, here's the algorithm for this function. Number one, query the following params in the following order. Solo mute bypass. If a parameter is on, set the band select colors accordingly. Do this for the low, mid, and high bands. I wanna do this in a loop, so let's make a vector that holds all of the param name enum entries that we need to use. Go check this out. First, we need our params namespace. Then we need our array of param names to check. Next, we need to get to the parameter in question as an audio parameter bool. So this will let us check if the parameter is true or false easily. Let's get our params, const auto params equals get params. And then let's make a helper. Auto param helper equals lambda, lambda, lambda. This back up on screen. We need our params and we need our APV. Do we need APVTS? Yes, we do, but um, I'm lazy, we're just gonna capture this. And we also need a name to pass in. Let's see, let's implement this first. Return dynamic cast juice audio param. I never hold down shift long enough. Audio parameter bool. And we want our get param, this function, which returns a point, or returns a reference, we need a point of that. Okay, we need our params, we need our name. Let's pass that in, const auto name. And then we need our APVTS. All right, great. Now we just need to loop through our vector of params to check 
and do some magic inside this loop. All right, so for size t zero, i is less than params to check size. All right, let's get a list. So this is the name of the params we're gonna check. So auto list equals params to check uh, whichever entry we're on. So we might be iterating, iter iterating through this list. We might be iterating through this list. We might be iterating through this list. Let's figure out which band is currently being updated based on um, our index. Auto band button equals if i is zero, then we're working on the low band. Otherwise, if i equals one, then we're working on the mid band. Otherwise, we're working on the high band. All right, now we simply check the solo parameter, the mute parameter, and the bypass param. If any of these are true, we can use the static function we wrote to change the colors of the band button declared here. If auto solo equals param helper first entry in our list. So here we could use an enum, but this is fine. All right, if it's this and solo get, this is gonna return true or false. Then we can do refresh band button colors and our band is gonna be the band button and our color source is gonna be the solo button. Okay, let's check for the mute parameter. Else if auto mute equals param helper list one, mute get refresh the band button with the mute button colors. Finally, else if auto bypass equals param helpers list two, last one, whoops. That's not where that semicolon goes. All right, if it's the bypass button that's currently on, then update our appropriate band button with the bypass button. All right, let's test it out. All right, cool, the mid band is currently on. So that test worked as expected. I'm gonna change this to solo. I'm gonna bypass you and I'm gonna change you to muted. All right, let's save and quit and rerun. We should see them as expected. All right, cool. And the low band is muted, which it means uh, these are bypassed. Mute band is soloed and the high band is also muted. So those are disabled. So that's perfect. And solo and bypass. All right, cool. That is some excellent GUI functionality. Helpful for the user. Let's make a commit of that. Dialed in custom band control colors. Good times, good times. Let's look at our roadmap. We have our bands reflecting this. We're done with that. All right, and we have, we got custom look and feel going, and so we can um, we can mark that one off as well. We are up to the spectrum analyzer next. Uh, okay, we're gonna do an overview. We're gonna migrate it over from Simple EQ. We're gonna get it working, and then we're going to um, we're gonna get it drawing, and then we're gonna customize how it draws and then we're going to add bypass functionality to the analyzer and to all bands at the same time so we still got a decent chunk of stuff to do um i'd say we're about maybe 60 percent of the way done so the next thing we will tackle is getting the spectrum analyzer from simple eq into here if you get stuck or run into trouble while coding this or simple eq just grab one of my free products from programmingformusicians.com and you can message me directly in the Slack workspace and I will help you directly. All right, Spectrum Analyzer. Okay, a lot of code surgery in this one. If you have not completed the Simple EQ project, we will be reusing the Spectrum Analyzer and related classes from that project. So you might take this opportunity to pause this video and start watching the simple EQ videos so you can learn how to build that spectrum analyzer before you copy the code over to this project. Either way, we are going to visit the simple EQ repository and copy over the appropriate classes and get our spectrum analyzer functional before we start modifying it. Let's do that now. Go to your browser, go to the uh, spectrum, go to simple EQ and we're gonna go to the um, the plugin editor.h. Okay, we need to copy over, what is this thing called? This is called the response curve component. If we go down here, we've got our, let's see, where is this thing? Yeah, it's just called the response curve component. 
Okay, for whatever reason, that's what I decided to call it. Um, I don't remember why, but that's what I called it instead of Spectrum Analyzer. But we will be renaming it here because it will not be displaying the response of a filter. One of the first things we will do is remove the um, the response curve display from this. All right, let's go grab this class response curve component. Copy this. Okay, copy all of the response curve component. Copy it. And now let's paste it in our plugin editor.h. Paste it above the editor. And let's, um, let's see. We're going to replace the placeholder. We're going to replace this placeholder here for analyzer with an instance of that. Response curve component analyzer. Okay. Now let's uh, figure out what else we need to copy over um, by trying to build it. And obviously we need to copy over the CPP files. So let's grab those as well. Go to uh, source, go to plugin editor. And now we're looking for response curve rotary slider. Here we go. Response curve component. All right, paint function, get frequencies, get gains, get X's, draw background grid, draw text labels, uh, resized, parameter value change, process, timer callback, update chain, get render area, get analysis area. Grab all of these functions, copy them. Go to plugin uh, editor.cpp, paste these all at the top. Okay, let's try to build it. Okay, first thing to do is to change this constructor parameter to be the audio processor for this project. So go to plugin editor.h. Let's grab a copy of this um, simple MB comp audio processor and let's change that here. Simple audio. All right, and same for right here. Okay, we took care of this member variable and we took care of this constructor. All right, let's try building it again. That should take care of those errors. All right, cool. Let's get rid of this mono chain. We don't need this. We don't need the response curve. Uh, we don't need the response curve member variable. And we don't need the update chain function. Next, let's see. Okay, we need path producer, so let's go grab that from our repository. Let's see, that's gonna be in the header file first. Plugin editor.h, we want path producer. Where are you, path producer? There you are. Okay, path producer, copy. All right, we'll put this at uh, the top above our response curve component. Paste that. Okay. Next, we need to copy over the single channel sample FIFO. Now, the explanation for how this thing is built, the single channel sample FIFO, can be found in project 11. So if you're interested in learning how this thing gets built, you can uh, sign up for that course. This is going to be found in plugin processor.h from simple EQ. So let's go grab that. Source plugin processor.h. All right, single channel sample FIFO. Copy that. And let's paste it above our path producer. Actually, uh, this needs to live in plugin processor.h. So let's put it there. Let's put it above our class declaration for our processor. We need to copy over the channel enumeration from simple EQ. Let's do that next. Go back to the repository and grab this channel enumeration. I really don't know why I chose to do the right channel first and the left channel second. Because left is always channel zero, right is always channel one. But uh, I'm stuck with it now. Changing it would be a huge, um, huge code revision. So we'll just leave it as it is. All right. Put this above single channel sample FIFO in plugin processor.h. All right, let's build this and see what happens. Okay, next thing is it wants a FIFO. So let's grab that as well from simple EQ. Where is that? That's right here. Here's our FIFO. Make sure you include the array class. That's part of the FIFO. FIFO needs that. All right, put that above the uh, channel enumeration. 
Again, if you want to learn how to build this FIFO from scratch and all the design decisions that come with it, you can check out any of my advanced uh, plugin courses because they all use it. Project 10 uses it, Project 11 uses it, and Project 12 uses, uses it. All right, let's build this again. Let's see if we have any more errors in the uh, single channel sample FIFO. None, okay, cool. All right, let's go back to the editor, editor.h and uh, CP and uh, editor.cpp and get the rest of these classes working. Okay, let's change these references right here to the simple EQ. Change it from simple EQ audio processor and change them to our simple MB comp audio processor. That goes there, that goes there. Build that. All right, it says no member named block type in simple MB comp audio processor. All right, let's see what this block type is. Go back to the repository. Um, let's just look for block type. Let's see what our options are. Okay, there it is. Using block type equals audio buffer. So it's just an alias, so let's, um, it's public. Let's just copy this line and put it in our plugin processor.h. And let's also copy over these two channel instances, these two single channel sample FIFO instances as well that are declared right below it. Let's copy those. All right, plugin processor. Go down to the end of the public section after APVTS is declared and put them right there. All right, let's do a little build and see what errors are left. Okay, build failed. All right, block type disappeared, so that's cool. All right, what do we got next? Okay, we need this FFT order type. We need that. So that is found at the top of, where is that found? It's in here somewhere. Let's see, let's check plugin editor. There it is, FFT order. All right, let's copy that. Let's put that at the top of our class, at the top of our editor header file. All right, let's try to build it. And what do we have here? Oh, that's CPP file stuff. Let's fix that while we are here. Um, go back to the plugin editor, copy this simple MB comp audio processor. Go back over here, run away. All right, this needs to be changed. Okay, let's try that one more time. Okay, so now we've got an error with FFT data generator. All right, let's copy these over next. We're gonna grab the FFT data generator and the analyzer path generator. These are both found in, uh, let's see, here's FFT data generator. And here's the analyzer path generator. Let's copy both of these classes. They both go in plugin editor.h um, above path producer. Let's try that again. Again, if you want to learn how to build any of these classes from scratch and learn the design decisions that went into them, uh, check out my advanced courses, project 10, project 11, and project 12. Um, they all use this spectrum analyzer, so you'll be able to understand how these are put together. All right, let's fix the CPP file stuff. Okay, we're getting rid of update chain. All right, let's see what's next. Update response curve, let's get rid of this function. Actually, we don't need it at all. Same for update chain, that's gone entirely. Let's just keep building it. There's stuff that needs to be removed. All right, remove this code that uh, draws the response curve. This line right here. Can get rid of that entirely. All right, what's next? Um, okay, update chain, that can disappear. Response curve, okay, this stuff in resize, we don't need any of this, that can all disappear. All right, um, we don't need any of this. Update chain, update response curve. All right, let's see what happens next. Constructor must explicitly initialize. Okay, we need to do that. That's down in our header file. Plug an editor all the way down to the bottom. This needs an instance of its audio processor. Yeah, it needs the audio processor. Okay, let's try building it one more time. All right, let's see what we get. Oh, we forgot to make it a visible child. Go to plug an editor. And let's add our analyzer, make it visible. All right, here we go. Let's see what we get. There it is. We have our spectrum analyzer in place that so we can start modifying it. 
Uh, let's rename it next and then modify it to display what we need it to display. Okay, let's rename this class to Spectrum Analyzer. Right click, refactor, rename, Spectrum Analyzer. Okay, cool, let's clean it up next. All right, let's delete these. All right, let's see if there's anything left in here that needs to be deleted. I think we removed a lot of stuff earlier instead of just commenting it out. Yep, that's it, okay. All right, let's uh, make a commit now that we have a spectrum analyzer. Added spectrum analyzer and associated source, associated classes. All right, it's not wired up, but that's okay. We'll do that next. Well, first let's refactor into separate files. All right, so we'll do what we did before. We've got all of these classes, so one source file, um, one class, one source file. Go over to Producer, and let's see. First thing we're going to do is add FFT Data Generator. FFT Data Generator. Right, just paste that here. Include Juice Header. All right, next let's do the analyzer path generator. Uh, collapse it. Uh, sorry. Yeah, let's collapse these first. This will make it easier to see what we have to do. All right, three classes, analyzer path generator, path producer, and spectrum analyzer. Okay, so let's see. These are all in the GUI. Spectrum analyzer. And let's see, path producer. Path producer. And then analyzer path generator is just a header file. Analyzer path generator. All right, let's take care of these. All right, let's do spectrum analyzer first. Cut. Paste this here. And don't forget the juice header. All right, next is path producer. And don't forget the juice header. Include. Oops, not that one. Juice header. And then analyzer path generator. Include juice header.h. What else do we got? There's something in. Uh, that's it for this guy. So let's migrate over stuff from the CPP. Let's collapse this spectrum analyzer. Let's collapse all of these. Let's grab all of them. goes in spectrum analyzer.cpp. All right, next, um, let's see, FFT order. Let's put this in utilities. Put this at the top. All right, and then plugin processor.h has single channel sample FIFO and the FIFO class. So let's add these to the DSP, DSP folder. Add new header file. FIFO, make sure that's DSP folder, FIFO.h, and then single channel sample FIFO. All right. All right, channel can go with the single channel sample FIFO class. Put this here. Include juice header.h. Let's migrate over the FIFO. And include the juice header. Okay. All right, now we can fix all of the includes. Try to build. Let's go through the errors. Plugin processor needs single channel sample FIFO. Include DSP single channel sample FIFO. We got no, let's see, where was that name? No template named FIFO. So let's include the FIFO here. What is wrong with this? Ah, oh, yes, okay. Uh, unknown type name spectrum analyzer, let's include that. Include GUI spectrum analyzer. Spectrum analyzer does not know about the path producer. Let's inform it. Include path producer. Path producer does not know about the 
FFT data generator, include FFT data generator, include what's the other thing? Analyzer path generator. All right, FFT order. That was in utilities. Um, that wasn't GUI utilities. No template named FIFO. Include dot dot slash DSP FIFO. All right, path producer. We can um, we need to include the audio processor. Include um, let's see dot dot slash plugin processor dot H. All right, build succeeded. Let's run it just to make sure. All right, cool. Let's commit that refactor. All right, um, refactored, separate files, separate files, refactor. All right, we will run audio through the spectrum analyzer next and uh, get it to display what it displays. Let's remove some stuff from our roadmap. We have not looked at that for a while. Go to the plugin processor.h. Wait at the top. Let's see, what do we got left? All right, we've done our spectrum analyzer. Uh, we have our data structures for it. Uh, we need to do, let's see, uh, this needs testing. And then we need to get this working. This is what we're going to do in this issue. All right, let's tackle this one, number nine, FIFO usage in process block. This is where we will feed audio into our single channel sample FIFO. Head on over to plugin processor.cpp, go to process block. Before we apply our gain, let's send our incoming audio into the FIFOs for the spectrum analyzer. So the spectrum analyzer is going to show, um, it's going to show the incoming audio before any gain reduction left channel FIFO dot update buffer right channel FIFO update buffer all right let's switch to testing out the VST version and run some audio through the plugin VST3 run let's see what happens J assertion aha we forgot to prepare I'm glad this guy was here this was smart if, uh, yeah if I hadn't done this, uh, who knows what this thing would do. All right, let's go fix that. Go to uh, plugin processor.cpp, go to prepare to play, and we need to prepare our FIFOs. Put this down at the bottom, left channel, FIFO.prepare, samples per block. Right channel, FIFO, prepare, samples per block. All right, now let's try it. All right, let's play some music through it. Headphones if needed. Excellent. All right, let's test the accuracy next, just to be sure. And save this, quit. Let's make a commit. Wired up um, spectrum analyzer to incoming audio. Stage U. What's that? Yeah, it's funny. These two lines of code are, or these four lines of code are what make the spectrum analyzer actually work. That's good times. All right, we're going to verify the spectrum analyzer accuracy next. To verify the accuracy of the spectrum analyzer, we're going to need an oscillator to generate a test signal. Now we could use the DAW for this, um, but I'd rather use um, internal code to do that. So let's go down to the bottom of our header file. And after our split bands class, let's give ourselves an oscillator. The juice framework has one. It's part of the DSP module. We will use that. Let's go to prepare to play next. We need to uh, configure it. Let's do this after our FIFOs. Let's initialize the prepare it and then set the frequency. We need to provide a lambda that takes in a, um, a position um, within the circle of pi and returns a sample. Float x, this is our position within the circle of pi. Oops. Um, and we can just do return sg sine of x. This is going to generate a sine wave. All right, let's prepare it. All right, let's go down to where we are updating our state. 
plugin processor.cpp process block. Okay, let's do this after update state. The move here is to clear our buffer and fill it with samples from the oscillator. So let's give ourselves an if block. We'll just say if true. If it's true, you're gonna do this thing. You're gonna do buffer clear. Then you're gonna you're gonna fill it with oscillator samples. Do an audio block from the buffer. Do a context. And now we can do osc.process. All right, this is going to fill up the buffer with samples from the oscillator. All right, this is gonna be super annoying to listen to because it's going to be a full scale sine wave at 440 Hertz. So I suggest muting your speakers. I'm not gonna use headphones for this. What we are looking for is a single peak in the spectrum analyzer at 440 Hertz. Where did 440 Hertz come from? It came from right here. If we go to the oscillator class way down at the bottom, the default frequency is 440. That's where that comes from, because you'll notice we did not set a frequency. With that said, turn down your headphones, possibly turning them off or unplugging them or turning your speakers off, and switch to the standalone version. And now let's run it. We can test other frequencies that line up with grid lines later. For now, we want to see this peak hit uh, the zero dB line. Oh, let's change. All right, let's try that one more time. Okay, so it's pretty accurate in terms of uh, the, the pitch. Let's try 500 and then 2000. Okay, those frequencies are actual lines on the grid. So we can go up to our prepare to play. And this is where we will set our frequency. frequency is that what it's called? Yes, it is, all right, let's do 500. Let's test this out. All right, that's pretty accurate. Let's do uh, 2000 Hertz. All right, that's basically right on the money. All right, let's add a gain processor and test negative 12 dB since that is a grid line on the scale on the left. I'll show you what I'm talking about real quick. That's over here, this line right here, this is negative 12. Let's go declare it, go to the uh, plugin processor.h after the oscillator. Go back to um, plugin processor.cpp. We need to prepare it. Let's do that after our oscillator. Gain.prepare spec gain.set gain decibels negative 12.f. All right, now let's just process the context with it. Process block gain.process ctx. Okay, let's test it out. Okay, what I am seeing is that the peak is not at negative 12. It should be lining up with this grid line and it's not. It's a bit lower than that. And if we turn the gain off, let's comment this out. It's below the zero dB line, which is this line right here. So there is an issue with the spectrum analyzer mapping that we need to solve. And I want to test a few more frequencies though, just to see if it's an issue with the amount of energy in that particular frequency band. So let's try 50 Hertz next. Go to um, prepare to play. Let's try 50 Hertz. All right, let's try 50. Okay, this is definitely below zero dB. And we're not applying any gain. Let's try 1000. Okay, all right, so we definitely have a mapping issue with the spectrum analyzer. Let's investigate that next. Let's go back to process block. Let's turn on our gain processing real quick. All right, as you can see, the FFT is not correctly displaying our test signal. It should be displaying at negative 12, but it is not. It is much lower than that. I want to make the gain adjustable while we figure this out. So let's use juice live constant to give ourselves this option. This will give us a slider to drag in a pop-up window, and we can use that to adjust the test signal level. Let's close this. Let's right here, we will go gain.set gain decibels juice live constant negative 12. Notice I'm using negative 12 not negative 12.f that's because if I do dot f 
this will give us a float and I want to do integers so that way I can have um, steps of like 12, 11, 10, 9. Okay, let's try this off. Oops, cancel. Let's try this one more time, building. All right, here's our live constant editor. All right, so now we can drag this slider. Let's see, how far up do I need to go to make it zero? I have to go about 5 dB, maybe 4 dB up to get it to line up with zero. So there's something going on with how the test signal is being mapped vertically to the screen coordinates. Let's solve that. Let's head on over to spectrumanalyzer.cpp and we're gonna go to the paint function. All right, let's get rid of this Y transform and see what happens. We're gonna put zero here and we're gonna put that on a new line, comment it out and put that like that. Let's do the same thing for the right channel. Oh, I need uh, both of these. There we go. All right, do the same thing here. Put a zero, put this on its own line, and then put the curly braces on there, uh, put the parentheses on their own line. All right, let's test and see what happens. Okay, so our setting is negative 12, and now it's showing at right on negative 12. The problem is that we can now see where negative infinity is currently mapped to. So there is an issue with where negative infinity is in the rectangle that we are using to convert our FFT bin values. Remember, with the rectangle we are using to map these values, the top represents 0 dB and the bottom represents negative infinity. So let's look at the rectangle that we are passing to the path producer. All right, go to the timer callback. We are passing the analysis area rectangle. So let's take a look at how this gets computed. All right, go to get analysis area. Okay, so we start with our local bounds here in get render area. That's what's going on here. And in this function, we remove a chunk from the top, then we remove a chunk from the bottom. Then we remove a little bit more from the top and a little bit more from the bottom. Okay, so let me get the whiteboard so I can explain um, how we are mapping this stuff. Okay, we are mapping our signal Let's see, let me, let me first step back. All right, this big rectangle on the outside, that is our local bounds. Let me go this way. That's our local bounds. And then in our get uh, render area, this is where we remove a little bit from the top and a little bit from the bottom. And that gives us this purple rectangle on the inside. Then we do get analysis area, which shrinks it even further. Now we are mapping our signal between this area here and here. The top line is 0 dB. Let me draw that here. This is 0 dB, and this bottom line is negative 48. However, negative 48 is not negative infinity. We need down here to be negative infinity. So we need to update two things. Number one, the rectangle being passed to the path producer needs to have a proper bottom edge that actually lines up with negative infinity. Right now it lines up with this, uh, it's this green, uh, greenish blue one. So we actually need to make a rectangle that goes from here, like that. Okay, number two, we need to tell the path producer that the decibel value, number two, we need to tell the path producer the decibel value that is negative infinity. For that, we need to figure out what is the dB value of this bottom edge. If this is zero and this is 48, or this is negative 48, what is this? This is uh, like negative 50 or 52 or something, and that's what negative in that is what is negative infinity in terms of uh, this mapping of values. Okay, so let's take care of number one first: the rectangle being passed to the path producer needs to have a proper bottom edge that lines up with negative infinity. Let's do that first. All right, let's go to our timer callback. Let's set the bottom of this FFT bounds right here to our components bottom. FFT bounds dot set bottom, get local bounds, get bottom. Next, we need to adjust the top and bottom values in the function that maps decibels to screen coordinates. That is over in the analyzer path generator. Analyzer path generator dot h. Okay, that's right here. 
All right, we are mapping the bottom to get height, but we need to map it to f of t bounds get bottom. So comment this line out and do auto bottom equals f of t bounds dot get bottom. Next, we are currently adding 10 to whatever the bottom is. That's right here in this lambda. This magic number is also a source of inaccuracy, so let's remove that. All right, let's get rid of this line. We also don't need that cast anymore. Bottom, top. All right, let's take a look at this and see if we have an improvement. Okay, better. Now it's uh, mapping negative infinity to the bottom of the screen, but this is slightly off right here. And if we adjust this, if I put this at negative 24, it's still off that way. If I go up to zero, zero is lined up, uh, negative 36, and this is because it is not, it's mapping the negative infinity, negative 48 to the bottom of the screen instead of this line right here. So we need to define what negative infinity actually is in decibels relative to this zero dB line and this negative 48 dB line on screen range. Let's do that next. All right, let's head over to the path producer and way at the bottom, Let's add a negative infinity member variable. Float negative infinity. Let's initialize it to negative 48, just as a starting point. All right, let's add a setter function so we can update this in our spectrum analyzer after the component has actual screen bounds. Void update negative infinity. Float nf negative infinity equals nf. Now go to the CPP file. All right, we need to, where's my path producer? Did I not migrate this stuff over? I don't think I migrated this stuff over. Oh, you know why? Because it's here in Spectrum Analyzer. Right there, path producer process. Oops, let's collapse that. That belongs over here. Okay. Okay, we need to look for any negative 48s and replace them with negative infinity. There's one, and here's the other. Okay, this shouldn't make any visual difference, but let's just test to make sure. All right, that's still off. If I put it at negative 36, what do we get? Are we gonna get that same weird uh, Difference, yep, that's fine, okay, and zero. Zero lines up at the top, okay, cool. All right, no difference. All right, let's set negative infinity for the path producer. Let's head over to the resized function in the spectrum analyzer. Spectrum analyzer.cpp, go to the resized function. All right, as I said earlier, the top line, I'll show this, make sure your speakers are muted uh, make sure you're, um, yeah, well, I'll mute this in post. Okay, the top line right here is 0 dB, this gray line, and then the bottom line is negative 48. However, negative 48 is not negative infinity. We want the bottom of this component to represent negative infinity. So first we need to get this analysis area, since that area represents 0 to negative 48. Let's do that first, auto FF t bounds equals get analysis area dot to float. Then we need to j map the bottom of our local bounds from the analysis area range to the decibel range. Auto neg inf equals j map. All right, our source value is going to be local bounds as a float rectangle, and we want the bottom of it. All right, our source range minimum is gonna be our FFT bounds, get bottom. And our source range max is gonna be FFT bounds, get Y. And our target range minimum is gonna be negative 48. Our target range max is zero, D, is zero uh, float. So this negative 48 corresponds to the bottom of our FFT bounds, and the zero corresponds to the top or the Y the y value, and then we are mapping our local bounds, the bottom of it, 
based on this set of um, top and bottom values. Now we can update our path producers. Let's print out what the bottom of the window actually maps to in decibels and update accordingly. Okay, let's test this out. All right, that is almost perfect. Still not 100%, it seems. All right, it seems like it's a tiny bit off, but maybe it's not actually off. Let's look at the maximum value being produced where the FFT bins are converted into decibels. And I'd like to think that it should be whatever gain level our gain processor is set to since a full scale sine wave is being used as the test signal. But let's find out. Head to the FFT data generator. All right, FFT data generator. Go down to the bottom. We want to see the maximum decibel level that the FFT data has. So let's use juice jmax to find out. First, declare a local max variable, set it to negative infinity. This is where we convert everything into decibels, so we want to find the maximum decibel level. All right, now declare a local variable that will hold our converted bin value. Then use jmax to store the max value between the current max and the converted FFT bin's value. That looks like this. Auto data equals this thing. FFT data at index i equals data. And then max equals juice jmax, uh, our data value and our max value. Let's add a j assert false so we can look at what that max value has. j assert false. I do not want to flood the console with this max value, which is why I am not using um, a debug macro here. Right. Oh, and here's what our negative infinity turns out to be. It's negative 49.41, whatever. Okay, let's test this out. We need to press the continue button several times until the FFT buffers are filled with data, but let's see what we get. We'll be able to inspect and see what max is set to. All right, max is negative 41, continue 19, negative 16, negative 16, negative 16, negative 16, negative 13, negative 12, all right, 13, 12, okay, negative 12, 3, 6, 5, whatever, whatever, okay, I'm happy with that. Yeah, negative 3, 6, 5, whatever. Okay, now why is this not exactly 12? It's because our oscillator's frequency is not the same as that of one of the frequency bins. So let's change our oscillator's frequency to match one. Let's comment out this J assert false and head over to plugin processor.cpp. Go to prepare to play. All right, now we're gonna fix this frequency here. We need to test with a frequency that lines up with the center of an FFT bin. The bins are spaced evenly between 0 Hz and the sample rate. So we just need to divide the sample rate by the number of bins minus 1, and that will give us the bin width. Then from there, we just multiply this bin width by any number n to find the center frequency of the nth bin. I'm going to go with 50 because it's kind of close to a thousand hertz. The FFT order is a bit shift value, so we need to shift two to the left by our FFT order to get the number of bins, then just subtract one, since we don't count the bin with a center frequency of zero hertz. That's what this looks like. Comment this out. We're gonna do oscillator.set frequency. We start with our sample rate, get sample rate, and then we divide that by um, our bin order, which is FFT order. Um, let's see, what are we setting that to? I think we're doing it at like a low value. Let's see, um, the spectrum analyzer. Where are we doing that? Is that in the path producer class? There it is, right there. FFT order, order 2048. All right, let's copy that. Go back to plugin processor. This is the FFT order that we want. Okay, we take this value, we shift it, to, we do bit shifting, and then we subtract one from that. And this gives us the bin width, 
and then we just multiply this whole thing let's see this all needs to be in uh, um, let's see that needs to go this needs to be in parentheses and this gets multiplied by whatever bin I want so I'll do 50 all right this is going to produce a frequency that lines up with the center of one of the FFT bins. Let's check it out. All right, look at that, boom, right on the money, negative 12. And if we adjust this, let's do negative 24, right on the money, and negative 36, right on the money, all right. Bug solved. The FFT analyzer is accurate again. I hope you enjoyed um, this whole process because this was a really fun bug to solve for me and I'm excited to share how it gets solved because it's a really interesting problem. That was good times. Let's make a commit of that. And we've got some extra stuff in here, but that's okay. We have these guys, we'll just leave them in there for now. We can turn this off in a minute. Okay, let's see, what do we do in the spectrum analyzer? Um, this is mapped to zero. This is mapped to zero. Uh, we moved that function. All right, that's what that is. Okay, path producer. Um, we gave ourselves a means of supplying negative infinity based on the window position um, in path producer. This is where we just migrated that function over. Okay, and an FFT data generator. This is where we figured out the max value. Um, I don't know if we need to commit this. We can just remove it later. And analyze the path generator. This is where we corrected a mapping issue. States that. All right. Cor All right. This is going to say corrected FFT um, mapping inaccuracies. I hope I spelled that right. Inaccuracies. Don't judge me if that's spelled wrong. We need to fix a bug in the path producer. The float vector operations copy function is not meant to be used where the destination buffer is the same as the source. That's exactly what we are doing here. This causes undefined behavior and causes address or thread sanitizer issues if that stuff is turned on. I can't remember which one it triggers, I just remember that it triggered it at one point and yeah, either way, we need to fix it. So we can use std copy instead. We also need to make sure that the temp buffer has the same or fewer number of samples as the mono buffer. So let's do this first. Let's add a j assert. J assert size is less than or equal to mono buffer dot get num samples. And now um, we can just force it. Size equals juice j min size mono buffer get num samples. All right, so this makes sure that size is set to mono buffer dot get num samples or size, whichever one is smaller. All right, for this, we will need the read and write pointers in the mono buffer. Auto write pointer equals mono buffer get write pointer. Channel num is, uh, we need channel number is zero and our sample index is zero. We need our read pointer, auto read pointer, equals mono buffer, get read pointer. This one we're reading channel zero, and we're starting at index size. It's basically these two lines right here. All right, now for std copy, the first parameter, the first parameter is the location of the first sample in the source buffer that we want to copy. So that's going to be our read pointer. The second parameter is the location of the last sample that we want to copy, plus one. So wherever we want to copy to, the end of that. All right, read pointer plus, here we have our mono buffer dot get num samples. minus size, all right? And then the third parameter is the destination, right pointer. Second parameter is kind of confusing. 
So let's break out the whiteboard just to explain. Uh, before we do that, let's comment out the old code. Okay. STD copy is annoying because of how it works, but it's the right tool for the job in this situation, so I'm going to explain what is happening. I've got RP representing read pointer. I've got um, WP representing the write pointer. This is the same block of memory, okay? It's just, I'm just showing eight, eight bytes for right now. Okay, our goal is to add three samples to the end of our array. The way we're going to do that with STD copy is to provide the write, the read pointer, which is at the third index, and then our read pointer plus num samples minus the size is the end of the chunk we want to um, we want to read from. And then we say, hey, where do we want to put this, the destination? That's at the very beginning. So again, one more time, we the first argument is the read pointer. This is where we're gonna start reading from. Then we say, all right, where's the end? And that's the read pointer plus the number of samples minus our size. Our size is three, our number of samples is eight, so we get three minus, three plus eight is 11 minus three gives us one past, um, it basically gives us the index after um, the range we wanna copy. It's that same thing with like um, string, uh, substring where you say here's the first index and then go up to but not including this other index. It's, they're doing the exact same thing here. We start at this index, we go to this, we copy from here up until this index but don't include this index. And then we say all right we want to copy all that stuff to the right pointer which is at the beginning. And this is going to shift this whole chunk over here which is going to give us our three samples. It's going to give us room for our three samples at the end. That's how STD copy works. Like I said, it's not the most intuitive thing to use, um, but it does not trigger the uh, thread sanitizer or address sanitizer errors that uh, float vector operations do. Okay, so that's um, that's how the STD copy operation works. Okay. All right, we commented out the old float vector operations, so we can go ahead and test this out. All right, no visual difference. This is still at zero, uh, still at negative 12, still accurate. Negative 24, all right, cool, so that's fine. Okay, cool, so we can get back to our roadmap now that the spectrum analyzer has been dialed in and it is now ready for modifying. Let's go take a look and see what we have left to do. All right, this is done, and this is done. All right, so we need to do this next. All right, let's make a commit, because that was, um, that was a pretty decent, um, pretty decent bug that we fixed. Fixed, um, I think it's ASAN, I think it's address center issue in um, path producer. Stage and stage. Okay. All right, let's disable our test oscillator. This is extremely simple. Go to process block and change this to if false. We can remove this stuff later if we want to. Uh, I'm gonna leave it in in case I need to do more testing. Um, this is more convenient than just com commenting it all out. We're just left with a simple warning. Um, let's see. All right, the next thing to do is we're gonna tweak some of these graphics a little bit. And then once we do that, uh, we're gonna do a little bit of refactoring and then we're gonna tweak the labels and then that's going to wrap up the spectrum analyzer. So let's adjust these background graphics first. All right, go to spectrumanalyzer.cpp, go to the paint function. Now I want to reorganize this a little bit. I want to use the draw module background first that I've been using in other classes. So that's the main motivation is I want this to have that same cool border that our other modules have, the uh, global controls and the compressor band controls. Draw module background is in the utilities file, so we need to include that. That's up here at the top, include. Let's go find it. Is that in, is that in the GUIs? Yes, it is in the GUIs, so it's just right there in utilities. All right, go back to the paint function. Okay, right here. Let's call draw module background. 
Okay, this function does not return anything, but I wanted to return the area inside the module bounce. This area will be where we draw everything, and it is smaller than the local bounce. So let's change the draw mo so let's change the draw module function to give us this auto bounds equals that. All right, we're just kind of saying, hey, this is going to give us something back. All right, let's go fix that next. Let's go to our utilities utilities.cpp. All right, bounds is what it is going to return. Bounds is the inner reduced rectangle, so let's return that. Let's uh, say that it's going to return a rectangle here. And now let's change the return type in the declaration. Here is that function down here at the bottom. Rectangle. Okay, cool. Back to the spectrum analyzer. All right, the next step is to revise how the background grid is drawn. It is currently drawn relative to the local bounds, and we need to make it relative to this bounding box that was returned from draw module background. So let's revise the declaration first, and then pass these bounds to it where we are calling it right here. All right, go to the header file. All right, comment out the old one and add a juice rectangle as the second parameter. Just copy and paste. Juice rectangle int bounds. All right, go back to the CPP file, CPP file. Now we can pass our bounds to this function. Let's update the implementation next. Go to the implementation, draw background grid. Let's update this to take a rectangle as the second parameter. All right, next, we need to make this analysis area function take a rectangle as its parameter. So let's change the declaration first, and then the call site, and then the implementation. Go to the header file, get analysis area, add a juice rectangle as the parameter. All right, that updates the uh, declaration. Go back to the CPP file. All right, let's pass in the bounds now. And let's update the implementation next. This is way down here, get an, an get analysis area. Change this, juice rectangle, int. Okay, we need to make get render area compute its result based on this bounds that we're passing in. So let's revise that function as well. And then after we finish that revision, we will update the implementation. Let's go to the declaration and add um, a rectangle as the parameter. Back to the CPP file. And now let's uh, update the call site. And here we can say bounds equals that, and this is no longer an auto. Now we can update this implementation here, pass in bounds. All right, we are providing a bounding box now, so we do not need to get the local bounds. Okay, let's go back to where we were in the paint function because we have a few errors now since revising get render area and get analysis area. We were gonna get to those though. Let's go back to the paint function. Okay, let's get this compiling before we continue. First of all, we need to pass our bounds to, this, uh, to these functions that want a parameter. So response area, um, it's provided by get analysis area and that requires bounds. In draw text labels, let's draw text labels. Let's see what errors are first. Spectrum analyzer. Okay, this one. Um, let's see. Just looking at my notes here. Draw text labels is what it says to do next. All right, draw text labels needs a rectangle because get analysis needs a rectangle. So let's make draw text labels receive a rectangle as the second parameter. And let's call that here, bounds. And let's update that declaration real quick. Go to the header file, draw text labels. Okay, go back to our CPP file, go to that paint function one more time. Okay, we're down here at draw text labels. Let's pass our bounding box here. Um, let's add our bounds here into this get render area. And in this one as well, bounds. Are there any others in here? Nope, okay, let's do a quick build. 
Okay, we need to pass our local bounds here in our get analysis area. So let's get that auto bounds equals get local bounds. Bounds. And we can DRI, DRY this one right here. This should just be bounds. All right, let's see. What do we have next? Okay, the last place is um, right here. Let's get analysis area. So let's DRY this getting the local bounds. Auto bounds equals get local bounds. And now we can pass bounds here. And we can use our bounds here. All right, let's test it out. It should all look the same except for having the module border around it. All right, no module border. Hmm. All right, let's investigate paint and see if we missed something. Aha, this fill path is covering up the background. Let's comment it out, see what we get. All right, excellent, we have a module border. And we've got this uh, line right there. We'll deal with that in a little bit. Um, and then we can also tweak these positions for the text labels next. That was a lot. That was very surgical. Let's make a commit of that. Added. Uh, what did we do? We added module border to spectrum analyzer. Also disabled. Disabled test oscillator. Okay. Here's where we modify draw, rec, uh, draw module background to return the rectangle that it um, ends up, yeah, it, it returns the rectangle that is um, being reduced. All right, here's where we updated our declarations to work with um, bounding boxes. And then here's all the code surgery that we did. All right, let's move all of this code into its own function. Let's declare a private member function, spectrumanalyzer.h down at the bottom, void draw FFT analysis. We need a graphics and a bounding box. We can take that from here. All right, we're going to pass the bounding box because we're going to draw the paths within uh, this bounding box. All right, let's go call it spectrumanalyzer.cpp draw FF analysis G bounds. All right, let's implement it. We just need to copy this code and then remove it. I'm going to put that right up here. Void spectrum analyzer draw FFT analysis. And uh, wants to, the juice namespace using namespace juice. All right, let's get rid of this code here. All right, let's go to our function because it's got it. We have a few errors. All right, first error is it wants the response area. So let's take that from here. Cut that because it's not used anymore. That can go here. All right, let's run this. All right, everything seems to look okay. Uh, let's do the, um, we still have that white line. But let's run this. Let's actually run some signal through this now, just to make sure. You can grab your headphones if you want. All right, that's still working. Cool. All right, let's take care of that white line that's being drawn. We can use the graphics reduce clip region function to shrink the area that we are allowed to draw within. If we combine this with graphics scoped save state, this reduced clip region will stop being reduced once we leave this function. So this lets us draw only within this response area, which is pretty handy. So first create a graphics save state. Juice, uh, we don't need to write that. Graphics scoped save save state, triple S, passing our graphics instance. And then let's do g.reduce clip region response area. All right, let's take a look at it. All right, I don't see that white line anymore. That's fantastic. All right, and it's only drawing it within the negative 48 or zero, so that's awesome. Okay, the next thing is to fix these text labels and the grid itself because uh, we don't care about, you know, plus 24 to negative 24. We care about um, plus 12 to negative 60, because that's what our threshold range is. That's what we want to see on here. 
Okay. Let's commit this since that was a decent bug to fix. Fixed um, negative infinity line being visible in spectrum analyzer. Also refactored how FFT paths are drawn. All right, cool. All right, let's continue cleaning up the spectrum analyzer. Go to the paint function. All right, let's get rid of this border. We already have a border. That's the uh, draw module background. So let's comment out everything except uh, draw text labels. Get rid of that and get rid of this. All right, let's test it out. Standalone editor. All right, cool. It looks good. All right, let's dial in the text labels next. All right, let's take a look at this. All right, first things first, notice that this text along the top is colliding with uh, this border. So let's fix that. That's in the text labels function. Let's go to that. All right, this is where we draw our frequencies, right in this chunk right here. All right, this is where we draw it. Okay. The Y position should be the Y position of the bounds that we're passing in, not one. So that's the first fix right there. R.set Y, bounds.get Y. Remember, we're passing in a bounding box that is inside of our uh, module background. All right. Let's look at that. All right, cool. They are no longer colliding. That's great. Let's see. Next, the text on the right. Okay, this text is colliding with the edge. Let's fix that. Again, it needs to be relative to the bounding box that we are passing in, not the components bounding box. Let's go where that is. That's in the gains. That's going to be this uh, set X. It's currently based off the components um, right edge, and we need it to be based off of our bounding box right edge. R.set X bounds.get right minus text width. All right, the text on the left, let's see how that is. I'm pretty sure that's colliding too, and I can see where right there. Where did this go? All right, yep, that text is colliding. All right, so this is good. This is no longer colliding. That's great. This is colliding. This needs to be not uh, one to the right of the component left edge. It needs to be one to the right of the bounds dot, uh, the bounding box left edge. Oops, plus one. Let's look at that. Okay, great. Our text labels no longer collide. Let's do a quick commit of that surgical edit. Corrected, uh, no, fixed text collisions with component edge. Also uh, removed old border. All right, it is now time to introduce the concept of negative infinity and max decibels as well as min frequency and max frequency. These values are constants that we are going to use in this project to ensure we aren't typing magic numbers. Whenever we need to supply a frequency range, we will use min frequency and max frequency. Let's go define those now. Head over to utility.h, utilities.h, plural. All right, define these up at the top. Put these right here. Define min frequency 20 hertz and define max frequency 20,000 hertz. Next, let's define our decibel ranges. Define negative infinity. This is going to be negative 72. And then max decibels will be plus 12. Define max decibels 12.f. Finally, we need to define our minimum threshold for our compressor bands. Define min threshold, whoops, all caps, negative 60. Our next job is to replace all instances of these values with our macros. We will start with the plugin processor. All right, go to, uh, what's the name of this function? This is create parameter layout. Let's change this threshold range right here. This needs to be min threshold. 
and max decibels. Whoops, max decibels. All right, let's do a quick build. Am I including utilities here? Uh, apparently I am. All right, cool. Did not think I was, but I guess um, one of these classes is including it. All right, back to the spectrum analyzer. All right, let's change our mapping first. All right, we're not gonna do negative 24 to positive 24. We are going to do negative infinity to max decibels. So comment this out, replace it auto y equals j map. Our source value is gdb. We got negative infinity, max decibels. And then this is, let's see, this is gonna be um, bottom, but cast as a float. And then top cast as a float. All right, good times. All right, we need to do this again. Um, where else do we need to do that? Um, right here in uh, draw background grid. So we're doing it in draw text labels, and then we're doing it in draw background grid. All right, so we can just copy this first. Just copy this stuff. And let's fix this indentation. And you should be all the way to the left. All right, let's go to the resized function because there's a negative 48 over there. All right, comment out this line and add negative infinity and max decibels as the choices. All right, let's test this out and see how it looks with our test signal. We're going to re-enable our test signal, so be sure to take off your headphones or uh, turn down your speakers when you press the go button. Put this on true. All right, let's test it out. All right, we're missing grid lines. It still lines up with the grid line, uh, but our labels are wrong. It says plus 12 to minus 24 and then 12 to negative 48. So let's fix that next. Back to spectrum analyzer. All right, we need to go to the get gains function. All right, let's change what we are returning here, first of all. Uh, let's dynamically create um, the vector instead. All right, if we change what negative infinity and max decibels mean, it can be automatically reflected here. So let's start at negative infinity and increment to max decibels using an increment size of 12. Start with a vector of values. Let's return those, return values. Now we can do auto increment equals max decibels. We can change this if we want. For now, this is 12 dB steps. Then we can do for auto db equals negative infinity. db is less than or equal to max decibels. And we are incrementing by our increment. db plus equals increment. All right, and just do values dot push back db. All right, let's test this out. Let's see if that solves our issue with the gains. All right, that looks good to me. 12 to 96. Uh, what does that say? Negative. Okay, this one says the right range. It says plus 12 to negative 72, which is what we want. And um, All right, this is off. It's showing negative 12, and it should be showing... That should be showing here. We'll deal with that. All right, let's make both sides show the same range first. All right, let's get rid of the code. Go to the uh, draw text labels function. Um, there's code in here that shifts the value. Yes, this code right here. Okay, let's get rid of that. Don't clear it. Don't shift it. All right. The only thing that we need to actually change here is the X position because we're drawing the same string uh, that we set here. This string right here. This is the only thing we need to change. Or uh, Sorry, this is the only thing we're drawing. So we don't need to change the text width. We don't need to change the size. We don't need to change the color. We're just drawing the same string in a different position. All right, let's test this out. We should see the same range, same scale range on both sides of the FFT now. All right, there we go, plus 12, negative 72, plus 12, negative 72. All right, great. All right, now uh, our FFT is not mapping correctly. This is negative 12 and it's showing up as zero. So let's fix that next. Go to the analyzer path generator. This is the source of the problem. 
the problem here is that we are mapping our Y position to the screen coordinates and notice that the upper range is zero and not max decibels. So let's change that. We want to make this max decibels instead. Negative infinity max decibels. There we go. Um, let's see if uh, do we need to include the utility header for that? Let's do a build and see. See what it does. Maybe it'll complain. Maybe it won't. All right, no complaints. That's cool. Let's run this now. All right. All right, this is pretty good. All right, let's change this to negative 24. Also pretty accurate. Let's change it to zero. All right, it might be off by like, you know, one dB or half a dB. Uh, but for the sake of this tutorial, which is free, I'm going to call this good. If you really want to know how to make this stuff absolutely perfect, you can check out Project 11 or Project 12, where we uh, create a perfect spectrum analyzer that is perfectly accurate. All right, let's turn off the test oscillator. We no longer need that. Discard change. All right. One last test. Um, let's do it with, um, let's see. Why did I run the standalone? That looks clean. Now let's let's run some actual audio through it. Make sure it looks okay. Run it, grab your headphones, turn the volume back up so you can hear what it's doing. All right. Fantastic. Okay, cool. All right. Next, we're going to draw the crossovers, then we're going to draw thresholds, then we are going to draw gain reduction. And that will conclude the Spectrum Analyzer. Let's make a commit of the work that we did. What did we do? Um, let's see. Um, standardized how ranges are defined. That's that. That's what that is. Um, fixed Spectrum Analyzer labels. These should be reversed. Let's switch that. All right, fixed spectrum analyzer labels, and then we standardized how the ranges are defined. All right, sounds good. All right, before we go and implement crossovers and thresholds and gain reduction, let's go through the code and replace any 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz with min frequency and max frequency. Where does that happen first? Here's one in Analyzer Paths Generator, right here. Okay, this needs to be min frequency and max frequency. Okay, there is another in Spectrum Analyzer. Um, we just need to search for 20,000. 20, 1, 2, 3, done. All right, Spectrum Analyzer. All right, right here in uh, the get x's function, we're doing min freak and max free. All right, and there should be two more. Let's just look for 20,000. Um, only look in the actual project source code. Okay, um, spectrum analyzer. Um, we're gonna keep these hard coded. All right, plugin processor. Okay, here's one right here. This should be min, min frequency, and then this should be max frequency. I believe those are the only two that remain. All right, yes, okay, cool. All right, those are the only two. Let's make sure. All right, our gain slider still works. Our threshold slider, still cool. Our frequency still goes 20 hertz to 20K. All right, cool, good enough for me. Let's draw some crossovers next. If you get stuck or run into trouble while coding this or Simple EQ, just grab one of my free products from programmingformusicians.com and you can message me directly in the Slack workspace and I will help you directly. We are going to draw our crossovers next. To accomplish this, all we need to do is get the frequency value from the crossover parameter, map it to an X position, and then draw a vertical line. The timer callback is taking care of repainting the screen at a regular rate. Let's go look at um, our spectrum analyzer.cpp so you can see what I'm talking about. Go to the timer callback. 
Okay, this is repainting at a regular rate, so that's good times. Okay, so we don't need to do anything special to refresh whenever the crossover slider is dragged. We just need to declare some stuff and add some functions and whatnot that can get the parameter and pull the crossovers and produce X values for us to draw from top to bottom. Okay, let's declare a function for drawing the crossovers and call it first. Go to the header file, spectrumanalyzer.h. Let's do this at the bottom. Uh, I'm just gonna copy this draw FFT analysis and rename it to be draw crossovers. Okay, super simple. Let's go call it, go back to that paint function. All right, we're going to do this before we draw our text labels. Draw crossovers, G, bounds. All right, let's go implement it next. All right, I'm just gonna put this right below the uh, paint function because I'm lazy. Void spectrum analyzer, draw crossovers. All right, I don't feel like scrolling to put it in the order that it was declared in, uh, which would mean it's after that draw FFT analysis function. Okay, we are going to be using a lot of juice functions in here, so let's set up the namespace alias as always using names, uh, namespace juice. Okay, then let's get our bounding box. Bounds equals get analysis area from our input argument. All right, next we need to give ourselves access to the two crossover parameters. Let's go back to the header file. Let's declare two member variables to do that. One for the low mid and one for the mid high. All right, let's initialize these up to the constructor. Where is the constructor? Way at the top. All right, let's do this before we start our timer using namespace params. Whoops, let's spell space correctly. Let's get our params map. Auto param equals get params. All right, um, let's see, it doesn't know where params come from, so let's include where those come from. Include dot dot slash DSP params. Oh, uh, conflict, so let's make this param names. All right, let's copy the float helper lambda from the plugin processor constructor. Plugin processor all the way to the top. Where's that lambda? Float helper, this thing right here. Copy that. Go back to Spectrum Analyzer. Let's put that here. And we need to change the capture stuff a little bit differently. We're not using that. Let's go like that. And then this needs to be param names. And this is going to be apvts equals audio processor.apvts. And this we're capturing param names, not params. There we go. Okay. Now we can use it to initialize our members. Float helper low mid crossover and we want our names low mid crossover free float helper mid high names mid high crossover freak cool all right we are going to draw a vertical line from the top of our bounds to the bottom of our bounds so let's go to that uh function we were working on um draw crossovers and we need to cache the uh, top and bottom Let's do that next, const auto top equals bounds.get y, and then const auto bottom equals bounds.get bottom. All right, first we need to map the frequency to a screen position. So let's copy the mapping code from our get x's function, wherever that is, get x's. All right, here's the mapping code. And we can turn, we can uh, dry this later, use a free function if we want. Um, let's change this push back into a return statement. We're going to stuff this into a lambda. Go back to our draw crossovers. All right, auto map x equals lambda, lambda, lambda. All right, in here is where we're going to take our norm x and we're going to return left plus width times norm x. All right, what do we need? We need left, left equals bounds dot get x. We need the width width equals bounds dot get width we need our frequency indent that please all right float frequency 
Um, let's make this say, all right, that's nice and readable. All right, now we can draw our crossovers. Use the map X function to convert the low mid into an X coordinate. Auto low mid X equals map X. Frequency is gonna be low mid X over pram get. All right, uh, let's draw a vertical line from top to bottom. G dot set color. Colors, so let's do orange. So that'll stick out. And we can do G dot draw vertical line. Our X is gonna be low mid X. Our top is top and our float, our bottom is. All right, and let's do the same for the mid high. Auto mid high X equals map X mid high param get the value draw uh, g dot draw vertical mid high from the top to the bottom let's test it out all right we see some crossovers let's put this right at 200 perfect works like a charm but at 2k default value default value all right awesome let's do thresholds next Let's do the same thing for the thresholds that we did for the crossovers. Go to the um, header file. We have three compressor bands, so we need three threshold parameters. Let's go, um, yeah, just copy these, rename them, and we will initialize them in the constructor. Next, let's do one more. All right, low threshold param. Let's just copy the word threshold and change this to say Hi, whoops, H-I-G-H, -H, mid threshold. All right, cool. That takes care of the declarations. Let's go construct these again. Go to the uh, constructor. Let's use our float helper to make our life very simple. I'm just gonna copy this three times and rename it. Two, three, low threshold, mid threshold, high thresh, low threshold, Threshold low, thresh mid, and thresh high. Perfect. Okay, let's go draw. Uh, let's go to the draw crossover function and update it to also draw thresholds. All right, draw crossovers. Okay, here is how we are going to draw these thresholds. Number one, we draw a horizontal line from the left edge to the low mid crossover. Let me pull the plugin up so you can see what I'm talking about. All right, we are gonna draw a, a horizontal line from the left edge to this crossover right here. All right, we're gonna use, uh, the Y value is going to be the uh, low threshold param mapped to this decibel range. Okay, then we're going to draw a horizontal line from the low mid crossover to the mid high crossover. Again, using the same Y value is uh, mapped onto these screen coordinates. Then we're gonna draw a horizontal line from the mid-high to the right edge of our um, analysis area. So we're gonna need the left X and we're gonna need the right X too. All right, let's get those guys. Const auto left equals bounds dot get X. Const auto right equals bounds dot get right. Now we can map our thresholds to their Y position and then draw horizontal lines. Let's grab the Y mapping code from draw background grid. That's this stuff right here. And turn it into a Lambda. Copy this. Go back up to draw crossovers. Let's make a Lambda real quick. Auto map Y equals Lambda, Lambda, Lambda. Guts of it is this mapping function. We need to capture the top and bottom. Bottom, top. And we need to pass in our decibels, so change that name, db, float db. And now we just need to return it. Okay, great. Now we can use it. I wanna use a different color than the color that I used for the crossover, so I'm gonna go with yellow. Colors, yellow. Now we're going to draw the low band threshold from the left edge to the low mid crossover. So g dot draw horizontal line our Y is gonna be map Y. And we are mapping our low threshold parameter. Right? And our left side is gonna be the left edge. And our right is gonna be low mid X. Okay, pretty simple. Let's test it out just to make sure it works. We should see a yellow horizontal line for the low band, depending on what it is set to. 
All right, cool. It is set to negative 23, and I see that this line is right above the gray. So that's cool. Let's put this on 12. All right, nice and accurate. Awesome. That is working as expected. That means we can do the other ones. Uh, this line is a little bit hard to see. Um, I might change this later to draw a rectangle that is, you know, taller um, with a center Y of this thing, whatever this Y value is. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to leave this as is, and we're going to draw the other lines. Draw horizontal, draw horizontal. Okay, we are mapping the mid threshold param, and we are mapping the high threshold param. Our left side is going to be the low mid x, and our right side is going to be the mid high x for the mid threshold. For the high threshold, our left side is the mid high x, and our right side is the right. All right, let's test it out. All right, let's adjust the mid threshold. Cool. And let's adjust our crossovers. Fantastic. Now, if you want to make these draggable, or if you want to learn how to make these draggable when you click and drag on them, you can learn how to do that in Project 12. We cover how to make this a very interactive GUI, so you can adjust all this stuff. All right, the last thing to do is to draw gain reduction. All right, we are nearing the end of our roadmap. Let's go mark off a few items. Uh, let's make a commit first, actually. What did we do? We um, added... Um, uh, spectrum, let's see, spectrum analyzer shows crossovers and thresholds. That's what we did. Stage, um, we also adjusted um, used macros for min max frequencies. All right, here's our spectrum analyzer with our draw crossover fanciness. Cool, cool, cool. We're nearing the end of our roadmap. So let's mark off a few more items. Plugin processor.h, we are drawing the crossovers. That's done. Um, and we need to draw the gain reduction. So let's do that next. Let's go to the compressor band class. All right, first of all, we are gonna need some atomic members that will store the RMS levels. One for the input and one for the output. All right, these should be initialized to negative infinity. Uh, we're going to need to include our header file to make use of negative infinity. Um, these are going to get the RMS level of the buffer before and after processing. All right, let's put these here in the private section. STD. Uh, let's see, I'm doing two of them, so I don't want to type twice. So let's do the old option drag and do STD atomic float. Um, let's see, RMS level db curly brace negative infinity closing curly brace semicolon all right let's change this to be input and this is output cool let's include um utilities for that include uh let's see yeah utilities so dot dot slash dot dot slash all right gui utilities dot h Let's just make sure that that's cool. All right. All right, build succeeded. All right, next we need some getter functions. So let's write a pair. Again, um, I'm gonna type it twice. Float get RMS level DB. Uh, these are const functions and they return RMS level DB, semicolon. All right, let's fix these names. Get RMS output level and get RMS input level. And this is going to return, the input returns input, output returns output. Cool. All right, let's go to the compressor band uh, CPP file. We just need to sample the RMS level before we compress, and then after we compress. Our buffer has multiple channels, so we want to compute the average RMS level over all of these channels. We're going to need to write a function to do that. I am lazy and do not want to figure out the types that we are passing in, so I'm going to template this function because templates are awesome. Okay, go back to the compressor band header file. Put this after these guys. All right, this is fairly simple to write. First of all, we need the number of channels. Let's uh, write a template function now. Template type name T 
float compute rms rms level const t buffer okay first we need to compute the rms level of each channel um let me start over first of all we need the number of channels and the number of samples then we are going to need to compute the rms of each channel and add them all together then we just divide this summed value by the number of channels and that gives us our averaged rms level for the buffer let's do that all right so first we get the number of channels and the number of samples then we get a uh, we set an rms level to zero and now we walk through every channel and get the rms level for that particular channel for all samples then after summing them all together we just divide it by the number of channels and that is our averaged rms level for the buffer nice and simple all right let's go use this function next compressor band.cpp go to the uh, process function all right let's get the pre rms level of the buffer and remember this is not expressed in decibels so auto pre rms equals compute rms level buffer okay and then let's get the post rms level compute rms level buffer and i don't want to write juice uh, decibels gain to decibels twice so i'm going to do a helper lambda return juice decibels gain to decibels and now we can use it to store our pre and post rms levels as decibels in the atomic members so rms input level dot store convert to decibels the uh, pre rms then rms output dot store convert to db post rms all right the next thing to do is to get these values into our spectrum analyzer head on over to the editor for that plugin editor dot h we need to pull these compressor rms levels p o l l we need to pull these compressor rms levels at a regular interval so let's inherit from timer next juice timer Let's add the appropriate callback. Void timer callback. Let's go start the timer in our constructor. Let's do this after set size. I'm gonna do a 60 hertz timer. So it's refreshing 60 times a second. And now let's go implement it. Let's do this after resized. Void simple mbcomp editor timer callback. All right. The compressor bands are not public, so let's make them public first before we start polling them here. Go to uh, plugin processor.h, way down at the bottom. Move these to the public section. All right, go back to plugin editor, timer callback. Now that those compressors are public, we can create a vector and get these RMS levels. So I'm going to create a vector so I only have to pass one object to the spectrum analyzer instead of six. Um, this means that the function that I write, um, I only have to type one parameter uh, declaration instead of six. So, you know, simplify my life a little bit. Here we go. Declare a vector and grab the input and output RMS levels from each band. Let's go write a function in our spectrum analyzer to receive this vector spectrum analyzer dot h let's make an update function in the public section void update now we're going to need to compute the gain reduction from the values that we are getting so let's let's see i'm getting ahead of myself all right first let's declare this it's going to take an std vector of float values all right we're going to need to compute the gain reduction from the values that were passed to us let's declare three variables that can hold those values all right three floats let's put these at the bottom way down here with our params float low band gr initialize them all to zero since no gain reduction is happening to begin with float mid band gr okay cool back to the editor let's pass that vector to the um spectrum analyzer uh analyzer is that what i'm calling it update values 
All right, our analyzer has been updated with fresh RMS levels of uh, input and output uh, gain, buffer levels, whatever we're calling it, RMS input levels. Let's go implement this update function next. All right, let's go to spectrumanalyzer.cpp. I'm gonna put these below the uh, draw crossovers function. All right, void spectrum analyzer update. First, let's make sure we have six values. J asserts values.size equals six. Um, I don't know why it wouldn't be that, but you know, just to make sure. All right, next I am going to help myself out and give myself an enumeration that I can use to index into this vector and keep track of which indexes point to which RMS levels. That looks like this. All right, now I can simply update my gain reduction, uh, my gain reduction member variables, and then repaint. The gain reduction is a negative value usually, so we want to subtract the input from the output as the output is almost always lower than the input level. So that looks like this. Low band GR equals values, low band out minus values, low band in. All right, very simple. All right, let's do the rest and then repaint. All right, in order to draw the gain reduction correctly, we need to know the following coordinates per band. This is gonna happen in, where are we doing this? We're doing this in our draw crossovers. Draw crossovers is where we need to go. In order to draw the gain reduction correctly, we need to know the following coordinates per band. The left X, the right X, where zero dB is as a screen coordinate, and where the gain reduction is expressed as decibels, again, as a screen coordinate. So let's um, compute 0 dB. Auto 0 dB equals map y 0 dot f. All right, we've got the left x and the right x. That's what this stuff is and this stuff here. So we just need to map the gain reduction before we can draw our gain reduction. That's pretty easy to get. So let's get our color first. I'm just going to give it some alpha so it doesn't cover up the grid lines. G dot set color. I'm going to use hot pink because I want something that sticks out. Colors hot pink with alpha. Give me an alpha of 0.3f. All right. Now I am going to use the rectangle static function left, top, right, bottom to create the rectangles that will represent the gain reduction. And then I'm going to fill them up. So here we go. And I'm going to draw these behind. I'm going to draw these behind the actual um, uh, threshold levels. All right, G dot fill rect, and we're going to do rectangle. Um, we're going to do float, and we want the left, top, right, bottom. Okay, our left is going to be left. Our top is zero dB. Our right side is going to be the low mid X, and our bottom is going to be the low band gain reduction mapped. Map Y, low band gain reduction. All right, let's put that all separate lines. Okay, let's do this again for the next, um, for the mid band. All right, so this is mid band. Mid band gain reduction. This one is high band gain reduction. Okay, our left side for this one is the low mid X and our right side is the mid high X. For this one, it's mid high X and then the right edge. All right, let's feed some audio through the plugin. We're gonna test this out. We should see some gain reduction, uh, not standalone. We're gonna use um, audio plugin host. We're gonna feed some actual audio through this and we should see some gain reduction rectangles light up. Let's see what happens. Do we have any errors? Nope, just the warning about that stuff that's marked false, the test signal. All right, here we go. Oh, there we go. Look at that rectangle. That's that awesome. Let's adjust the mid band. Get that squishing. All right. Very cool. Awesome. Okay, there are only three things left to do in this project. Let's save and quit this. 
Let's make a commit, and then we'll talk about those three things that remain. Uh, this was added, added gain reduction display. Is that all we did? Yeah, that's right. Gain reduction uh, timer is part of that. Here's the gain reduction. That's where we passed it to the spectrum analyzer. Those are our members that display the gain reduction. And here's how we actually made it happen. And then here's where we compute the gain reduction. So this was cool. A bit of code surgery on this one. Pretty involved, but good times. All right, let's talk about the major three things we have left to do. Let's look at our roadmap. Plugin processor.h up at the top. All right, we are currently drawing our gain reduction. Done. All right, analyze your bypass button. That's not going to be difficult. Um, global bypass button, that's got a few tricks to it. And then the color scheme and the color helper stuff, I want to talk about that at the very end. So we are nearing the completion of this project. I hope you are enjoying the journey. Let's tackle the control bar next. Uh, the first thing we will do is add the analyzer button. Um, just like in the simple EQ project, this button will toggle the analyzer on and off. Let's go to the uh, plugin editor.h. Let's just put this right here. All right, first things first, let's define a class for it. Okay, we already copied the code for this button over earlier. That's right here. Here's our analyzer button. So we just need to include that file, include GUI custom buttons, and then we can give ourselves an instance. Let's put this in the, uh, just toss it right here. Analyzer button, analyzer button. All right, next we need a constructor to make it visible and a resized function to give it some bounds. Plugin editor.cpp, go to the top, Let's stick that right here. Add and make visible, analyze button. Uh, let's make it uh, toggled on by default. Analyzer button dot set toggle state should be on. True. Uh, don't send a notification. All right. Let's make it sit on the left and be about 50 pixels wide. I'm going to want a small gap between the top of the component. Let's start our resized function. Void control bar resized. Um, as I was saying, oh, let's make it sit on the left side of the GUI, be about 50, maybe 60 pixels wide. I'm going to want a small gap between the top of the component and the bottom, um, and also between the uh, component and the spectrum analyzer. So I'm going to trim a little bit off of the top and the bottom of our local bounds. Auto bounds equals get local bounds, then analyzer button dot set bounds, and we're going to do bounds dot remove from left. 50, and then we need to take some off the top. Dot remove from top just a little bit with trimmed, uh, not remove from top, we want with trimmed top, with trimmed top. All right, this returns a version of this rectangle with the given amount removed from its top edge. So that's what we want, with trimmed top four and with trimmed bottom. All right, because we're removing four from the top of this rectangle, the rectangle that's 50 pixels, that was removed from the left edge. We're trimming four off of the top of that thing. All right, the, the with trimmed stuff versus the remove stuff can be kind of tricky the first few times you use it. All right, let's get rid of our placeholder once and for all. Go to the plugin editor, get rid of the placeholder control bar and make it a control bar. Awesome, get rid of all this stuff. All right. Plugin editor.cpp. Let's connect the control bar analyzer button uh, to the actual analyzer and toggle enablement accordingly. Let's do this before we make it visible. Control bar dot analyzer button dot on click equals lambda 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 semicolon. You go on a new line. Whoops. And we're going to capture this and we're going to do analyzer dot toggle analyzer analysis enablement, and it should be on if the analyzer control button, uh, if the control bar analyzer button toggle state says so. So let's just get that state. Bool should, I'll use auto. Auto should be on equals control bar analyzer button get toggle state. All right, now we just need to make it visible. Let's uncomment this line. 
let's test her out. Run some audio, see if the spectrum analyzer turns on and off. All right, let's test her out. All right, we're gonna run some audio. We're gonna click that button. All right, perfect. Save, stop, quit. Perfect. All right, um, global bypass is next. All right, we have included, uh, let's see, where's our editor, editor file? All right. All right, we already included our custom buttons, so let's add our power button next. Super easy. Um, declare an instance, power button, global bypass button. All right, great. Let's add it as a child. Go to the plugin editor.cpp, go up here, add and make visible global bypass button. All right, let's give it some bounds and um, see what we got. All right, I'm gonna make it 60 wide. Maybe that'll look cool. Let's see, I'm gonna stick it on the right side. Global bypass button dot set bounds. Bounds dot remove from right, 60, and I'm gonna trim off the top and trim off the bottom. With trimmed top, I'm gonna do a little less than four, so I'll do two. With dot width, with trimmed bottom. Let's see, I might change that later. Let's see how we, see how it looks should see a little power button in the upper right hand corner. All right, perfect. It doesn't do anything, let's make it do something. All right, clicking the bypass button should toggle the bypass parameter of each band. Before we set up the bypass buttons on click lambda, let's declare a function that will toggle the global bypass state. All right, let's go declare this as private. Plug in editor.h, go down to the bottom, put this here void toggle global bypass state. All right, let's go set up the Lambda. Plug in editor.cpp and do the Lambda right after our uh, control bar. Control bar dot, um, oops, let me spell that right. Dot global bypass button dot on click equals Lambda, oops, equals Lambda, Lambda, Lambda. We're gonna capture this one more time. All right, we're going to call our toggle global bypass function. All right, let's go implement that. Let's put this after timer callback. Void simple editor toggle global bypass. Okay, first we need to get the toggle state of the button. If the button is off, meaning it's green, everything should be enabled. So auto should enable everything equals um, control bar global bypass button get toggle state all right again if this is on sorry if this button is off meaning it is currently drawing as green everything should be enabled so if it's off then this should be true if this is off that means it's false which means this should be true so we want the opposite of that all right next we need to get all of the bypass parameters let's write a function to give us that plug in editor.h put it after this uh, let's return an array, std array. All right, we are returning three instances of audio parameter bool. It's called get bypass params, nice and convenient. All right, let's get the params. Auto params equals get bypass params. Let's write this function next. All right, put this down here. std array juice audio parameter bool, three of them simple editor get bypass params we need to query the audio processor value tree state for these parameters so we will need the usual namespace aliases and references when looking up the parameters let's do that now all right let's copy the bool helper uh, uh first i need to include the right params file include dot dot slash dsp uh, is that where DSP is? No, DSP is right there, params. All right, let's copy the bool helper from plugin processors constructor and modify it for our needs. Plugin processor, scroll down for the bool helper, copy and put it right here. All right, so specifically we need it to return a pointer instead of a reference. Right now this is returning a reference and this is also modifying um, it's modifying the input parameter. We don't care about that. 
So we're not doing that. We're going to return whatever it figures out. Return param. And then APVTS, um, we can just capture that. Let you do that. Um, then we need auto declaration here. Auto param equals whatever param we get from the APVTS casted to a uh, audio parameter bool. If the cast is cool, this will not fire, and hopefully we will return a pointer. Okay, great. Now we can use the helper to get three Boolean parameters. Auto low bypass param equals bool helper names bypassed low band. All right, let's do that for the other two bands. There we go, mid band, high band, bypass. All right, now we can just package them into an array. Return, low bypass, mid bypass, high bypass. All right, cool. All right, we have our parameters now. Whenever we change audio parameters, we need to tell the host that it is part of a gesture. This is so that the host can store these changes in automation. Let's write a helper lambda to do this. We are going to be updating three parameters. So the first lambda argument will be the parameter. Second will be whether or not the parameter should be bypassed. Auto bypass param helper equals lambda lambda lambda. First param is the parameter, auto param. Second is whether or not it should be bypassed. Bool should be bypassed. All right, now we can begin our change gesture. Param begin change gesture. Then we can set the params value based on if it should be bypassed or not. Param set value notifying host should be bypassed. Then it should be a one, otherwise it should be a zero. Um, it's important to remember that set notifying set value notifying hosts wants a normalized value between zero and one. All right, and then we can end our change guesser. Param end change guess. Now we can loop through our parameters for auto param params. If everything should be enabled, then should be bypassed should be false. That means we want the opposite of should enable everything passed in as the parameter. So bypass param helper, passing in the param, and should be bypassed is the opposite of should enable everything. All right, let's test that out. All right, let's do this. Okay, so the active compressor bands band select button changes. Uh, but the other band select buttons do not. For instance, this is showing as bypassed, but this state is not updated. And if we click on those bands, like the same for the high one, it's bypassed, but this button is not reflecting that state. So we need to fix that. We need to update the colors of the band select buttons that are not the active band whenever we toggle the global bypass button. Let's do that next. We need to add a member function in compressor band controls that will update these bands colors. So head on over to compressor band controls. All right, let's declare a public function. Void toggle all bands. Bool should be bypassed. All right, let's put this below button clicked in the implementation. Button clicked, void compressor band controls toggle all bands. Here is how this function is going to work. We're going to use an array of pointers to all three band select buttons and we're going to loop through that array. Here's the logic we are going to implement. If the global bypass button is clicked off, meaning that everything is bypassed, we need to set every band buttons on color to the bypass fill color. And then we need to set every band's off color to the bypass color as well. If the global bypass button is clicked on, meaning nothing is bypassed, we need to set every band button's on color to the default fill color. And we need to set every band's off color to black as this is the default off color. When the band select button is bypassed and not the active band, it will still display the correct fill color. And finally, we need to manually repaint after we change a button's color. Let's implement that now. Here's my, here's my vector of buttons. We're gonna loop through each button. We're going to set the color based on if we should be bypassed. Um, we're gonna pull it from the bypass button if it should be bypassed. And if not, we're gonna use our default gray color. 
and then we are also going to set the off color. If it should be bypassed, we're going to use that on color again. Otherwise, we're going to use black, and then we are going to manually repaint. Okay, very simple. All right, head back over to plugin editor.cpp. Let's call our function now below this band controls dot toggle all band and if it's if it's if everything should be enabled then it should not be bypassed so we're doing this again all right let's test it out all right all right awesome toggle them on and off okay very cool the next thing to do is to update the global bypass button if we manually bypass each button separately for example if I go low is bypassed, mid button is bypassed, high band is bypassed, this should turn off. And then likewise, if we have all bands bypassed when the plugin loads, then the global bypass should also reflect this. Let's tackle that next. All right, the final task is to make the global bypass button reflect the bypass state of the bands if we toggle them manually we are going to use our timer callback to do this. Let's go look at that real quick. All right, we are going to declare a function to update the global bypass, and then we're gonna call it here and implement it next. Let's go to the header file, plugin editor.h, declare a private function, void update global bypass button. Go to timer callback, and we will call it after we update our analyzer. All right. So gonna, I'm gonna put it right below timer callback. Void simple editor update global bypass. All right, the logic here is pretty simple. We need to get all the params, all of the bypass parameters. We need to figure out if all of them are set to true. And then we set the global bypass buttons toggle state accordingly. And we need to make sure that we don't send a notification when setting the toggle state. If we were to send a notification, it would trigger that on click lambda, which is something we don't need to have happen because that's gonna fire all this stuff. Let's get all of our params. Auto params equals get bypass params. We can use std all of to check if all of the params are true. Bool all bands are bypassed equals std all of params.begin params, oops params.end, and our predicate is a lambda, 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 const auto param. We want to see if the param is true or not, so return param get. Finally, now that we know whether or not all of the bands are bypassed, we just need to set the toggle state. So control bar dot global bypass button dot set toggle state. And remember, do not send that notification. Juice notification type don't send okay so remember if all of the bands are bypassed then the button should not appear as green if it only appears as green when the toggle state is off so this is most likely false which means all bands are bypassed which means our toggle state should be false all right let's test this out here's what we're going to do we are going to enable all the bands we're going to manually bypass them one by one and see if that button switches. All right, let's turn this on, turn this on. And if we bypass this, is this one gonna change? It does, all right, great. And clicking it turns them all back off. Okay, so the next test is if we do this, if they're all on and then I turn off a band, is this gonna turn on? Yes, it does, awesome. That works as expected. Now what happens if we close the GUI when all bands are bypassed? Is this button going to be set correct? Let's save and quit and rerun and see what it does. All right, perfect. That works as expected. Okay, that wraps up the functionality for the plugin for this tutorial. The last thing that I want to do is customize some of these colors and show a few tricks that I use to do that. Let's make a commit of our work. Uh, implemented global controls. Implemented global controls. Um, let's go to our plugin processor. Let's mark these guys off. 
done. And Global Bypass, done. Our roadmap is now complete. That is fantastic. All right. Plugin editor. Here's our control bar. Here's where we did all this uh, bypass stuff. There's our editor. Here's all the um, bypass code that we uh, implemented. Control band. This is how we update the colors of the control band based on whether or not it should or should not be bypassed. All right. Commit six files. All right. We'll do color stuff next. All right, head over to look and feel. I'm gonna show you a trick that is gonna help you dial in your colors. The first thing is to declare a macro that toggles whether we use juice live constant or not. Put this uh, right here. Define use live constant. All right, next I'm gonna write a helper macro that will make use of this macro right here. This macro doesn't do anything except return what was passed to it. If the macro is true, then the juice live constant editor is true. Otherwise, this function just returns what was given to it. The only downside here is that the juice live constant editor doesn't show the relevant code in the code snippet viewer, and it triggers a J assert. But who cares? You know, it's for what we needed to do. It's awesome. If use live constant, we're going to define a color helper function where we pass in C and we use juice live constant C like that. Else define color helper like that. and if. Okay, the next piece of the puzzle is to declare a namespace that holds all, all of the uh, colors I plan on using. And it wraps these colors in getter functions. So I'm going to demonstrate one first. All right, in this function, all I do is call the color helper function with whatever color I want. So return color helper. I'm going to go with blue for right now. Okay, now I just need to replace whatever color I'm using when setting the slider's border with a call to this function instead. Let's go to look and feel .cpp. Let's go find where that is drawn. That's going to be drawn in uh, draw rotary slider right at the top. All right, this is where I draw the border. So I'm going to replace this line uh, with a call to the um, get slider border color. G dot set color enabled. If it's enabled, use color scheme get slider border color. Otherwise, do uh, colors gray. Otherwise, do this thing. All right, let's test it out. And it will trigger a J assert, but we can just continue past that. It'll still work as expected. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Let's do this in the uh, standalone version. And why is this showing an error? Redefinition. I don't know why it's saying that. All right, here's that J assert I was talking about. Okay, let's pull up our plugin here. All right, so you can click on this color right here and adjust all of the colors directly, which is a great way to dial in, um, you know, your colors in your GUI. Once you find a color that you like, oh, that's a cool color. Um, yeah, copy the hexadecimal value and paste it where you were passing the default color to color helper. So that was over here in uh, not look and feel. That was over here in look and feel dot h. This color right here. So I would just paste this instead and then wrap it in a juice color constructor. Juice color like that because there's a juice color constructor that takes um, a hexadecimal value. All right, let's do another. Let's do the module border. All right, let's go declare this function. Inline juice color get module border color return color helper juice colors blue violet. All right, we're returning the color we want. Now let's use the function as needed in uh, look and feel. I'll go right here. G dot set color 
it's enabled, use color scheme, get slide, uh, get module border. Otherwise use dark gray. And then uh, let's head over to the uh, draw module border color. Find that in utilities.cpp. There you go. All right. We need to include our look and feel so we can use the color scheme. Um, look and feel. All right. And now we can set the color to the module border instead of that blue violet. We can do color scheme, get module border color. All right, let's run this. It's going to J assert. All right, that's one. There's the other. All right, let's find our plugin window. Here we go. So what's cool about this is we get two colors now. So we can adjust all of these like that. You can see how it's adjusting the fill color of the knobs as well as the um, border color. And then we can dial in this thing. And again, once we find a color that we like, that's kind of cool. Once we find a color that we like, we just copy the hexadecimal over to our, um, copy it over here and replace the colors. All right, so there you go. That's a nice helpful tip for how to dial in the colors. You know, once you get this um, color set to what you want, if you want this like red color or not so much this, uh, maybe you want this to be like an alpha color, you can do that too. That looks kind of cool. Let this pop out more. Once you get this color dialed into what you want, um, just copy the hexadecimal and replace it in your color scheme helper, um, and you'll have your colors dialed in. So it's you know a pretty handy way if you don't have a graphic designer to um, provide you colors and like give you like a real fancy GUI. It's just one of those things that we can use to tweak our GUI and make it um, a bit easier to make changes in a dynamic way that are easy to update. Okay, so I hope you found that tip useful. Um, I've used it a few times, and I think it's a pretty it's a pretty efficient way to dial in GUI colors. All right. All right, so there you go. That wraps up the tutorial. I am going to dial in some more of these colors and tweak the GUI a bit to my liking. I'm going to encourage you to do the same. You can check out the completed project at the link in the description. And if you want to learn how to build the big brother of this plugin, check out my course Project 12, which is available at www.programmingformusicians.com. You will be building it from instructions written in a JIRA board. I will be reviewing your code every step of the way. It, it is not a follow along course like this video was. You're going to be getting your hands dirty and figuring it all out for yourself. All right. Thank you so much for watching and supporting this. Uh, be sure to check out my YouTube channel, my Instagram, and my Twitter accounts. Check the links in the description, including the starting from scratch videos, as well as Simple EQ and my other courses. And as always, if you get stuck or run into trouble while coding this or Simple EQ, just grab one of my free products from programmingformusicians.com and you can message me directly in the Slack workspace and I will help you directly. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you appreciated this tutorial and I hope you learned a lot from it. I will see you in the next one.